Did you know that you've got choices? That there can be a better way? Did you know that you've got choices? Call Dr. Theater me today. Two on two choices, a much better way. Two on two choices, call Dr. Did you know that you've got choices? That there can be a better way? Did you know that you've got choices? Call Dr. Theater me today. Hi, my name is Dr. Gil Lederman, a cancer doctor working here at 1384 Broadway and here with special stories to tell you. And in fact, I'm not going to be telling you any of the stories. We're going to have the patients themselves who have volunteered on their own, who've gone through our treatment to tell you what's happened to them or in a few cases to their loved ones by coming here and how it's changed their life. It seems so often that in many big hospitals and many big surgeons and chemo doctors and other cancer doctors, they seem to have an agenda of pushing one kind of treatment or another kind of treatment and not talking about all the options. Well, here at 1384 Broadway, we talk about all the options. So someone with cancer, we can talk about surgery to remove the breast or the lung or the kidney or the bladder or the prostate or the rectum, whatever. But we can also talk about all the other options which are so commonly hidden from you when you most need it. I'm not going to be telling you the stories. Our patients and their loved ones are going to be telling you the stories today of what's happened to that patient and how coming here, seeing Dr. Lederman, has often changed their life for the better. We have a lot of patients who have come today on their own to tell their very personal story. And it's monumental for someone to take time out of their life and explain to you what's happened to them and their personal life. We've arranged this video in two different ways. One way is a short snippet of information about each patient. And then later on in the video is the longer full interview with the patient, explaining more of what's happened to them and more of their feelings and more of what's happened after the stereotactic radio surgery, which was commonly employed to try to help people with high success rates, non-invasive, no cutting, no bleeding. So you can listen to the short snippets and you can listen to the long interviews. All together, it's a picture of what we do here at 1384 Broadway. And I think after you see the interviews, you'll understand why patients come here from around the world for innovative, non-invasive cancer treatment. We're here now with... Bobby Mashburn. Mr. Mashburn, and uh, tell us about yourself just in general. Tell us about who you are and what you do every day. Okay, I was a law enforcement officer for the city of New York years ago. Um, I used to box professionally for guys like Ken Norton, Larry Holmes, and things like that. Um, my my son, Muhammad Ali, he came and picked up my son in the ring. I had a little tournament with Ali, and, and that was in that was in the Bronx. Did you box Muhammad Ali? Yeah, yeah. Well, just for you know, for for the for, the for charity, for, for charity, for charity. Did you yeah. knock him out? No, I better not. No, I didn't want Could to. Could he knock that. you out? I wasn't gonna let him. But <laughs> 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 no, we had a nice time. No, you know, it was he's just, a uh, incredible person. He was right? oh man, I was crazy about him. He's an incredible person. Yeah, and he um he he took kindness to my son. He would pick him up in the arm and then he and my son he wound up being a professional basketball over there. So he was big too, or is big, he's big right? So he is big. big he's superstar. retired now. Yeah, he's retired now. He's multi-millionaire. Well, um, that's where you get the fine clothes, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, it got to. Yeah, it got to be like that. Yeah. And what was it like boxing Larry Holmes? Oh, it was nice. We, uh, you know, he. Uh, I knocked him down once, and he knocked me down once. And when he knocked me down, they can't. They had one of those fast counts: one, two, three, four. Three. <laughs> What about when he went down? <laughs> yeah. What about when he went down? When he went down, he stayed down for like about the eight eight count. Eight point nine seconds. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you were around superstars all your life. Well, I've been I've been fortunate to meet a lot of not nice people, superstar like yourself. 
Well, I'm not yeah, a superstar, I, but to you're, me, you're a superstar. Well, okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. But so you you saw these superstar athletes. Yeah, oh, yeah, Muhammad yeah. Ali was probably one of the biggest yeah. ever, right? Joe Lewis. Uh, Did you know that, Joe Lewis? Yeah, I knew Joe Lewis. How did you know too. Joe Lewis? Well, when I was when I was boxing as an amateur, um, his sparring partner years ago. This is a long time ago. He had a, a funeral home, and they got in touch with me in Harlem. I was born in Harlem, raised in Harlem. And uh, they took care of, you know, they, they was my manager. And he, he knew this John Crane, was the guy's name, his, his um, sparring partner, and that's who I got hooked up with. And Did he make you the boxer that you became? Was it irresponsible? No, or you no were, I'm responsible. You're for, responsible. Yeah, you know, I um, went from here to there. And, um, but then you went and you I, became a policeman? Well, I was I was a police officer, yeah, and um, I fought while I was on the job, you know, boxing, even that kind of, you know, I got that kind of privilege, you know. And then I, my son became um, a basketball star. He said, Dad, you, you know, you've been on this job for 22 years. You know, I think you should uh, take a little break at time. So I retired. <laughs> was your son, did your son learn about fame through you or did he do it on his own? He learned through me mostly, yeah, he learned through me. I, everywhere I go, I, t I take him with me and introduce him to people and things like that, like, like Ali and... So he met these superstars all his life too. And he got involved with it, just, it's just like magnetic. It's a magnetic thing, just, I always had the opportunity of meeting people like um, Miles Davis, um, my church was Abyssinia. And, and, you know, it was a famous and, church. Yeah, Abyssinia, and um, a lot of big time people go there. And, you know, I just always, always met somebody that was in the, you know, that was a good star. It was so. because of your personality? Maybe, or? I think so, because I was, people like me. Was your, were your mother and father like that? No, my father, he wasn't around, but my mother was always there, and she was my, she, that's one reason why I stopped fighting, because when I lost my mother, I lost my desire to fight, because I was in the ghetto, you know? I was raised in the ghetto, and that's where I wanted to take her out of the ghetto. In Harlem, you were raised. In Harlem, What street right. were you raised on? I was on Amsterdam Avenue, 145th Street and 6th Street. And, um, you know, I was raised as a Catholic, things like that. and. Um, and when I became pro, when I first came pro, I had a block party for the whole area where I was living at. You know, people was like, well, that, that's the kind of person I was, you know. And I've been blessed by God, you know. Just like with, you know, like when I, when I found out that I had cancer, I'm riding in my car and I'm hearing about these, uh, you know, how people, uh, they get, Certain can I said no, I don't want to go through that. And then every time I touch the radio in the car, here comes this this gentleman named Liderman. Oh, he's a bum. <laughs> <laughs> and you impressed me so much. You Why? Know? Why? I don't know. You 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 you, 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 you was real. No, but you were around superstars. You were around Muhammad Ali and Joe Lewis, and hey. these are the biggest figures of their time, right? Well, yeah, could you, sure. Could you smell a rat from uh, 50 miles away? Uh, could you feel a smell of fraud? I could, I could, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I could. So what, what, now you've been fighting this prostate issue. You actually had biopsies and issues for yeah. 20 years, right? Right. And then you came to me when your, your cancer was terrible. You had a Gleason 9, which right. is one of the most aggressive cancers. Mm -hmm. And when you came to me, your PSA was 20. Mm -hmm. So the normal PSA is only four, yours was 20, and Gleason goes, from, is how the cancer looks under the microscope, from two to ten. Yours was nine. Right. Yours is one of the worst cancers ever. I'm telling you. And did your doctor, who, who was following you, tell you what you had? Well, when I first found out, well, I didn't know I had cancer, but I had an enlarged prostate all the time, you know, for a long time. And then when I moved to Brooklyn, then I was going to different doctors that I didn't know, and then everybody was saying, you know, you could have cancer, you know. I said, what do you mean I, I don't have no cancer? So, unfortunately, I, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. 
and I didn't know who to see. And when I went to a, a doctor, you know, the first thing they talk about was cutting me up and everything, all this, you know. And, I, and when I heard you on the radio, on the radio. Wait a second, they told you, okay, you went to the doctor, they told you you had cancer, and they want to cut on you. Yeah, they want to and cut And what did you think? I think that's a no-no. Why? I just, something told me, no, no, no. Did you have friends who had that surgery? No. So you knew surgery caused lots of harm? Yeah. Yeah. And so your surgeon told you to have surgery. He said, he said you can have, you have surgery. And, and you declined that. I declined. And so it takes yeah. a lot of strength to say no to your doctor, right? No. Well, yeah, but not, but not until I got some good information. And see, I, that was what I was looking for. I couldn't find it. All I could do was pray to God and give me, show me a way. And that's when you came along on the radio. So without the radio, you would have never I, known about all the options. I would have right? never known about the options. I certainly wouldn't have. Then I might have, it might have got that worse where I had no choice but to do what they say do because I'm reaching for people, you know. And so you had this Gleason 9 PSA 20 six years ago. Yeah. And you came to me and we talked about all the options. Do you remember that first meeting with me? Uh, yeah. And what, what happened during that first meeting? Well, you, when, you, when you broke it down to me, and you, you, you was like, like a brother, you know, like, you know, I, I just had that trust for you right away, you know, and um, the things he was saying is exactly what I wanted to hear, you know, and... Do you feel like we were saying the truth or we were just trying to please you? No, I, I did, you really was telling me the you know, truth, I, you know, because... I asked you questions and you told me whatever I asked you, and you, you gave me my options. Okay, do you feel like we hid any options from you? No. So you went through the treatment here, uh -huh. and it was a pretty short course of treatment. Do you remember how you felt during the treatment? Yeah, well, yeah, I had no problems. I, you know, I, I said, wow, where, 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 where you been in this world? You know, I said. So, okay, so you came in, you had a treatment. What did it feel like, each treatment? Remember? Uh, Do you have any pain? No pain. Any cutting or torture? Or no torture, no pain. No. So you walked in and you walked out? I walked home. in and I walked out. I said, wow, this is very good. And then your PSA went from 20 down to, you remember what it is right now? Zero. Zero. It's 0. <laughs> 0. 0.0, okay? 0. 0.0. After our treatment, there's been no chemo, no, no other. No chemo, no other stuff, but, and, you know. Uh, and you're living your life. I'm living my life. Yeah, that, yep. And you have a good quality of life. Uh-huh. And you're doing the things you want to do. Right. And was there any time that we did anything with you or to you that was that you felt was not in your interest? No. No, none. none. What would you tell someone who has a cancer what, what would you tell someone who comes to you and say, hey, Mr. Mashburn, I got cancer, what should I do? What do you, what do you tell people? I tell them where to go. I say, hey, you, you're lucky. <laughs> do you have any hesitation when you do no that? No hesitation whatsoever. I, you know, I, I'm the truth. I'm the truth, you know. And I like helping people. And when you can help a person that way and you're not jiving with them and you're giving them hope, and you give them something to, you know, and they can make a choice, you know, and it's, and it's logical, you know, what you say, you know, and hey, I, I like praise you, man, <laughs> you know, well, you, you know, so you know, and um, I just say, gee whiz, why, you know, why do people go through these changes and things like that? Because they don't know the history, they don't, they don't get the right, it, it looks like, some people are just trying to make that, make that money, get that, you know, that's all they want. Do you know men who have had surgery for prostate? No. Yeah, yes, my cousin had. Yeah, he did. Yeah. how did he do after that surgery? Uh, he's not here no longer. It's know. sad. Yeah. All right, well, God bless you, and thank you, and thank you for coming today. Thank you for being here on this world, man. I thank say you. God bless God you. God bless you, too. Okay. I'm here with... Curtis Sliwa, if you don't know, by the Red Beret and Red Sateen Jacket, Curtis Sliwa, founder and president of the Guardian Angels and talk show host at WABC. And running for mayor, right? That's right. Got to save this city. And so far, I'm looking at a lot of people out there. They're doing a lot of talking. But I, I don't think they have the, that ability to... Uh, 
get this city straightened out and also do more with less because there's no money. There's no money. <laughs> so we're going to talk about health care, you and your family. And I've known you, actually, I showed you a picture from about 30 years ago. You yeah. and I met when you were at ABC, where you are today. And I came and visited, and then you came and visited me in my office back then, and you saw radio surgery. And that led to, actually, one day, you had a problem with your father, right? He had a mass in his pancreas and a mass in his lung, and you can explain. Oh, that. my father, that? merchant seaman for 50 years, traveled the world. He was my inspiration, my mentor. And then all of a sudden, he was just like paralyzed. And it seemed like his stomach was growing, like, like, he, had, like he was pregnant. He went to a big hospital, and they didn't know. They had no idea. So naturally, my, my father was flummoxed. For the first time in my life, I saw this man that I so admired, was so down in the dumps, was thinking the worst, that worse would befall him. And then I said, oh, we, we got to go see Dr. Liederman, Dr. Liederman. And, uh, we never had any medical relationship up to that time. You knew me through ABC, but not as a doctor, really. Right, and I knew that you would give advice if you yourself couldn't deal with it specifically. Not like a lot of doctors, you know, they're so pretentious. Even if they don't know the answer, they want to create an answer, and you were so good uh, and came up with a doctor, a colleague of yours, who did the operation, saved his life. His entire innards would have been strangled. He would have been strangled to death from the inside. A horrible way to die. And I, I, our entire family was so grateful to you because you, you put him on the right path. And he had at that time actually a mass in the lung along with the mass in the pancreas. So that was all resolved. We resolved all of that, right? And next thing I knew, well, we grew closer and I took care of other family members. And then you came about 10 years ago with this diagnosis of prostate cancer, right? And we met actually right here. Yes. About 10, 11 years ago. Yep. And uh, you were telling me, no surgery, no surgery, no chemo, no chemo. What a stunat I was. Toughest guy in the world. No doubt about it. I consider myself the toughest guy in the world. I've been shot by the Gampinos. I've been given beatdowns. I barely survived. But all of a sudden, other people started talking to me. Oh, no, no, no. You better get that cut out. If you don't get it cut out right now, it'll metastasize to bone and organ, and you'll be dead within six months. It was me. I actually folded like a cheap camera. I didn't listen to what you said, and it was the worst mistake in my life. Other than getting married so many times, wait a sec, that, that's right on par there. It was horrible what happened. That's why this guy... Dr. Gil Liederman, I didn't listen to him. I was a stunad, right? I was a doomkopf. Don't make the same mistake. You just see him. The worst you can do is say, okay, I've learned more about what Dr. Gil Liederman does. But I guarantee you, when you hear him and you see all the patients and you see the success stories, you'll choose this route, which means you'll, you'll be able to function as a man again the way a man should be able to function. Thank you for helping so many other people. It's the least I can do. I got to make up. I got to make amends. You know what they say? No, that's not true. You, no, no, look, uh, you, you help so many people on the streets, people who are victims, even today at the train station, people who have prostate cancer, and so many people for decades. This is almost, what, five decades that you've been out there yes. helping people. Yes, and it's just all what I do. Uh, if I warn you about somebody who's ready to tug you up, I got to warn you about a white collar thug who's ready to steal your prostate and lead you into a life of misery. All right, well, thank you and God bless you. My pleasure, thank Doc. You. So, I'm here with... Jaylene. And what do you do? I am in charge of mailing out all the booklets and... And you do other things too, right? I also do billing and authorizations here with Dr. Lederman. Patients might know you when they call for information, right? Yes. So like this video we're doing, you may be on the video that you're sending out to other people with you and other patients on the video, right? Yes, I do. And so you talk to a lot of patients, right? Every single day, a lot of and patients. And what's your, what's your thoughts about all the people that call for information? You, 
you've done that hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times. Well, I'm pretty used to it by now. I get calls the minute I walk in, before I leave. There's a lot of patients that request the same booklet, so I just make sure to mail it out all day. And what's your impression of the people that call for information? Uh, they're really excited. They always tell me how excited they are to receive the, um, the packages and that they can't wait to receive it. So it's always good feedback. Do you have a good feeling when you mail them out? Oh, yes. I try to do it as fast as possible so that they can get it as soon as possible. And we have lots of booklets. We have about brain tumors and body tumors and breast cancers and skin okay. cancers and prostate. And we have yes. DVDs and some different languages, right? Yes, so we do. So how do you know what to send out to different people? Um, I usually ask them what type of package of information they're looking for, but they're pretty straightforward so if they ask me for breasts i send them a breast packet if they ask me for skin or what type of cancer they have i mail out whichever one they ask for and do you ever speak to the people after they get the package most of them actually call back and they set up an appointment and they usually call me back and i set it up for them and what what kind of things do they say after they receive the package information um that First, they say thank you, that um, they really enjoyed the packages, and that they actually just can't wait to come in and see Dr. Lita and they want to make the student's appointment available. And what's your impression? You've come here, you didn't have a medical background before this, right? No. So you came here and you've been working for quite some time, and when you first started seeing the booklets and DVDs, what were your thoughts about it? Um, I didn't think that people would actually call back and actually give feedback about it. So it was pretty impressive to see actual patients come with the actual package that they receive and have an appointment with Dr. Lederman. And people often do. They walk in the they door with the package. They walk in with, with the, the same package, package I mailed out, yes. mailed out. And then you see them and they meet and they meet me or another doctor. And then they want treatment, right? Very yes. commonly they want treatment. Yes. So you also see the patient about that and getting approval for their insurance, yes. right? And you're a pretty big expert actually on getting the approvals of patients who need approvals. Many insurances yes. need approvals. Many insurances do, yeah. And patients are, sometimes patients think they need to get some approval to come here, but in general, patients can come here for consultation and talk about their situation, right? Mm, yes, consultation first, and then they'll speak to you in regards to anything else. And sometimes people are fearful they're gonna get big bills or surprises. Do we actually ever have that happen? No, not at all, actually. Why? Because, I mean, us in the billing department, we're pretty straightforward, so if they have any issues, they can just call us back. But my job, along with Iris and NG, is to make sure that their insurances don't send out a bill. So we get approvals, right? Yes. They're covered. Because in a lot of hospitals, people go and get care, and then they get a bill for $100,000, right? And I'm yes. sure you've heard about that. Yes, a lot right? of times. Do any, does any patient here that you've ever seen ever get a bill like that? No. There's no surprises, no. right? No. And we satisfy everyone... To their needs, yeah. To so. their needs, right? And what do you tell people who have cancer? You must have friends and neighbors and others who talk about what you do. What, what do you say when you go home or go out or have I dinner? Actually, I've taken a few packages home and I've actually given them out to um, some of my neighbors in my building. But I would rec recommend them to come here. And of course, I work here, so they have a familiar face and I trust Dr. Lederman, so I actually advise them to come here. What do you do with a patient who's angry that they're getting treatment that doesn't work? Do you ever hear that? Um, I would advise them to just have a conversation with you or talk it out with somebody because I'm pretty sure something can be working out with, with you. And before you came here, did you have any idea about radio surgery and cancer and all this world of ours? No, I Never thought that this existed at all, actually. Could you imagine spending every day, all day, for the rest of your life? Never kind of thought work? that this existed at all. But it, it is a field that opened up many doors for me, so this is actually a field I will be interested in to be working in the future. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Lederman. I'm Dr. Lederman here with... George. And... Pamela. And <laughs> many years ago, seven... Plus years ago, one day you had new symptoms you never had before. New symptoms I never had before. I uh, intensely bloated over, over 
having overeaten feeling that didn't go away for three days. Okay, so the pain persisted. P pain persisted. And you were worried enough to go to the doctor, right? Well, I was forced to go to the doctor by my wife, who's so much smarter than I am. Right, well, that we know for good reason, and yeah. she was right, right. She was. Okay, so you went to the doctor, and what happened? I went to the doctor. He felt my stomach where he could feel my heart beating pretty heavily, thought I had uh, might have an aortic aneurysm. Which means that there your main blood vessel could blow out, right? Uh, so I die. was told, yes. So he said, uh, just go to the emergency room, go right now, don't ask any questions, which I did. And then I had a CAT scan. And uh, they said, good news, no a or aortic aneurysm. Bad news, you have a big mass in your stomach cavity. Okay, so they have big mass. They tell you what the mass is or could be? They did not. I was there for about five days, and they threw around a, a lot of words that ended in OMA, but nobody would, say <laughs> what it, nobody would say what it was. Did they do a biopsy while you're in the first hospital? No. Okay, so then you or they or somehow you left that place and went to one of the super-duper hospitals? Went to the super-duper hospital. I called a friend who is a... Uh, Big time oncologist, a lifelong friend. So this and is someone you've known since kindergarten, right? Since the day I was born. Since the day you were born, you went to a doctor who's a cancer doctor, so you had no doubt about trusting that person. None whatever. And so at that big hospital, what happened? The big hospital, they did a biopsy, which they swore to me would not hurt. It did. How did they do a biopsy? Uh, they stuck a needle in my, well, somewhere just above my... Uh, Stomach cavity. Okay, so stuck a needle in, it hurt, yes. and then what even hurt more is when you got the news, When right? I got the news, and which confirmed the news, really, that it was uh, cancer. Okay, and it was a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yep. And they did scans, and they found this you had huge masses in the abdomen, right? It was pretty big mass, and yes, in the, in the uh, stomach cavity, not in the abdomen itself, or not in my stomach. But in, not, in the, yes. not in the stomach, but in the in abdominal the cav cavity. Yes. And it was huge, almost the size of a basketball. It was huge, right? It was very large, yes. And your childhood friend, who you trusted implicitly, mm -hmm. told you, what were the treatment options that that person told you? Uh, the treatment options were uh, chemo. And what was number two? Chemo. And what was number three? Chemo. Did he ever offer anything else? No. So you went to one of the biggest doctors who you've known since birth. Yep and trusted in one of the biggest, most famous hospitals in New York. Yes. And they said, you got to have chemo. Yes. you got to have chemo. And you took it, right? Oh, I did. Were you ever reluctant to have chemo, or you thought if they all say it and you got this terrible cancer, you better take it? Well, I was reluctant right from the start. Why? Being, because I had heard and read pretty much that chemo is essentially po just going to poison me and essentially hope it kills the cancer. And um, But you are... I had cancer, and I had a friend telling me, this is the way you do it. So this, you had no doubts about his good advice? I had doubts about his good advice. I had no doubts that he believed that that was the best course of action. And he never offered any other options? No. And no. You, had, you took that chemo, which is pretty intense, right? It was very intense. And what did you feel during the chemo? That uh, I felt like uh, well, we used to we used to call them uh, lead ball days. I just felt like while I was having it, I was just out of it, out of it. And uh, and for the days after, if I could make it from my bed to the living room couch to lay down, that was a day's work. So it was like getting hit by a truck almost. Uh, constantly. And that was a series of treatments over months. Yes. And eventually, you had good news, right? Well, eventually I had good news. Eventually they said that the tumor was, they never said it was gone, but they said it was uh, responding. dead. It was yes, responding. Yes, it was responding. So it responded. And what did your friend say when the cancer had responded with the chemotherapy? He said, uh, he said well, there we go. He wanted me to take more to be sure. After, you know, a couple of extra doses afterwards, which I didn't do. And you didn't do that because of? Because I was sick as a dog. Uh, I mean, if somebody in uh, Los Angeles got a cold, I got sick. And um, I, couldn't, I couldn't walk up and down my driveway, which I couldn't do for almost a year afterwards. It was just horrible. It was like being dead, but not being dead. 
So all of a sudden, your best friend or one of your good friends' advice you didn't welcome any longer? Well, uh, no. No, I uh, wasn't what I wanted to do. Okay, so you just turned that channel off. I, uh, well, I, you know, it, when it came back, which it did. Okay, so then, well, wait, hold on a minute. Okay. So then a few months later, you got new scans, right? Did you yes. have more symptoms then no. or just no. new scans? No, just new scans. So you got new scans and new scans at one of these super-duper hospitals showed? Showed uh, a, a recurrence in a slightly different area, a couple of small lymph nodes that lit up. Okay, so there we had cancer came back. The cancer chemo, came back. That meant the chemo didn't work. If cancer comes back, the chemo yeah. didn't work, right? Right. So how do you feel when you learn that the chemo didn't work on a kind of lymphoma that it is supposed to work? Well, I, uh, I am married to a research queen, so uh, she did tons of research, and we, we uh, looked into all kinds of natural treatments, and you did those, right? I did them for, uh, yes, for almost a year of, um, you know, pills, tinctures, uh, you know, vitamins, everything. So you had vitamin imagined. C drips and mistletoe and... I had, I had it all enemas. up to and include... I didn't do that, although I should have. Uh, I didn't do acupuncture, although I have a friend who's an acupuncturist who I'm sure would love to have uh, stuck me a couple of and times. And you had a year of what I would call concoctions. <laughs> a year of concoctions up to and including going to Mexico and having a, uh, a well-known concoction. Okay, so in all that year, you had all these concoctions of yes. a variety. A variety. And none really went unnoticed. You went after everything you could find. Yeah, everything that I could find that we, that we could find on... We, we just went for the, the things The two intelligent that, person people could find. Yes. You went after. Yes. And you probably spent a lot of money on all those things, right? Uh, we, it, some of it cost quite a bit of money, yes. But She's we were helped out quite a bit by, um, well, the good grace of God. Okay, but nevertheless, good grace of God was helping you pay for things. Yes. But those things... Cost a lot of money. Cost a lot of money. And what, what was the proof of the pudding is, and did anything work? The proof of the pudding was that, as uh, you so uh, delicately put it the first time we saw you, uh, the tumor that you have in your body has been doubling in size every month. Right. So all those concoctions, all the money were useless, right? Uh, they were, as it turns out, yes. And do you have any thoughts now about that year of concoctions? Well, uh, <laughs> well, uh, when when uh, when you had said, "How do you like those natural cures now?" and I said it didn't work for me, and you said it didn't work for anybody, um, I couldn't very well argue with that. Okay, but you know why do I say that? Because. So many people think they can change their diet, make cancer go away, or take a vitamin, or an enema, or an ozone, or mistletoe, or go to Germany, or go to Mexico. I see so many people. For me, it's really sad, because some people give up their car, and their house, and their lifelong savings mm -hmm. to get something that never works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I try to convince people, at least understand that it's a scam. Yeah. If you want to give your money away, you can do that. But most probably, and I've, I've seen about 40,000 people, I've never ever seen concoctions, scams work. Mm -hmm. And that's why I try to warn mm -hmm. people whenever I can. Mm -hmm. But eventually you gave up on the scams, right? Well, well, we did because I, of course the tumor had grown to a size where I spent uh, almost three months sleeping by sitting in a chair and leaning over a stack of pillows because the pain was too, I couldn't lay down. So what was your plan then? You were in three months incapacitated with pain, cancer growing back. What was your plan? My plan was coming here. No, it wasn't because uh, you did the other stuff for a year and then you waited three months. So why, what, well, was, what was the... I, well, the, the three months that I, that I waited, I was still doing all that, you know, all that stuff. Uh -huh. And when it became... Uh, well, how should I say this? Painfully clear that um, that none of this stuff was working. Then, um, then our next, you know, our next thought was come here. How did you learn about radio surgery and Dr. Lederman? Well, we'd uh, I'd heard you on radio. I'd heard about you from other people as well. Um, from actually from a bunch of other people, and and in the research that. Uh, I say we did, but mostly Pamela did. She had certainly come across your uh, name in this treatment as well. 
So uh, we met. We did. And we spoke. Indeed. And you decided to get treated, right? I did decide to, well, yes, I decided <laughs> because after our initial uh, consultation, when you, uh, I, I think, I, and I had a PET scan, I'm not sure when that came in the thing, but when we saw what was in there, which apparently was wrapped around my spine and my aorta and my intestines, uh, you said, which I will never forget this, you said, well, when do you want to start treatment? And at the time, we, uh, we were supposed to go to Puerto Rico for 30 days to do uh, worship ministry down there. So I said, well, we're going to Puerto Rico for 30 days. Uh, I'll start when we come back. And you said, okay, sounds good. Except if you go to Puerto Rico, they're going to bury you there. You're not coming back. So we said, how about tomorrow? Okay, so why did you trust me? You, were, you had a best friend was one of the biggest hospitals, and I'm sure you were in contact with him. I'm sure he knew that this cancer was growing like crazy, and you told him you're going to Dr. Lederman, and he never told you about other options, right? He never mentioned, no, he never mentioned other options. I mean, other than somewhere along the line, there must have been a mention of radiation, you know, their version what of did radiation. He send, did he ever send you for radiation? No, no, he never sent me anything. When, when, I, when it came back at first, when the first scan showed that there was new activity, uh, he immediately wanted to do chemo again. Okay, so his, he had a single track mind, more or less. Seems. And did you tell him, hey, I'm thinking about going to Dr. Lederman? Did you ever tell him that? Uh, I told him that after, first I told him we were going to Mexico and doing all that stuff, which he was highly not happy with, but he did, he, he did send all my files down to the doctor down there. And, um, and you know, I don't even remember if we had ever mentioned You had to keep, him. he said, you have to keep getting PET scans every three months. That but did you ever say, did you ever tell him, hey, I'm thinking about going to Dr. Lederman, what do you think? Did you ever say that? Uh, we must have told him. We did tell him. We must have told and him. what did you say? Uh, as I recall, and I, uh, he was less skeptical than he was about Mexico, but I can't say that he was thrilled. Okay, so he wasn't thrilled. He wanted you to get chemo. He did. Right, and you, under no circumstances, were taking more chemo. Is that uh, correct? Under no, uh, God willing, under no circumstances would I ever do to chemo again. Okay, so you started treatment here. We mapped you out and you got you going. And yes. what was it like to get mapped out and going with our treatment compared to compared to chemo or anything else? Compared you went to chemo or anything else I went through, this was uh, a walk in the park. This, a walk uh, in the park. Uh, I mean, compared to that, this was fun. So, what did you feel during the treatment? I didn't feel anything during the treatment. I um, uh, the the mapping and the body thing was interesting, and then you. You don't feel anything. You lay there under that uh, huge, great machine, and it uh, goes this way and goes that way, makes a couple of sounds, and 10 minutes later, they go, okay, you're done. And as you got some treatments, did you feel better or no better? The pain, what happened to the pain, and the doubled over and the, all those? After the first treatment, after the first treatment, by the time I got home, uh, the pain was, was more intense than it had ever been. Um, I'm not sure why, but it was just unbearably intense. And, um, and but I took a painkiller of some description and fell asleep. And when I woke up, the pain was gone. And uh, and then there was never pain again, except after five or six or eight treatments or something like that. My uh, Apparently, the, the rays were going through my intestine or something like that. And I got a little irritated. And I think we took a week off of the treatment to uh, do that, but that was the only noticeable side effect, you know, except for being a little tired, but that may have been from just driving into the city three days a week. So you had this huge cancer in your abdomen. Huge cancer. Well, everywhere at that time. Well, it was very extensive. Huge cancer. You were told you had to have chemo by one of your best friends. You ignored that because you'd had chemo. It didn't work. You came here, had radio surgery, and that was about five, six years ago, right? Uh, in that ballpark. Yeah. Somewhere around there, yes. Okay, so in that ballpark. And how have you been since that time? I have been, I've been fine since that time. I think, I think that somewhere, in, somewhere along the line, a, uh, another one popped up somewhere else. Another lymph node popped another up. Another lymph node popped up, which, which we treated the same way. It was way. outside of the area where the first 
yes. mass was. Yes, different area. And we treated that and second we, area. We treated that second area, and and I have been um, in remission or... Uh, or There's been no yeah. evidence of cancer, no right, evidence for all of these cancer years. Have, since. have you had any surgery for this cancer since no. we met? No. Have you had any chemo, immunotherapy, concoctions, remedies, or anything else since we first met? No. No, and just this. You've gone to a variety of places to get imaging. So you've had an independent people image you. Yep. And they've all said that, to the best of their knowledge, there's no evidence of cancer in you yes. years later. Yes. And you've lived on your lifestyle. Yes. Have there been any limitations to your lifestyle? Uh, not due to this, no. And you go around the country, maybe around the world, you go around the world performing. You're a religious man and you do musical religious events to large crowds around the country and beyond. We, uh, we, do, uh, we do do events, uh, events, I don't know about religious, but yes, we are people of the book. So yes, we do events and we do travel. And, uh, and uh, yeah, there's no, no limitations from this that I can determine. And you're a God-fearing person. Very right? much so. And what do you think, that is there a message in what we've done and a message in your life and a message in the last years of, of what's, well, where have you traveled? Well, we, the, in the Bible there's a, there's a verse that says God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So we took that to heart and every time we went through, no matter what we went through, we knew that it was his purpose and it was in the long run somehow for our good. So, so that was comforting. Uh, as for the treatment, I get, called, I get called at least once a week from somebody I know or somebody who knows somebody who has cancer. Uh, we, we recommend to all of them that they come here first uh, from experience. I said, I don't know what he can do to, for you if he can, but he won't lie to you. They'll tell you what the truth is, and the can and the treatment treatment is painless and and side effectless. Wow, that was okay. awkward. Um, I said I, I can't imagine why you would go anywhere else. I mean, I can I can see going getting other opinions and going here and there, but I can't imagine why you wouldn't come here. Uh, you know, with knowing firsthand what the what the deal is. Okay, so we're here with your. Research queen, who's always with you, supporting you. So what other words can you think of to talk about the road your husband's traveled about his cancer? Well, it's been, it's been uh, a, a real uh, intense journey. And, um, you know, I, I guess uh, it's a suffering that, that makes us uh, who we are, right? And, and uh, so, but, but when we came here, I really thought that I was going to be burying my husband. Like I could see him basically dying in front of me and so so the fact that we were able to get in here was a miracle and because when we first made the appointment they wanted to schedule it for a month later than the time when we scheduled it and uh, we called a friend who knew someone <laughs> who knew you or knew someone and, and the next day he was able to get in and praise God because because he was so ill and um, I mean I just I just praise God. I really do because you really you your treatment saved his life. I mean, there's no no question about that. You know. Did you ever have a thought that something I said wasn't motivated for your husband's benefit? No, I felt like you were painfully honest. You know, I I, I think that the the problem with a lot of doctors in general is that they don't want to say the rough things. I mean, we don't want to ma upset people and make it difficult, but reality is reality, you know, and especially when it's talking, when you're talking about life and death and when you have a disease like this, that's all encompassing, this disease is, is horrendous. And so I, I, I would just pray my prayers that anybody that has any, has cancer of any type, you know, would come to you first. Literally, I would. I tell everybody that. If I had cancer, I would come to you. No question. Do you understand why some doctors don't be honest with their patients? Uh -huh. You know, 
I'm in the cynical side of me says it's a financial motivation, but I, I, I truly believe that doctors want to do good, but they're just not either they're not taught, they don't go further in their study to learn more, you know, more about what they can do for patients. I don't know. You know, I, I really don't know. Um, it's a real shame. It's, it's a shame because, uh, you know, it's, this is so easy. This seems so easy to me in comparison to what, when I was watching him go through chemo, I mean, I literally thought he was going to die getting chemo. So you know? I. Yeah. So, which is why he chose not to do it again. And I realized when it came back that, that um, if he wasn't going to get chemo, he was going to die. You know, so when we found you, it was like, praise God. That's all I could, you know, literally. I mean, literally. You know. By the way, we greatly appreciate the fact that you just say, you know, oh, yeah, you're not going to live another 30 days. I mean, <laughs> if that's what you think. Because, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's harsh, but, but the disease is harsh. I don't, I don't need somebody to tell me, you know, well, there's blah, 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 blah. I don't need blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, here's the, sto you know, here's the story. Bang. You know, uh, we, we do the same when we preach. You know, hey, God says it's my way or the highway. You come here, you go, you, you know, there's one way you do this. And people go, oh, well, that's that. Blah, blah, blah. Well, it's not blah, 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 blah. He doesn't do gray areas. And mercifully, uh, you don't. When you, uh, when you told us what was going on, didn't do gray areas. Here's what's happening. You do this or... See you later, bye. Appreciate One thing I should that. tell you that I try to get people in sooner. So if any listeners should know that if you yeah. need me sooner, yeah. I do, yeah. I'd rather work more yeah. than make people suffer at home. So yeah. if you need me, Amen. just send me an email or call me directly and I will take care of it. Amen. Yeah. And thank you for coming on this uh, special well, day. Well, thanks for having us. Right, God bless you. you. Thank and you. And thank you so God much. You. So I'm here with Shanto. And tell us what you do here. Um, I work as a radiation therapist, so I'm the hands-on of delivering the treatment, setting up the patients, and answering any questions they have in the room before they start treatment or in the midst of it. So patients come here, and patients come from New York, and they come from around the world, and you meet them. And what's your impression when you meet these patients coming for care? Um, well, that they've been through a lot, so I try to recognize that they've, up to this point, they've been through a gamut of medical care tests and so on so um, they ha often have a lot of questions even with all that experience so try to be patient with that and understand what they're going through but for the most part I think they're pretty brave you know to go through what they're going through overall and um, it's a pretty rewarding experience. It's rewarding for you or for them? Um, I, I would say both hopefully um, for how's myself for sure. How's it rewarding for you? Um, well because I'm always learning something new and um, I, I think that a lot of times I'm able to help and like the team here is able to help them kind of uh, navigate like what they're nervous about or, you know, like to feel comfortable. So and so they feel like they're getting a good treatment and you so know, you, we're going to do well. You've been in the field for a while. You've seen our patients and you've seen the results of our patients because often I'll bring a patient back who had a terrible cancer and the cancer went away. Yeah. Right. So how does that make you feel? Oh, wonderful. That's that's what it's all about. That's and, really what it's about. And often during the course of a treatment, we see people in terrible pain and we treat them and the pain goes away. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's the the best part also to see. Um, not only they f they feel uh, meant like they feel relaxed, but also that physically their pain is is alleviated. And sometimes it's it's immediate. And sometimes you see the progression slowly, but it's nice to see it happen. You know. So yeah. it must make you feel great that you're helping people who are suffering suffer less or be cured. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we treat many people who are cured. They never have a cancer again. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. You worked elsewhere before you came here, how, would, how is this place different than where you worked in the past? Uh, well, there are a lot of things. I, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is the speed with which patients get in because in, I've worked in big hospitals and they'll put you through um, an initial consult, then they'll send you for this test, then they'll send you for another, like a follow-up, and then they'll do a scan. And there'll be all these hoops you have to jump through here it's, um, they cut out a lot of those middle steps. So you can get a consult and then get a test quickly and get 
scan with us and then start treatment in a much shorter period. So I think that's a better experience. I don't know if we cut out the steps. I just think we expedite the steps. Well, know? that's what I mean. Yeah. Right. We get on the phone and say, hey, we need to do this test now and we need to do the blood test now and we need the other appointment now rather than say, oh, okay, you can come back in a month or three weeks or six weeks. Exactly. And I mean, you feel that. You feel that other places move like molasses compared to us. Oh, 100%. Do you think patients recognize the difference uh, here versus elsewhere? Um, a lot of times, yes. They'll comment on that? Yes, definitely. What's the best feeling about being here? Um, I think we have more of a personal touch. Um, we, uh, it's, it's kind of family oriented, I think, it, and not, not to go on about bigger hospitals, but it's, uh, um, you get to interact with the patients um, in, in from like the scan, like oh, you, you really get to know them and you also get to work on their schedule with them and um, meet their families. And it's, I, I feel like it's a more whole experience than um, other places, you know, I've seen. If you had to run a radiation department, how would you do it in the best possible way? Or what do you think we do that's good or bad or otherwise? Um, I think the good thing is we're very flexible with patients, which is important because they also have a lot of things going on behind the scenes. So I, I think that's really important. I would, that, that would be the, the first thing is to put the patient first and be flexible like we are. Looking at a career in radiation, helping hopefully cure people, it, that has to be one of the best things in your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any regrets about your career or working here or the, what you do every day? No. No. I, you know, I would pursue something else if that was the case, but I, I really love what I do. It's really rewarding and um, it, it's, it's always teaching me something new and I think it's, it's a really, it's a great experience. And advice to patients who are seeking out care, what would you give as advice to someone who's got a cancer and is seeking out care? What kind of things would you tell that person how to get better care? You know your options and just do, do your research is probably the best. All right, thank you so much. God bless you. I'm here with... Debbie Francois. And Debbie Francois, I've known for a long time, right? About five years. And you were married once, right? Yes. And you had a husband who was sick, right? Right. And you took care of your husband. You gave loving care to him, right? Yes, and I didn't take care of myself. And during that time, you didn't take care of yourself. Well, you're taking so much care for your husband right. who died. Yes. Not of cancer, of something totally unrelated, right? Mm -hmm. And you were sick, but you kind of neglected yourself for love of your husband, right? Right, yes. And what did you notice? What symptoms did you have back well, then? I really didn't have any symptoms. The only thing that actually saved me from this to, to find it was I had a lump on my neck. Right, so that was a symptom. You had a lump in the yeah. neck yeah. and it shouldn't be there. It wasn't belonging there, right. right? And they tried many different things and it didn't go away. And then finally they what decided- did they, What did they try? That, well, they, they thought it was different. Maybe it was a, a thyroid, mm -hmm. different kind of things. And they tested me for that. but. Till it finally, it was about a month, and it was getting a little larger, and it wasn't going away, and they decided to send you for a biopsy. So you got a biopsy, and what mm -hmm. were you told about the biopsy? And so when I met the doctor, he said to me, I don't have good news for you. You know, you have, absolutely have a tuber, and it is cancer, and uh, we suggest that you have surgery immediately to remove it. So what kind of surgery were they talking about? Well, at the time, I wasn't really sure of it, but they tried to explain that they were going to take the tumor out, but I didn't know they were taking all the lymph nodes out as well. I mean, it was a radical, it was called radical dissectional surgery. Right, so they did radical the carcinoma, surgery. Uh, carcinoma of the neck. Right, so you had squamous carcinoma, right. you had radical surgery, it was a big radical, operation. Radical, They cut right. muscle, everything. You um, went to a surgeon, you had radical yes, surgery, went yes, to a big surgeon, a big yes. hospital, right? Right, and, and about two weeks after the surgery, which I was in, terrible shape and on so much pain. They sent me to a oncologist and they wanted to start radiation and uh, chemo uh, right away. Well, first it was chemo, not radiation, it was chemo. And I said to them, absolutely not. I'm not well enough. I'm still recuperating. Um, it was, I didn't want to do any more. And when the, when the surgeon did radical surgery, did he tell you that the radical surgery wouldn't cure you, that you would need other treatment as well? Did he ever say that or they never told you that? They didn't really say that. They were saying they were going in to take it out. Well, <laughs> so you assumed that the surgery was going to be enough. Right. And then after the surgery, 
Did we have any complications with the surgery? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, pain mean, or any oh, suffering? Oh, yes, or? yes. I mean, terrible. I mean, I was uh, I was like an injured bird. That's how okay, I so described you were, it. Okay, so you were really suffering. Yes, yeah, suffering weeks, a lot. And two weeks later, they told you you're going to have to have chemo and standard radiation, Yes, right? yes. And, and they your sent response? me... My response was absolutely not at the time because I'm not even healing or I just had this surgery, which I'm in I'm immense pain and uh, I was not going to do that right now. So the oncologist said, well, if you don't do this, you're not going to survive. And he uh, gave me a, a six pack of Ensure, told me to drink as much as I can because after I start the treatment, my throat will close up. I will have to have a feeding tube and I'm not going to, you know, it's going to be, I'm going to be uh, in a bad shape for did quite a few it? months. Did you do that? No, absolutely not. I said, I so I left there and I thought about it and I said, absolutely not. So what did you do um, to try to take care of this cancer? So what I did was I, I was always into holistic medicine as well. So I searched other areas. I, you know, it's, it's a sad thing because when you are a cancer victim, you are, really taken advantage of in many, many ways, but... Do you feel like you were taken advantage of? I was not given all the information at the time. I, you know, they rushed everything. They made me do surgery without having to have any other thought. Do you um, feel like you were rushed into surgery? Yes, yeah. And after the surgery then, you chose actually alternative kinds of things, right? right? And I came across something called Select. And what is that? And uh, it's a... This doctor, this guy was going to be a doctor. He wasn't. But anyway, he was into medicine and he developed and processed this thing called Select. He had um, pancreatic cancer when he was uh, 16 years old. And after surviving that and taking all kinds of supplements and vitamins, because they told him there was nothing they could do at, at, after he had the surgery and they sent him home. And he started taking all this stuff because he was doing. Let's talk about you for a minute. Okay. So, so you anyway, had, he developed this thing. So you had you had alternative concoctions and things for several years, yes. right? And he kept it at bay for a while. So you had you had uh, vitamins. Yeah, I was taking this this um, antioxidant. Right, right. All the stuff. Mistletoe. I was taking about fifty C. or sixty different supplements. Sixty different things. Right. But the cancer came back. Cancer came back because I fell at it traumatized everything. Well, it neck. came back because of the concoctions also, didn't work. Right, it right? didn't work. Because if they worked, it wouldn't come back. Right. So you had concoctions, and you probably spent a lot of money for the concoctions. Absolutely. Like I said, none of this is covered. Lots it was of all money. on my own. And that's why you felt taken advantage of. Yeah. And then you also had, you saw a doctor who gave you uh, insulin chemo, right? IP, I, I, IPT, ITP. yep. It's supposed to make the cancer uh, treatment go right into the cell. Right, right. Which is also considered something that's not, that's very questionable, let's say that. Okay, okay I'll leave yes, it like that. yes. And you also had a doctor, remember, who actually injected the No, he's the same doctor that who, injected me. He, he gave the, c the chemo called treatment. Called himself a chemo cowboy, yeah. Chemo cowboy, he injected the chemo right into the masses. You had huge yes, masses. Yes, yes, yes. I'm still suffering today right. when from you came, concussion. And that didn't work either. No. So you went four years with concoctions and insulin, chemo, yeah. and injections, and none of it worked. And by that time, I was... You were in big trouble. Yes. Right? So, Do you remember how much big trouble you were in? Yes. I remember coming here, and I bought my information, and you said this is Do you remember how big inclusive? the cancer was when you came here? You, you told remember? me I only had this much opening, no, so... It, right, but you yeah. had cancer that was about six centimeters on both sides. Yeah, wrapped around my... my you had uh, cancer six centimeters, like plums up and down the neck on the right and the left side. You were yeah. ready to die. Yes, I couldn't swallow, couldn't eat, couldn't drink, yeah. You remember how miserable you were back then and how the cancer was so terrible. You had the surgery, the cancer came back. You had four years of concoctions, vitamins, ozone, injections, insulin. Yes, I did everything, you're and right. None of it worked. Yeah. And you came back really in big trouble. Mm -hmm. And what were your thoughts then when you met me? Well, I knew I was very bad. I was hoping um, praying that you could help me. I was hoping that you weren't going to... Why did you come here? How did you learn about our work? Well, I heard about you on the radio for years. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was so against radiation and chemo and everything. I just didn't want to do that because I figured I learned that, you know, chemo stays in your body forever. But now I know after being what I have in an aggressive cancer that you need that to keep fighting and killing. So we put together a program for you. Yes. And we put together a program to try to help you, right? Yeah. 
And when you left here that first day, did you feel like you could trust us or not sure? Or why did you eventually have our treatment? Why? Well, I was overwhelmed after speaking with you and you showed me where I was and that I was near death. Um, did I, you feel like you were near death? Yes, yes. Because like I said, I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. I knew something was very, very wrong. And I remember you telling me that the test that I had was inconclusive and I needed to come back the next day, which was a shock, to have another PET scan and then come over to you and we'll go over the whole thing. And uh, So we immediately got you staged up to see where the cancer was because right. this had been in your system for four years. We didn't know if it traveled to your lungs or bones or liver. We right. didn't know, right? Right. Yep. And we staged you up. We found this massive cancer in your neck, both sides. And then we offered you treatment, right? Yes. And why did you accept that treatment? Well, at first I was like, you said that I would have to come in by train every day. I live very far. And you said there's going to be days I'm not going to want to come. But it's your life. And I knew that if I didn't do this, I was going to die. So there's no other doubt. Port Jefferson. Port Jefferson, 70 miles out. Yeah, so 70 miles away. An hour and a half yeah. commute. So right. it's a big nuisance. Yes. And, and why I, did you make that commute? Because I, it was my life. I mean, to you save you, your life, yes. right? You're and, here to save your life. Yes. And I, I went through a lot of other places to try to uh, get other things that you had asked me to do with chemo, but nobody else would give it to me unless I did something else. So, P.S., I came in here for 10 weeks every day by train. Um, and with my faith and my support of my friends and my church family. And you have great family and friends, And right? also the support of you, because there was many times I was at the end where I thought, I didn't think I could do it. And you were so supportive, and uh, and you did it. And that's and like I did it. seven years ago, right? Yeah. It's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Seven years ago, you were treated. You came here, and the cancer has what? Cancer is gone. Has it ever come back in those seven years? No. And I even had an incident with my kidney. Well, and we'll you talk about that in a minute. Okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So, so, in seven years, we treated you. Yes. And the cancer has never come back. Right? Nope. You've had no, for the throat cancer, you've never had any more radiation, chemo, immunotherapy, surgery, or anything else, right? No. And you've been cancer free for seven years. And I want to say one thing I went through chemo for 10 months that almost killed me twice, and the horrific, terrible pain and stuff that you go through with that. And I have to say that my treatments here, I can go back. I can go home. I can function. There was no pain. Um, what was the treatment just, like? Can you tell just, people what, what your treatment was like when you came here? It was on, it was incredible. I mean, it was. I sat in a machine. It just zoomed. I zoomed, beamed, and I didn't feel anything. And uh, no pain. No pain. No, no suffering, anything. No. You lose your and hair. not only that, like I said, I had energy because I could leave and I could if I had to do something, I could do it. It's not like I have to chemo or whatever, the other, you'd have to go home and lay down and you couldn't function. And then we started to see those nodules, those big massive nodules in both sides of the neck going away. Yes. Right? And they've went away, they've never come back, it's seven years later and you're doing great, right? And all I can say is I just wish that I had come to you sooner because I would have avoided all that I went through in a lot of different ways. Well, we're making the but, video uh, so that other people learn from well, you, from they, your experience. They should. Right? They should give you... They, now, sometimes people say, hey, Dr. Lederman, do you follow up your patients, right? They say, Dr. Lederman, okay, you treat people, but do you follow them up, right? I do. And have we followed you up? Absolutely. And what was the biggest shock in the follow-up? That there was no cancer. Well, but there was a that, cancer. Well, there was a cancer, but you But there was a different it. cancer. Right, you had it, oh. right? Yeah, and not we, related. Not related. Well, you were a smoker before, right? Yeah, years ago, And these yes. are probably two smoking cancers, a throat cancer, probably. And then over the years, we've been following you and checking you, right? Mm -hmm. And we found... A spot on my kidney. A mass on the kidney. And yeah. we offered to do a biopsy of that, right? Yes. And we found that you had a kidney cancer that probably would not have been found if you weren't coming here for checkups, Absolutely right? right, being checked regularly, yes. You were checked regularly, and right. we found a new spot in the kidney that wasn't there before, 
and we arranged a biopsy and we told you you have this cancer in the kidney and you can lose the kidney. Now, you, most people who come to us with kidney cancer, they see a urologist who tells them, oh, you have to have surgery to remove well, I did. the kidney. I did. You, you, told me, you told me to go see a urologist. Right. So, okay. I, so I went to see one and he said to me, we can remove it with robotic surgery. Okay, and what do you think about that? I was not, I'm not happy about surgery. I mean, I, I know what I'm, I'm still healing from this one and that's 10 years ago. So what I'm saying is I came back to you. I told, Why did you come back? First of all, I trusted you completely because you, I, my, my kidney, I mean, my cancer is gone in my neck. And that, like I said, I trusted the way you are always been supportive, honest, and, uh, have we ever America. told you any, have we ever, what would you say again? I didn't hear what the last word was. You were always supportive and honest. And I, I just can't thank you enough. I mean, I'm here because of that. Um, Did you ever think that we said something or had motivations other than for your best interests? No. Now, so you saw the surgeon for the kidney cancer, which was incidental. We found it while we were checking And he was yelling at me, how could you even think of radiating it? Uh, you need to have it removed or go in and take it out. And I said, absolutely not. So I came back to you. I told you about it. And you said, it's your choice, whichever way you want to go. And I said, absolutely. I'm going to have ra um, the radi radio surgery. Now, did the kidney cancer surgeon ever tell you there are options that you don't have to remove your kidney? Did he ever say that to you? He said that at the time, you could wait a little bit, but you definitely need it removed. Well, what does it mean to you that you have a cancer growing in your kidney? That will, remember, this can, you had scans of your body before because we were checking your body for the right. throat cancer. Right. So you had scans of your body before, which did not show the kidney mass. And now all of a sudden it shows the kidney mass. So it means that it wasn't there before. It's there now. And the surgeon's telling you, you don't have to treat it right now. Right. So what do you think about that? I was not happy with it. I was not happy with him and um, what he had to say. So I came back here and I said, this is where I'm going to do it. So you've now been treated for the throat cancer. It's been in remission, no other treatment since then. Right. Right. You've been treated for the kidney cancer, no yeah. other treatment since radio surgery. No. What was it like to get radio surgery for the kidney cancer? What did you feel? I will say that the kidney cancer was a little bit more intense than my neck. I, you know, I did a lot with my neck, I will tell you that. But the kidney was a little more intense because I had nausea and I guess because the other organs are close by. Other than that, you know, it was a little bit more. But did you miss it was any still, activities due no, to the treatment? No. Did you, you have any cutting or bleeding or anesthesia? No, or and that's, that's what's so remarkable about this treatment. So for the kidney cancer, tell us what typically happened to you when you came in for kidney cancer treatment. Well, at the time I spoke with you, you said it might take about five treatments to take care of it. And uh, we had the treatments here. I came in as I normally would. Like I said, I had a little bit of nausea with this particular one, um, but it was, you know. Compared to the side effects you had from all your chemo and radical surgery. Oh, nothing, nothing compared to that. I it's mean, nothing just, compared to that. No, I mean, I had some it's, nausea, but like I said, it went it away. It went away by itself? Yes, yes. Okay, now it's been quite a while since the kidney cancer treatment too, right? Right. And you're in remission from that too? Yes, I'm happy to say that I'm in full so you've remission. So you had two cancers which could have done you in. Yes. And right now... And it's because of having the... Um, Che being checked regularly, coming in for the PET scans, and like you said, full body PET scan. So you were able to see that when it appeared. Any regrets about anything? No, not at all. I tell everybody they should come here. And I know there's other places that have started this, but Dr. Liederman is the one that brought it here. He's the original one and he's done a lot of it. And that's where you want to come. You want to come to someone that has the knowledge and has the experience that has been doing it a long time. And uh, you can, you know, as he said to me in the beginning, when I first came here, when I bought my results from other places, it's like buying a Mercedes and a Hyundai. Depending where you go is what you get. And I do believe that very, 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 very much. Thank you very much. God bless you. You should live to be 120. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so too. Thank you God so much. You. Thank you. So I'm here today with 
Uh, Elena. And? David. And you remember eight years ago? I do. It was eight years ago. Yes, um, a little short, but a couple go months short, but yes, almost eight months. months, eight years. Eight years. Eight years ago, you came, and at that time, you didn't come here first. You had a lump in the breast, right? Um, yes, it was a big lump. It was a in big lump. Breast. And you had a lump in the armpit, right? Yep. And you went to a couple hospitals, one in the five boroughs and one very super famous hospital, right? Right. And in five boroughs. Both were in five Right, but the one boroughs. big one was here in Manhattan. That's right. And you went there and you had uh, scans, you had PET scans, and you even had a biopsy in your spine. Correct. And they found that you had a cancer from the breast that traveled to the lymph node and then got in the bloodstream and went to the spine, stage four cancer. And as I remember, you were having terrible pain too in the spine. Yes. The cancer was in the spine. I think you were in the hospital getting narcotics because it was so painful, right? Yes, and um, uh, as a matter of fact, they were never putting two things together because they were not uh, seeing an MRI, they could not prove that that was quite related to cancer, whatever it was, but yes, and that's when you decided to go another route. Well, you, I didn't decide. Right. I didn't <laughs> decide at all. In fact, uh, you never knew about me, and your husband then was deeply, intimately involved in seeking the best possible care for his great wife, right? That's right. Do you remember that? Of course, how can I forget? And uh, you talked to some of your friends, right? Right. And what happened? You were you were told you had you must have been told you had at the big hospital stage four cancer, and they probably offered you treatment, right? Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say treatment. It's What's more, that? I would not say they offering you treatment. They, what did they offer you? They offer offered you a death row. A death. Death row. Death row. Management. And uh, so they told you I had a terrible prognosis and they were going to, at the other hospital, actually give you standard radiation. You had cancer in the bottom of your spine, the lower part of your spine. Mm -hmm. And they had planned the radiation and how they were going to give it would be through your pelvis. So it would have destroyed your uh, I uterus. I would be childless. You would be, it would have destroyed your uterus and your ovaries, right? Mm -hmm. right? And they never talked to you about radio surgery, as I remember. No. They never told you about the different kinds of radiation. And they never told you what the, their, their radiation was going to do to you and your body, right? It was standard. It was no. standard, but they never told you what that meant. No. You never no. understood because they couldn't tell you. They weren't telling you until you came here. And we talked about the difference between pinpoint radiation, just to radiate the cancer, versus to radiate the pelvic area which would have been so detrimental to you that's correct right and you came here and you'd been at two big hospitals and for some reason you trusted what we talked about here right i remember Sorry. coming here yes um first of all i have to thank the one from above um i don't take it for granted i you know, I, I feel lucky um, and blessed that I uh, being diagnosed with something that for many people is pretty much um, taken as a death sentence. I was able to make it um, and I'm still here today. Thank God. You're here today, actually, right. with a new addition to your family. Thank God. Right. <laughs> right. At the end but of the treatment, you came I, and I you had uh, this incredible news, right? Yes. A month after we finished uh, all radiation, I found that the, out that I was expecting a baby. <laughs> a little baby. And the little baby is here with us today. And how old is our little baby? Rafael. Rafael, how, how old are you? Six. Say it, say it. Six. Huh? Six. Six, it's pretty good, right? <laughs> so during that course of time, and we put together a program to try to get this cancer under control in a good way and not to hurt your body. That was the idea, to try to control the cancer, 
hopefully have a long survival and not hurt you. That's right. Right, and we involved some systemic therapy. We had the very fanciest treatment, and we do that for every patient. It wasn't only because you're so special, but actually everyone who comes here, we try to do the best possible treatment because we want to protect their body. We don't want to hurt healthy tissue just to get rid of the cancer. And that's what makes you so different. You're saying that um, you did not do something special for me. Well, I did feel that, like an individual, the treatment was specifically um, chosen to fit my needs, that it was not standard protocol, no, we do it in this order, not in that order. It was, you know, you were changing things as you went along right. to, to, to make it work for me. And you know that that's that's what make made us also feel more comfortable here and uh, gave us hope if you would well you did not make any promises of course but you did not take that hope away that yes it's serious yes people unfortunately die from it but you know the the treatment seemed to work and together we can uh, so you trust make it, make it, uh, make it work. So I felt the trust because I felt that you are a humble doctor who can apply your knowledge, your um, experience, um, the techniques, whatever you are using, the best ones to uh, help me while still, you know, leaving some um, place for a miracle also to take, to, to come into play. And that's what I think was different here. So why did you think you trusted me and not the, the, you went to one of the, actually two big hospitals, one of the biggest ones in the world. Why did you come here? Some people would say, oh, I have to go to the biggest one. All oh, my neighbors are saying, am I going here or there? And they went through the same, right? What? I, I went through the same, you went through uh, the same thought, process. thought process. Of course, you always want the best for your, you know, in this type of a situation. And my husband, okay, well, the, there was a no-brainer where we are going with it. We went to one hospital where I was diagnosed. Um, I mean, they have great people working there and uh, everything else, but still there was something missing. There was something missing to where I would, like, all the questions that we had would be answered. Then we went to the best whatever well, is considered best. the best, right? Uh, most um, prestigious, if you would. Um, I mean, yeah, it's big, it's, but um, I did not feel that it was about me. Is that, what, is that the difference, that you yes. felt that going someplace else was not about you, it was about them? Uh, yes, and the questions, uh, you know, the questions that we were asking, they were normally answered. I'm not saying that, you know, doctors in other places are bad. I don't want it to be taken this way, but the approach is different. And um, the questions that we were asking, sometimes the response that we would get, well, because that's how we do it here. Mm -hmm. um, don't really question us, that's, that's a standard, because with this type of um, diagnosis, that's what we currently give out to all of the So patients. everyone gets the same, right. everyone who walks in their doors with stage four breast cancer gets the same treatment, pretty much no matter uh, what. Uh, right, and we were set up, like my husband calls it a death row, but we were set up on, uh, okay, people live on average for that long to that long, and we're gonna manage it, so you're gonna start with that. No, you, you, you will probably need to keep your hair short because it's gonna be years years of treatment. So that's what the kind of, um, you know, I mean, you get lucky, maybe, yeah, we'll reevaluate. So I, I feel like that was taking away hope from me. So then you came here and we treated you almost a couple months, like two months short of eight years when you came here. And you came here and you had a s series of treatment and we treated the breast and the spine where the cancer was, mm -hmm. you had a little other treatment. And since that time, you've had no other treatment. 
For almost what, seven years, you've had no treatment. Right. So seven years, you've had no treatment. You've had scans on a periodic basis, and uh, you've seen doctors on a periodic basis, and there's been no evidence of cancer anywhere in your body, and there's been no treatment for all these years. Thank God, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And you have a son now who's six, so he was clearly born a year and a half, two years after you were diagnosed, and he's in good health, and he's a smart boy and yes. handsome boy, and you have a beautiful daughter. What advice would you give to other patients who are diagnosed or looking for different treatment for breast cancer or other cancers? Well, first of all, um, speedy recovery and uh, may whatever comes, you know, with it. Don't try to ask a question why. Try to ask what for. Try to, you know, turn bad into good. It is important to have um, the right doctor, doctor who is humble enough, who will care about you. That trust between patient and doctor is very important. Um, did you ever feel that we did anything that was against your interest? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> well, some people think that and some people come here and they feel like the doctor is trying to push them to get chemo or push them to do this or push them to have surgery. And they don't feel it's for them, it's they feel it's like for the hospital or for the doctor. So I'm just asking you, did you ever feel that we were doing anything against your best interest? Uh, well, um, we always asked a lot of questions. If I didn't ask questions, my husband had a list of his questions. Maybe every ten times time. more. Yeah. T every time we came for an appointment and uh, did we question even you? Yes, we asked our questions. So before starting anything new, we asked those questions. And this is important. And this is also, I try to say to everyone who I meet, um, you know, over the years I have come across many women, mostly women, uh, with the same um, who are going through the same situation that I went through. And this is something that I tell them that, yes, trust is important, but you still have to do your, you know, your homework. You have to be comfortable. And for somehow, Dr. Liederman, that's what also, um, it, it all made sense. Things that you were, you know, doing and what uh, uh, my oncologist was doing, who you referred me to, and you worked as a team very close together. And at the end of the day, it all made sense, and all of our questions uh, were pretty much answered. So I did not feel that anything you were doing were against me. Um, you were, you know, evaluating um, every time, and you were telling me, explaining to me why we need to do that and not that, and what would be the consequences and, you know, things like that. But one of the biggest things, again, that uh, everywhere I read about uh, radiation being applied to the lower part of the, of the spine, uh, it's pretty much, you know, no children after that. That, that was like... So we proved that wrong. It. We proved that wrong. Thank God. Thank God. I have... I have and a proof. Son. I have a proof. And by the way, his name is Rafael. Which it means? Which means God heals. Um, and angel of healing. Angel of healing, that's right. And uh, we came up with that name in the um, delivery room. Right, because Rafael means medicine in Hebrew and El is to God, right? El, right, right. Rafael is a doctor and El is like a... To God, healing. towards God. Yes. Healing, right. So let's hear from husband. What else can you think of that we didn't talk about? What were your impressions well, back then? From a scientific uh, point of view, uh, the reason I chose your facility because it targeted only uh, the cells that were uh, injured, they were, uh, had a uh, tumor, and did not touch anything else. In other words, you don't kill everything else on your way. You kill only what you need to kill, you need to cure. Well, I don't know if 
heal. That's the revolution of radio surgery, right? To hit the cancer. Right. That's the um, one of the reasons. And that's another. That's the reason. Well, thank God that we have the child because everything else on the way was not uh, destroyed. And uh, I would recommend anyone to see you personally as a doctor because uh, you have a special care to each patient. I remember I called you at 3 o'clock in the morning, morning <laughs> telling I was scared that she is pregnant. When other doctors would say, when we went to the <clears throat> other uh, hospital and they told us diagnosis that forget about children and everything, and we were spoke to you and, you know, you uh, gave us uh, the warmth, you know, an understanding between patient and a doctor, real understanding. And you picked up the phone three o'clock in the morning. I did not even expect that you're going to do it. I remember this like a clear day and I tell everyone <clears throat> who has a question about, you know, uh, these kind of uh, illnesses and you picked up the children and said, be happy, you know, you told me, just be happy that she's pregnant, you're going to have a child. And uh, then we came to you uh, in next, uh, what was it, morning, morning. Uh, day after that. Yep, the next so, morning we're right so, here. Um, so there I is, remember, there I is remember two that benefits, call well. two major benefits, actually three, one that she said, uh, you're a very humble person. Um, we don't only say that I'm the only one that he can do it. Another one is that you have a, a treatment targeted to the uh, bad cells and you, do, you don't destroy, destroy everything on its, on its way. And the most important that you have a real feeling and relationship with the patients. They call you three o'clock in the morning, some crazy uh, Russian Jew, at three in the morning, scared that his wife is pregnant, then you pick up the phone uh, while you have to get up in the morning and be at work. So these three things, uh, I'm very thankful. Um, and uh, I wish you same uh, relationship and um, blessing that you give to others because you give yes. all of yourself, you know, even if it's three o'clock in the morning, you pick up the phone, you say, you give uh, your patients uh, your cell phone number. You know, nobody, I don't know, I don't know, I don't have any doctor's cell phone numbers. You give out your cell phone numbers that you are devoted to your patients. That's um, like worth much more than any money and uh, any condition and it worth person choosing treating with you. Now, besides the point that scientifically you have a, a targeted approach to each patient. You know, you know what you are targeting and what you are, uh, what, what is your goal. Uh, God bless you. All right, you should live to be 120 in Amen. good health. You too. God Amen. bless you and thank you. So we're here today with John and Celeste. Celeste. And John has a very important story to tell about his health. So years ago, you had a hepatitis, right? Hepatitis C. And yes, you had hepatitis C, and you had treatment for that, right? I you did. Fear, fear I did. I, st I had treatment. It took about 12 weeks, finally, after many years, it, because it, was, it wasn't available. Uh, uh, it, it was very effective, and, but it, it caused cirrhosis. Okay, so you had hepatitis and cirrhosis. And then they were doing, your doctors were doing imaging of you, of your body, of your liver, right? That's correct. And you eventually found nodules in your liver. That's right. Three and of them. Three nodules in the liver. And also, they did blood tests, which are called alpha feta protein, right? Yes. And alpha feta protein is a cancer marker. So we often talk about cancer right. markers. Right. And cancer markers are helpful. I can tell you, yes. most, most patients who come to me, don't actually know the cancer marker for their cancer. Right. But in your case, it's so critical because yes. you had nodules and you had that cancer marker. Yes, it was 314 when I started. 314, so it's yes. really high. Yes. And you saw, your doctors told you you had a liver cancer. 
right? Yeah, I was sent to a big hospital in New Jersey for you that. You were sent to a super duper hospital. That's right. And you saw doctors there. Yes. And I think that you actually tried to get a liver transplant. We didn't try. That was the only option. They gave us no other options. They gave me nine to 18 months to live if I didn't get a liver transplant. Okay, so the doctors recommended a liver transplant. That's too. right. And they told you you had to have that transplant or you'd be finished. That's right. Yes. What do you think about that? That scared us very much. It scared us. So what do you do? We decided it wasn't. It didn't make sense what they wanted to do. There was, uh, there were other things. They told me a, a new liver would also be infected with the Hep C virus. So we thought that didn't make any sense, and we didn't want serious surgery and the risk of being on the operating table and the poor quality of life that we would experience having an, a, another liver, which would be sick to begin with. So it made no sense. And fortunately, my wife had been listening to your radio program. Well, before we get there. Okay. So they, offered, they told you you had to have a liver transplant. Yes. Yes. But they never offered it to you. Well, they, they were trying to qualify me for, and? and, well, they wanted me to stop the hepatitis C medicine because they, they essentially said that if my liver got too healthy, much better, I wouldn't qualify for a transplant. So I was in... A, so if you're too healthy, you look in at But you had a cancer that was going to kill you in a few months. That's right. So how does that make sense? What do you, I mean, you, it when you didn't. went to bed at night, put your head on your pillow, said, hey, they tell me I have to have a liver transplant. Yes. But if I get treatment for my hepatitis, I'll be too healthy, but I have a cancer, I'm going to die in a few months. <laughs> yeah. So how did that all make sense? It didn't. Did it, you ever tell the doctor, hey, it doesn't make sense what you're telling me? Yes, we did. And, and what did uh, he respond to you? Well, they, he didn't really, he wasn't happy that I continued with the hepatitis medicine and did get rid of the hepatitis and my liver showed some improvement but they insisted that I had to qualify so it, I, they didn't want it to get where I wouldn't okay. qualify. They really wanted me to have that transplant. But you never even really got close to a transplant. Right? No, we never really got on the list. You never got even on the list. And that's my experience. I see many people with liver cancers, both yes. cancers that start in the liver and also cancers that uh, travel in the liver. So there's two kinds of liver cancers. Primary uh -huh. liver cancer, that's uh -huh. what you had. Yes. A primary liver cancer. Yes. Probably as a result of the hepatitis or cirrhosis. Yes. There's other people who have cancer that starts in the breast or the lung or the colon that spreads to the liver. That's sure. Metastatic. But you had a primary liver cancer. That's right. And then eventually you had uh, infusional treatment for the liver, right? I did. I, it, it was a, uh, they gave me one chemo treatment called chemoembolization, which I did hesitantly. Why? Because of the fear of that I had 9 to 18 months to live. And we really weren't familiar with your... But be, wait, before we get there, so why, if they're offering you chemo, do they tell you how fantastic chemo could be? Yeah, they, they told me that um, I wouldn't experience any sickness, that it would be isolated to the tumor. And uh, sure enough, I was very sick after that one treatment How were for you sick? at least three weeks or so. What were you sick with? Um, severe nausea Fine. and fatigue and no appetite, vomiting, and. Uh, lost weight, too. And I lost a lot of weight. And the cancer never actually went away. You still had cancer. I your, still your, had it. Your alpha feta protein went down some, but you still very had those, little. But, but you still some. had those nodules. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. You yes. had those nodules. And they wanted to do further, uh, a little bit, but uh, again, I was hesitating, so I never really got any further with them because we found you. Did they ever tell you that chemotherapy never cures liver cancer? Did they ever tell you that? No, not at all. Did they ever tell you about treatment options? No options whatsoever. It was transplant or die. So the transplant guy said transplant or die in, in months. Yes. The chemo guy told you chemo. Did anyone ever say, hey, or you might want to see Dr. Lederman? Never. Did anyone ever say Never heard your name. Or Radio Surgery. Did anyone ever no. mention about any options? Zero options. So they're telling you you're going to die, right? Yes. And you believe them, what they told you? Yeah. Sure. 
So, scared. and you believe they went to medical school to give you all the best information they could? Of course. And you went to experts in the field, right? Oh, yeah. That's right. And you think that they would have known about radio surgery? I think they should have known. They you, probably did know. But okay. think I think they really were pushing for transplants. Okay, so you felt like you got inadequate information? Absolutely. Do you feel like you got skewed information? Certainly, yes. So um, how did you find out about radio surgery and our work? Well, my wife. For years, my mother listened to 710 AM. And then after moving, whatever, and I went back to the li listening to the station, and I started hearing about you. But then I also uh, knew a, a gentleman that was a patient of yours. And he used to come into the office, and he would just praise you and hand out your pamphlets. So I remembered that, heard, kept hearing about you. Mm -hmm. Then when we got the call about, oh, well, John, is, it's, it's sort of in remission. I mean, the chemo thing kind of worked, but we want to do another procedure. I said to John, let's go to Dr. Lieben. What do we have to lose? Non-invasive. Right. And we came to you. Yeah. We were so happy. You, you came here years okay. ago. About yes, five years, years ago, ago. Right. Right, about five years ago. Yes. With uh, multiple areas of cancer in the liver. Yes. And an uh, alpha feta protein, a cancer marker that was elevated. Yes, it right? was. Yes. And did you tell your other doctors? Because you had some doctors you were close to. You say, hey, I'm thinking about Dr. Lederman and radio surgery. Did you ever do that? Yeah, we did. And they were like, oh, well... You know, and you know how they blackball doctors. If it's so what do they tell you about Dr. Lederman radio surgery? Oh, it's all quackery and all that stuff. So they said it was all quackery. Did they say there's any chance of it working? They said it, it most likely would not work. And we were like, well, we're going we're gonna to do, do it anyway. So why did you trust me rather than them? Because basically it's a matter of trust at that point. Absolutely, right? yes. So why would you trust me and not them? The biggest reason was because of your patient that w we n ran into by chance right at that time, and and because you were successful with his treatments, and so many we others. we had to. It, it just we made didn't have sense. To. You didn't have to, right? We yeah, wanted we did. to. Uh, it our, made sense. So, did you ever feel at any time that anything I told you uh, wasn't true or straight or? Connived in any way? Not at all. You're very straightforward. Okay, so we talked the about answer. the treatment. We talked about all the options, right? And yes. You chose to have radio surgery here. Absolutely. And what does it feel like? What does it feel like to have radio surgery for a liver cancer? Well, it, uh, there were no side effects. There was no pain. There was no nausea. It was very easy um, and fast. You got it done fast. Uh, the day I came in no to you, you staged me, your team, and I. they set appointments for me for the next two weeks, and I did the treatments. On the next follow-up, uh, I was in remission. Okay, so you had the treatment, you didn't feel anything, no pain, I didn't no feel suffering, no at nausea, all. no vomiting, no, it's no hair loss, nothing. nothing like that. Nothing like the chemo nothing embolization. At all. That's right. Okay, nothing like a liver transplant would have been. That's right. If it ever happened. Oh, please, right. yeah. And now your alpha beta protein, I think most recently, is two. Yes. It's normal. It's normal, yes. Right, at, right after the follow up visit, you um, went down, down, down. It was way down into normal. It went down to normal. And you've had no surgery and no chemo or any other treatments since radio surgery, right? Not at all. No. Nope. Are there any limitations to your life or your lifestyle because of the radio surgery? Nothing at all. It was as if th there was never anything wrong. And when you go to bed every night, and you must think about dying in six months after the diagnosis sure. without transplant versus the radio surgery, which took place years right. ago, being in remission. What are your thoughts every night when you put your head on the pillow? Well, I thank God, and I thank my Lord Jesus for leading me to you, and I thank him for blessing you and all the good work that you do. And I just think I, I like to share my story with as many people as possible, even strangers. We're, we're always telling them about you. 
Are any thoughts for other people who have cancer who are seeking surgery or chemo or concoctions? Yeah. What would you tell them? Yeah, I, I would tell them to, if possible, come to you for the first opinion because they'll get effective treatment and they'll get it sooner. But even if they're being treated, but they're not happy with their treatment or not being successful, that they should come to you for another opinion and I recommend it. I have to be honest, that's my experience. So I know for a fact that it's true. All right, God bless you and thank you. God bless you God too, bless Doctor. You, Doctor. So I'm here with Johnny Braggs. And Johnny, tell us about yourself a little bit. Uh, well, my background is that um, I came from a family of uh, merchant seamen. Um, I started out with that in that career, but I uh, wind up being a New York City carpenter. And during my tenure as a carpenter, um, I worked down at Ground Zero around 2000. And um, five years later, was um, found out to have prostate cancer. Right, so you were found with prostate cancer. And just we should go back a little bit with your family because mm -hmm. you had, I believe, an uncle with prostate cancer yeah. and a stepfather with prostate cancer, right? Yes. My stepdad, he had, he was diagnosed in 68. Mm -hmm. I was like 14 at the time. Do you remember him? Yeah. Do you remember very, him very well? Vividly. He was, uh, he was very instrumental in my life during that, those, those years. And he was diagnosed in 1968, so a long time ago with prostate yeah. cancer. And, during, and what happened to him? During that time, um, I really don't know what stage the cancer was, but I do recollect that Three months after he had his prostate surgery, um, he had passed away. Was he in good health before the surgery? It seemingly. Um, to the best of your knowledge, he was active, man. Absolutely, he was and still working, um, and then it just it, it overcame him to the point that he was uh, unable to work uh, anymore until he addressed it. And once he had his operation, it seems as though his health had, had just declined over like a three month period. How old was he at that time? Uh, I believe he was in his mid 40s. So, man, mid 40s, he's probably in yeah. pretty good health. Yeah. Had prostate cancer, had surgery, and then within 12 weeks died. Yeah. Yeah. And that was it. I mean, did he suffer during those 12 weeks? Uh, not really. I mean, I was there, you know, helping him with his meals and, well, you know. Well, he's a 40 year old man. Most 40 year old men don't need help, so he must have. No, he was, like I said, his health had, had really deteriorated once the, the surgery had, um, he had completed his surgery. So once he had surgery, he was never the same? No, no. He never got back on his feet again? No. And then he died? Yeah. Yeah. And so that that was your stepdad. Yeah. And then yeah. your uncle also had prostate cancer. Yeah, that was. And so um, your uncle was blood relative. Yeah, yeah. And, and what he, happened to him? He um, around eighty seven, eighty six. He was diagnosed with with prostate cancer, and his surgery was a little bit more um, subdued. I mean, he was able to survive it, but his life or his quality of life. Um, it just wasn't the same. So he had surgery outside New York City. Yeah. And how old was he at the time of the surgery? I believe my uncle was in his early 50s. And what happened to him after the surgery? Um, his, the, his quality of life, what he expressed to me, wasn't the same in terms of his um, virulness with women. Um, so he lost sexual function. Yeah. Did he talk about his urinary life? Uh, not in great detail, but I mean, he was at a point that he did have to wear um, diapers. Uh, so uh, he had bad complications from the surgery. Yeah, yeah. And how long did he live after the surgery? Well, he's still alive. Thank he's God. He's still alive. Yeah, just his quality of life sort of diminished. Um, did his quality of life ever improve? Uh, no. No. So he's lived now 35 years with his sex life was kaput and urinary life kaput. Yeah. Does he ever yeah. talk about having that surgery and what it did to him? Um, well, he regretted the fact that it left him in such a state, but he, I, I look at over the years because I, I, I sort of refer back to when I visited you, Doc, and, and you told me I had had the cancer. It's almost like... Um, 
a black wall had hit and I couldn't see past it. You know what I mean? What do you mean by that? Um, it was like I, I, I looked at it as if it was a death sentence because. So it, when you were diagnosed with prostate cancer, you had yeah. a high PSA, mm -hmm. you had a biopsy, mm -hmm. and you saw a surgeon. The first person who did the biopsy was a surgeon, right? Yeah. And yeah. what did they tell you about the cancer? Uh, that it was um, in its early stages, and thank God, like I said, at the end of the by the end of the visit, I was able to see a little light because he told me that it was addressable, um, it was treatable, and he assured me that um, I could come through it with flying colors because it was such an early stage. And why did you come to me back then? Um, well, you were um, at that time the top of the line. I mean, I was, I was fortunate to even have you as a reference, but... Um, I've gone they, down since then. Right? Yeah, <laughs> nah, nah, not really. <laughs> no, um, they told me that you were the best that um, did it, and, and your technique of body radio surgery was, um, at that time, um, top of the line. And so you came for treatment, right? Mm -hmm. This is now about 16 years ago. 16 years. 16 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. And you thought at first when you were diagnosed with prostate cancer as a death sentence. Yeah. And now 16 years later, your PSA is? I believe it's like 0.033 0 or right. something Right, so like it's that. about as low as can be yeah. for the last 16 years. Yeah. And your quality of life is good. Absolutely. And you're doing the yeah. things you want. Yeah, not so much now because the age is starting to kick in, but it's nothing we can but do about But in general, yeah. your urinary control is good. Yeah. And yeah. you still see some women when the right woman comes by. Oh, yeah. Maybe, yeah. right? Maybe. <laughs> and the cancer is gone, right? The, as far as I'm concerned, zero it's 0.0 something this yeah. is 16 years later. Yeah. And how would you, uh, what do you feel about that, reflecting that you thought you were going to die and now 16 years later, here you are? Well, I, my, my first uh, thoughts were everything that, every day that I've had after my initial diagnosis has been a gift. And you still feel that way? Yeah, absolutely. You every think about day, it every day? Every day, man. It says, I mean, it's, it's not foremost in my mind, but you know, when I do have that time to reflect on it, yeah, because I think I'm, I'm still in contact with my uncle. I still think about my stepdad, you know, and there are other friends that um, I've had through the years that had the same problems that I have, and they didn't fare out so well. So, so you speak to other men with prostate cancer? Yeah. Yeah, and what do you tell them? Well, I, I, I or do you just listen. I basically start listening, and then they ask me about my experiences. I mean, I don't try to judge or um, try to motivate them to doing anything because, first of all, people in that state of mind, they want the results of of of. Um, a successful treatment and they want to know who the best people are to talk to which uh, I, I refer or, or I digress to you but you know my, my thing is when when I do encounter them it's it's basically I listen to them and when they ask me about what my experiences were I give them you know the benefit of you know what I went through but when you had the treatment was there any pain or suffering or anything like that in the beginning, it was a little discomfort. What kind of discomfort? Um, you know, just uh, urinary f um, functions. It, it felt like it was a strain, but you know, with the medications that I got, it was um, it helped. You were working throughout that whole period of time, right? Yeah, I was still, uh, doing still a carpenter. Physical work. Yeah. Very physical work. Absolutely. And you worked throughout your entire treatment, right? Yeah. Yeah, up until um, 2000. Thirteen. Until um, you hit the lottery, right? The fifty million dollars. <laughs> I wish. I wish no, but um, yeah. maybe good health is better than fifty million dollars. Absolutely, you can <laughs> trust me. It so is. you had a little dis you had a little urinary symptoms, mm -hmm. and you had medicines, and that took care of it. Yes. And now your urine is okay or not? No, it's great. Um, like I said, um, according to the medications that I'm, I'm prescribed, I mean, I take them regularly. I mean, I have no. Um, abnormal functions. Uh, uh, it's almost so as if... So you're living your life? Yeah, absolutely. Any regrets? Uh, that they couldn't find it sooner, but I'm glad they found it eventually and, and it wasn't too late to be treatable or, you know, to, to bounce back the way I have. Did you ever feel we did anything that wasn't in your interest? 
No, 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 it was never that. As a matter of fact, um, in the beginning, I remember after the surgery, um, I had the radiation treatments, and I think I was coming like... The surgery was putting radiation seeds in the prostate, right? Right, right. and um, after the, um, the initial surgery, I didn't really understand what the process was going to be, and I think I was coming to, to your office like once a week, and I was supposed to be coming like three times a week. Well, we just day. like to see you. Yeah. <laughs> now, one more thing. And that is, you actually have been on the radio talking about prostate cancer. A lot of people hear your voice, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And a lot of people see you on the street and say, hey, yeah, you're Johnny Braggs, <laughs> yeah. right? If they hear me, yeah. Well, that they do, Yeah. right? There's people who see you on the street and know who you are. Yeah, there's a couple of them. Uh, uh, I've, matter of fact, um, I've had uh, a couple of people call me up after listening to... Uh, the, uh, at the ad on, on radio and asked if I was the Johnny Bryce they were talking about. And uh, to my embarrassment, because I, like I said, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, like a in the shade kind of guy. Um, but that, that sort of put me out there in front. And folks, they actually think that, like, this is the field in which I work. But no, unfortunately. Are you embarrassed that you went from a patient, you still are my patient, right? Absolutely. To someone who speaks and tries to help other people learn about treatment options? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, listen, my thing is from what cancer, prostate cancer used to be to what it is now, one of the most curable cancers that, you know, they have. Um, if, if I can contribute something to someone's safety, security, and, and, and peace of mind about... And life, and their yeah, life and health. Yeah, about going through this process, then yeah, I'm all for it, man. One in six black men get prostate cancer. One in 23 die of prostate cancer. So it's an epidemic in the community. Yes, it is. And we try to bring out information to get people to come in here and get tested so they can be found early and have the highest cure rates. Well, I hope that, you know, this reaches some of those people that are unsure about what to do and um, how their health is, is faring. Um, first thing is to acknowledge that, you know, there's a problem. Seek it out, find out what it is, and get the proper help for it. Um, you know, to die of embarrassment at, at, at a curable stage such as cancer is right now, especially the prostate cancer, it, it seems like a waste. It's pretty it's, sad, right? Yeah, it really is. I mean, uh, this, that seems to be the more one of the most curable cancers um, that I've heard of, anyway. Any other thoughts? Other than the fact that, uh, like I said, I, I just thank you, man, for like every day after that, that, um, that radiation treatment. I mean, because like I said, who knows what, what would have happened had I not caught it in time. And I always reflect back to my stepdad or even my uncle, because both of those scenarios were total nightmares. But, you know, like I said, one, one didn't survive, the other one is surviving. Um, but impaired. Yeah, basically. And that would have scared the bejesus out of me. But, uh, All right. Well, thank you so much. God bless you. I thank you, man. I really appreciate you. <laughs> okay, so I'm here with... Marcia Good. And it came that you got really sick, right? Yes. You lost a lot of weight. Yes. How much weight did you lose? Uh, a, a lot. Because I had went down all the way to... I used to be at 200 and something. I went down to 100 and... 30-something. So you lost, you went from like 220 to 130. So you lost like 80, 90 pounds. Yes. A lot yes, of weight. A lot of Did weight. Did you know why you were losing so much weight? No, I didn't know. So it just happened to you? Yes. And then you started vomiting up blood, right? Yes, yes. I, I fell in my room and then I started vomiting So you blood. like lost consciousness and nearly no. passed out? Or yes, I... You I, nearly passed out? I nearly, passed pa out. I nearly passed out. And you're kind of like medical family. You have a son who's a nurse at one of the yes. biggest hospitals, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. And you went to that hospital, right? I did. And they checked you out and yes. they did a CAT scan. I, yes. And they did an endoscopy, yes, right? Yes, So they checked you out and mm -hmm. they found that you were very anemic. Your mm -hmm. hemoglobin went down. Normal yes. hemoglobin's like 15 or 16. Yours yes. is like 4.9. 4, yes. So you lost two-thirds of your blood. Yes. You were... Passing out, you lost 90 pounds. Yes. You were sick, right? Very sick. You could have died. I could have. 
thank God. And I your son was in the, a nurse in the hospital. He went to yeah. one of the biggest hospitals in New York. Yes. And they wanted to cut on you, right? Mm -hmm. And what did you think about that? I went, my son and I, they told us, and then I said we was going to go home and think about it. Then I... But I have a question. So here you are nearly dying, right? You lost 80, 90 pounds, passing out, lost most of your blood. And they were trying to do what they think is best. They were trying to do radical surgery on you, yes, right? Yeah. Why didn't you say, hey, why didn't I just do anything? I'll do anything you think. What Most people say that. Most people don't even think about options. Yeah. They do the first thing that someone offers. Well, I'm I'm glad my son was there with me. He's a nurse and he knew a lot of stuff. So he said, no, we was going to go home and think about it. Why did he do that? Why did you and he not take the surgery, go home? Why? I, because um, what the doctor was saying that I, I could, I don't remember the word he used. What was the thought, though? What was his thought? Or what, what did you understand from it? That uh, maybe if I had a surgery, I could die. That you could die from the surgery? Yes. Yeah. Because you could have died anyway because yeah. his cancer was pretty bad. Yes, yes. And did you know about our work before you went to the other hospital? Had you ever heard about our special work for cancer? No, all I heard, all I used to hear on the um, radio about Dr. Lederman. Okay. So, I, so what, I, what was your thoughts when you heard about Dr. Lederman before you had the cancer? What did you think before you had the cancer? Did you think anything about it or you didn't think very much about it? Back I, di I didn't really think much about it. And so you went home with this terrible diagnosis, knowing you could die. And you must have relied on your son a lot because he's yes. in the health care. Yes. And what did the two of you decide? That uh, I, I called a church brother of mine and they, they told me... He said, go see Dr. Lederman, and I say, okay. So I called my son, and I said, I'm, I'm going to go for a second opinion. And I, and I said, my church brother told me about um, um, Dr. Lederman. He's in Manhattan. So I, I said, I'm going to go get a second opinion. So he said, yes, do that. So I, I um, Google Dr. Lederman, and then I, um, I called and I spoke to a young lady at the front desk, and he said I should get my medical history, and he gave me a date to come in. And you came and here? I did. And we talked about all the options. Yes, we did. <clears throat> and we talked about surgery and yes. chemo, yes. and yes. also no surgery, or yes. radio surgery, right? Yes, yes. And did you feel like we treated you fairly? Very fairly. At the other hospital, did they offer you treatment that was not surgery? Did they offer you anything besides radical surgery? Well, um, they had told me something about uh, a medication. Okay, did they ever tell you you could have the medication and no surgery? No, they said take the medication and it will shrink the tumor and then surgery. So everything was about surgery there? All about surgery. Did they ever talk to you about no surgery treatment? No. Okay, so then you came here and you learned about other treatments, including no surgery whatsoever, right? Yes, I did. And we also spoke about surgery and chemo and all the other options, yes, right? Yes. And why did you go with us? Why did you go with radio surgery and not with surgery? Because um, when the way you explain it and break it down to me, I said I prefer um, the radio surgery. Okay, and why? Be because you said um, no side effect, no pain, no nausea. And you had the treatment here, right? Yes. You chose our treatment here. Yes. And you've done very well, right? I the did. cancer went huge, and now it's in remission, right? Yes, yes. And with us, we gave you no blood transfusions, no, right? No. And you're in remission now. And how I are you am. feeling now? I'm feeling much better. And your blood count's coming up, right? Yes, yes. And are you getting weight back? I am. And when you had a treatment here, what exactly did you feel during the treatment? Like pain or anything? I didn't feel no pain. No pain. No. Did you have uh, no, any discomfort? No, no discomfort, no nausea. How was the treatment? How long did it last? Um, I don't remember. Was it like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, two hours, two days? Two, think, each like, treatment? Each treatment is like, what, 10 minutes? About 10, 20 minutes. Yes, yes. And we made a mold around your body, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And we computerized your body. Yes. And we sent thousands of beams in to hit that cancer. Yes. And did you have any side effects during that no, time? No, no side effects. And you finished the treatment. You now you've had follow-up scans, yes, right? Yes, yes. And the cancer has shrunk way down. Yes, all the way to five centimeters. Right, so it's already in remission, doing yes, well, and yes. most likely will keep on shrinking for the rest of your life. Yes. 
And your goal, you don't really want surgery, is that right? No, I don't want surgery. So you're satisfied you're in remission, doing yes. well, and most likely the cancer will keep on shrinking. Yes. What advice do you have for other people who may have cancer and they don't know what to do, or the surgeon says, hey, you got to have surgery? What's your advice to them? Always, um, always get second opinion. And did anyone else tell you about radio surgery? Any other doctors or no. in the hospital? You saw, no. Did you see chemo doctors also there? Yes. So you saw chemo doctors and you saw surgeons at this big hospital. Yes. And no one talked about any other options. No, no. Okay. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I, maybe money making. Yeah. Yes. But isn't a doctor's job to talk about all the options? Yes, I, they are supposed to. Do you think that did we ever do anything with you that was against your interests? No, sir. Okay. And, the, and any other comments you can tell other people that may have a cancer that are listening what they should do? Yes, if, you, like if, if they have cancer, um, always get a second opinion. Um, even I, was, I have um, a friend of mine, her mom of cancer, um, and she's been taking chemotherapy, but I, I refer her to you. I'm not sure if she come yet, but I refer her to you. So, and she have the same cancer like me. So I told her, go see Dr. Liederman and you will get good results. All right, well, thank you very much. Yes. God bless you and yes. hope you live to be 120. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Thank All right, you, God sir. bless you, thank you. Okay. So I'm here with... Marjorie Kahn. And? Stanley Urlo. And we have lots to talk about. So we're going to talk about Marjorie first, if that's okay. Ladies before gentlemen. Okay. And that's actually how we met. We met you first, right? That's right. And you came to us. Do you remember when you first came to us with a... Yes. I had a rectal cancer. I had been to a couple surgeons, and they drew out this chart of how they were going to chop me up. And, okay, so the rectal cancer, which is a very common cancer, is that right? It's a very common cancer, and it was very close to the anus, right? right? It was right. like a centimeter and a half from the anus, and the size of the tumor was like a centimeter and a half, two centimeters. So it was a juicy-sized tumor close to the anus, and what exactly did the surgeon plan to do? He planned to, I would have to have a colostomy, you know, a bag. For the rest of your life? Um, possibly. They, 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 Trick you. They say, well, just leave for a little while till it heals. And right, then, but it was so close to the it. anus. Yeah. When, it's, when a cancer is so close to the anus, usually people end up losing their anus. And the anus is like the door. So if you lose the door... You're screwed. Yeah. So you saw the surgeon, and he wanted to do this surgery and a colostomy on you. And I just couldn't go there. And this was at a super-duper famous hospital, right? Yeah, I was recommended, you know, to, this, is, this is a super-duper guy, and he's well-renowned, blah, 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 so blah, blah. So a famous guy at a famous hospital, and he wanted to do colostomy. Mm-hmm. And, and we, so... Um, did you see I another famous guy at another famous hospital? I, I saw one other person, and she... So I saw a second surgeon... And what did the second surgeon say? Same thing, want to cut me up. So they both wanted to do colostomies on you, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And then, so you must have said to yourself, hey, two famous doctors at two big hospitals want to do colostomies. I better get my colostomy. Did you say that? Hell no. Why not? <laughs> because I remember a few years ago, I had to have a uh, core biopsy in the breast, and I was really nervous about it. And I remember... As I was going over to get the procedure done, Dr. Lederman was on the radio. And I thought that was like a, a voice from God. And I thought, wait a minute, this is the man I have to see. And that, that was it. I knew that I was gonna be okay, okay so once even, I got here. So you got here and we met, right? Right. And what was your impression? Oh, well, I, I knew that I was okay then. I felt safe. I felt that I was in good hands. I knew that um, I was going to be okay. That why, was, why do you feel that way? Well, um, from your credentials and your success and everything that I, I read about and saw and, and uh, knowing that it was going to be a different kind of treatment from any other kind of radiation. I knew that it was going to be pinpointed to the cancer. Um, and the whole atmosphere here was 
It was just welcoming and uh, reassuring. Reassuring. What about it was so welcoming and reassuring? Well, the team. I mean, there was like, you guys knew what you were doing. I just had a gut feeling you knew what you were doing and did, you didn't do any at all. There you go. That's the word. So you didn't miss the big hospital with 10,000 doctors walking around in the lobby with their white coats and stethoscopes. No, no, and, no, no. And 50,000 levels of elevators and all that stuff. No, no. You didn't miss that at all? Not at all. So you like that? You have a private boutique that fights for the patient. Yes, and my feeling is that I hope the word gets out to other people who have experienced serious cancers and would like to be really healed, not, so, not temporarily, you know. So you were treated here years ago, right? And we put together a program, and during the treatment, you were treated with our treatment. So what did you feel during the treatment? Fine. I didn't feel, I didn't have any uh, side effects at all. No, no side effects at all? None whatsoever. And so you went through the program and we made the mold of the body, we computerized your body and sent in invisible beams to attack the cancer, right? Right. And you were not in the hospital and came in, got a treatment and left and did what you want. Um, Is that right? You had me see Dr. Grace right. for chemo. Right. And. After all said and done, the chemo didn't really go well with me. I, I, my body just didn't do well you with chemo. You didn't like that? No. And Dr. Grace said, you know, Dr. Liedemann really got, got the cancer, but he probably didn't. I mean, he didn't say it, but I knew it was true. I really didn't need the chemo because the radiation that, uh, that I was received here got the cancer. So you ended up having our treatment in the star tactic frame, outpatient treatment, no surgery, no cutting, no bleeding, no colostomy, right? No. And you've had no treatment since that treatment ended, right? Right. And you've had multiple, you've had biopsies and colonoscopies and scans and cut scans. Well, I mean... The gastroenterologist, right? You went to the gastroenterologist. To have the sigmoidoscopy done, which is a procedure where they can look in and outside the wall and inside the wall of the, the colon and the rectum. And he was going to do a biopsy to see if there had been any regrowth. Well, um, when I woke up, he said there was nothing to biopsy. It was completely normal tissue. So ever since the treatment here, you got no chemo, no surgery, no cutting, no bleeding. I did have chemo. Remember, you sent me to doctor. Well, you since you left here. No, since that, no. So since you left here, You've had no chemo, no cutting, no bleeding, no colostomy, mm -mm. right? No. They've, they've had observation and tests done. Exactly. And all those observations and tests have shown? Healthy tissue. No. No recurrence. No cancer. No cancer. So you've been in remission ever since with no sign of cancer, right? Right. And what thank do you think God. about that? I thank God every day that I found you. And all right. And... What would be your message for someone else who has a cancer and they go to two big hospitals and see two big doctors and they're told, hey, you got to have a colostomy, you got to have that cut out? You got to see Dr. Lederman, and no matter what the mainstream medicine systems, the super duper people say, got to see Dr. Lederman because he is a one man band who gets it done. Okay, and then just the proof of the pudding, then as the years went on, you developed a cancer in the breast. Right. Right, you had an invasive cancer, a real cancer in the breast. Correct. Right, and what happened then? I had, um, doc I had a surgeon remove the cancer because it was just a, it was, what do you call, it, when it's contained. There's a lump, you had a lumpectomy. I had right? a lumpectomy, exactly. So you had a lumpectomy in, for in this cancer in the breast. And then um, I had treatment. And treatment here, here for the radiation to try to prevent the cancer from coming back because we know that surgery is not enough for breast cancer. Lumpectomy is not enough. There's right. a high risk of the cancer coming back. So you came here, we printed your front and your bottom. And what was it like to have the breast radiation here? Easy, no problem. Any side effects or anything bad happened to you here? No, it's it's uh, uh, perfectly looks perfectly normal. So you've had two serious cancers, right? Both the rectum and the breast are invasive cancers, and they're both now in remission, and you're doing great. I feel great. Right. And I'm, I just thank God every day. All right. Any words of advice to anyone that has a cancer? Well, 
do not go under the knife without seeing Dr. Lederman first. Get his opinion. Do not, don't just jump under the table, jump on the table and get that surgery because you don't have to. Did you ever feel like at any time we did anything that was against your interests? Never, never. Always um, had me at the, my best interest right away, right always, always. All right, well, thank you, and God bless you, and you should live to be 120. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so I'm here with... Matthew, Matthew Mogada. And Matthew, you have a father, you had a father who had bladder cancer, right? Yes, he had a bladder, bladder cancer, and it was very bad. It was an invasive cancer, right? Yes. And he also had other disease, he had terrible heart disease. Yes, right. he had a heart failure for many, many years. And he, uh, what kind of symptoms did he have to get the bladder cancer? Do you remember the first symptoms? The first symptom, it was something he actually, uh, in his urine stream, he found some, uh, like as a tissue, and it was blood. So he had blood in the urine, which is yes. very common for bladder cancer. And he got investigated, right? Yes, we went to one of my friends, uh, who's a urologist. The first step was there. They did a actually cystoscopy right there. Uh, as we got there same day, they did a cystoscopy and he came out and he said, there is, it's very, look very ugly. We should do more studies to figure out what's going on. So eventually he was found to have an invasive bladder cancer, right? Yes, it was invasive bladder cancer. It was invasive. Cancer. And the bladder, is, the bladder is the organ that holds the urine and there's a lining of it, transitional cells which hold the urine. And then there's a muscle that squeezes the urine out. So in his case, it started in the lining and it went into the muscle. It was an invasive cancer, yes, right? Yes, it was. His muscle was involved. And he was seen at other hospitals, some of the biggest hospitals in New York, right? Yes, and we went. What was the advice that he was given? What was he told? Uh, they said that one of the, actually the famous guy, he told me it's better to just leave him alone. He's not going to have even four months left for six months, that's the most he's going to get. And leave him alone, don't do any extra studies or any extra treatment because there is no chance. This is very, it's a ring cell. He said it's a ring cell and ring cell, there is no uh, hope with ring cell carcinoma of uh, bladder. And your father, what was his age when he was diagnosed? He was 80, 78 years. And he had terrible heart disease, right? He had a pacemaker in, he had devices he had for his heart. Yes, he had only 20% ejection fraction. Right, so normally when we when our heart pumps, it pumps 60, 70%, and his was only 20%. So he had a very compromised heart. And I guess that's the reason the doctor told him no treatment, just go home and that's it, right? The, the, not, not for that, He's, he was actually concerned about uh, ring cell carcinoma. He said ring cell, there is no, for sure, there is no treatment for it. And did he go to other doctors? We went actually to two doctors. Uh, my uh, friend who was a urologist, he sent us to two different actually group in famous hospitals. Uh, it was the same, actually, we, we were told the same, almost the same. And same over there, I, we, we, we were discussing this with, uh, I started actually talking to my dad. So I told him, let's go see Dr. Lederman. And uh, he was actually, completely uh, uh, gave up as the other people are saying, but we came to you, you had a conversation with him and uh, that was a startup. As we left, you gave him your uh, opinion and he said, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna give you the shot. Let's see what, I don't have any other choice. Let's see. And he went, so elsewhere, they kind of sent him home to die, right? Absolutely. And here he was treated with the intent to try to cure him. Yes. Right? And we put together a program to try to cure him. And what was the treatment like for him? What did he feel during the course of treatment? Did he have pain, suffering, and other things? Or No, it wasn't that bad. Uh, he was even happy because he was taking the... Uh, coming to CT, having actually uh, walked to your office, and get it actually half an hour here, then come, we'll go back home. It wasn't actually hard, it was 
uh, doable for him at his age and his heart uh, situation that he had, all was actually doable for him. And you and your siblings brought him here, got treatment, went home, right? He finished up the treatment. Yes. He did great. Uh, he finished up the treatment after a couple of months. We did another cystoscopy and another actually biopsy they did and they find that he's cancer free. So after the treatment, the urologist, another urologist looked inside him and biopsied him and they found no evidence of cancer. Is that no your evidence. understanding? Yes, yes. And so our treatment was able to sterilize or eradicate that cancer. Absolutely. Right. And how did he and you feel about that after being told this was a terrible cancer, you should go home and die? That was totally like as day and night. The uh, others, they told us he's, he has no other choice or no hope, but he, got, he became cancer free. He, it was amazing. It was amazing for him. He was so happy about it as well. He died due to heart attack. Uh, after this, uh, after a couple of months. That was totally unrelated to the cancer treatment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dad had a pacemaker. Pacemaker before even cancer got infected. And they were forced to remove pacemaker, defibrillator. And he was wearing external defibrillator for a while, but he became like as a, a tired of every day wearing this external defibrillator. And one day he didn't have it he had a heart attack due to actually a heart uh, issue he had for many years. Well, I know how much you loved him and cared for him and took care of him and you and your siblings and beautiful family. So I always remember what you did for your father and that we were able to provide treatment and get rid of the cancer, which doctors at the biggest hospital said was not gonna be possible to do, right? No, even not at all, not at all. What other uh, advice would you give to patients who are going to big hospitals and thinking they're seeing and getting the best possible advice in the world? What do you tell them? Uh, you know, I was, I remember dad was saying, he, he was always saying, I believe in magic. I believe in actually, there are people out there who know uh, the information in these days. He was 80 years old, but he was really, really, uh, open-minded he always he was saying don't give up even in your life always there is a solution always there is a way you have to f figure out where to go to the right path to find the right path and that's what I, I was uh, always I tell other people too what it happened it was a totally a magic it something's incredible happened to that uh, from that point, lose and just go home, die, converting to becoming co completely cancer free. That was, and this uh, as, uh, this wasn't my first actually, and uh, my first patient to bring, uh, to brought it to you, Dr. Lidman. As you know, I sent many people uh, to you because I believe in what you have done for other people many years ago. There was another patient, as if you remember, one of my friend who had a tongue cancer, and he was told there is no treatment, there is nothing I can do for him, and uh, it's been like a seven years pass, and he was told he doesn't have the, even if they take half of his face out, uh, it, there is no chance for him to survive, but he's intact, no touch to the face, no nothing. He's still alive. He's living. Uh, the way he wants. He's, uh, he's back to smoking. I know for the last two years he's smoking again, but he's alive and he know there is no cancer. And I appreciate it, really. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks to you, sir. Thank thanks, you what you are, thanks what you do here is amazing. I see people coming here and getting something really magic. It's uh, they uh, give up on everything, but now there is a light, there is a hope you're giving them, and what you do here, I really, I believe is a magic. Thank you so much, God bless thanks you. Thanks to you, really thanks to you, I appreciate it. Okay, so I'm here with Michael Henn, and you're here today to talk about what's happened to you over the last year, year plus, right? That's correct. So a year ago, you went to your doctor with a big lump in your neck, right? I did. And it started about a year ago, correct? That is correct. And you saw your primary doctor or dermatologist? 
dermatologist first. Okay, so a dermatologist, and what did dermatologists tell you? The, the, they told me to go see uh, a surgeon. Okay. That it was uh, getting, it was very large. And what large mean, there was a big mass on your cheek over here, right? Oh, correct. It was like the size of a plum, something like that. A golf ball. Okay, so it's pretty big size. How big was it a year ago? Well, it started out as nothing. Uh huh. And then, you know, and then it just got very large, very fast. Okay, so within a few months, it grew to the size of a plum or a golf ball. That's correct. And you were walking around doing work. You work every day, right? Every day. And what were people saying when they saw this big lump on your face? Just asking what what it was and what happened, and they thought I got hit. But and what did you tell people that when you're walking around this big lump? I just told them, I don't know what it is. Uh, I have to go see a surgeon, which I did. And what kind of surgeon was it? He was a uh, head surgeon of the hospital that I went to. Was he a throat surgeon, head uh, and neck surgeon? Head and neck. So you saw a head and neck surgeon. He was a big chief. Yes, he was. And what did the big chief tell you? He told me that I had to uh, get it surgically removed, um, that it was cancer and it was gonna require three days in the hospital, and also it was gonna require approximately two weeks of recovery. And so he was a famous surgeon at a big hospital, right? Yes, he was. So did you trust him? Um, not really. Why? I, I asked him were there any options. What did he tell you? And he said there are no options. It so he told, to you, he told you you had to have surgery? Correct. There's no choices. No choices. Now he's a big. He's a chief at a big hospital, right? That's right. So why didn't you just do what he told you? Well, I don't have the time to uh, to spend in the hospital and recovery, so I thought there was other options. So and you work every day. You work a lot every, every day. Every day. Right? I work twelve hours a day. Every day. Every day. And you're there with your son, and even then, you're working a heck of a lot, right? Correct. If let's just say if you were doing, if you had nothing to do, would you have done the surgery? No. Did he tell you about the potential complications of surgery in this area? He told me I would, uh, I would lose the feeling on the left side of my face because uh, he was going to cut the nerves out. And he also was going to take out the lymph nodes in my neck. And he said after that's all done and uh, that they were going to perform uh, plastic surgery to cover the scars. Did he tell you that you might lose the facial nerve and the whole nerve and face may collapse on that side? Yes, he said um, I was I was going to droop on the left side of my face, my eye, my cheek, and my mouth was going to droop on the left side. So if you're going to droop, it means that if you have a cup of coffee, you can't close your mouth and the coffee goes in and goes out, right? That's right. And if you try to close your eye, it means you can't close your eye, right? That's right. And if you can't close your eye, your eyeball will be destroyed and you'll go blind, right? Uh, that's correct. Did he talk to you about how he's going to correct the eye and the face? No. He said uh, there's nothing that he could do after that point. Just, you know, I, I would be drooping and I'd have to live with that. And did he tell you how it would be socially for you to run your business and to go meet people and go to church when you had a face that had collapsed? Um, no, he didn't mention that. He, he didn't say anything about that. Did you think about that? I did. What did you think about that? I didn't want to be. Uh, I didn't want to be looking like that. You know, just. Terrible. So he gave you no options. He was going to take away the sur to do surgery on this radical surgery, leave you deformed, right? And he gave no options. He didn't tell you, hey, you can do this or do that or do the next thing. He didn't give you any options. There were no options. He said. Do you think that he didn't know any options, or he just wanted to do surgery on you? I think that's his job, to do surgery. But isn't a doctor's job to provide the best possible information for each patient? I, I believe so, yes. Do you think a doctor's job, a, a head and neck surgeon, should know about other options? Yes, I do. Do you think if it was his face and his mass that he would have had that surgery? Uh, no, I do not. Do you think his wife, if it was his wife's face, would he have done that to his wife? I don't believe so. So why was he doing it to you? I have no idea. He just said he was going to treat me the best he could. Like Do you believe that? I was family. Do you believe that? And I didn't believe that, no. So you walked away from him? I did. And the tumor kept on growing? Yes, it did. And from the time he told you you had to, you had to have surgery to the time you came here, did you do anything else? 
Um, no, I just continued to work. And the tumor kept on growing and you kept on working 12 hours a day? That's correct. Right, working your bottom off. And what were you thinking? I mean, the tumor was growing and you were working and something was going to explode at some point, right? That's correct. He said uh, the doctor had told me it was, you know, very dangerous that it could explode. It was so large. And how could you go to work every day and function knowing that you had an untreated <laughs> cancer? That was, that was a little tough. So how did you find out about our work? Well, I was sitting in the car at 4.30 in the morning, as I always do, listening to the radio, and I heard about Dr. Lederman. You were at 4.30 in the morning because you're going to work at 4.30 in the Correct. morning? Correct. So that's when you start your day? Correct. And what did Dr. Lederman say on the radio? Dr. Lederman said uh, to uh, see him about cancer treatments, that uh, there were many options, and I said, this, this sounds great. You know, I said, let, let me let me try it. You know, I was very happy. So when we weren't happy then, you were curious probably. Curious. Right, so how can you leave the big chief at a big hospital who you met in person for a little voice on the radio? Why would you do that at 4.30 in the morning? Because on the commercial, he said uh, we do surgery with no cutting, no bleeding, and no recovery time. Or right. side effects, so I figured, wow, this sounds great. Let's give it a try. Well, it wasn't really surgery; it was radio surgery, right? Correct, it radio, was surgery. radio surgery. So you came here, and you met. You actually met Dr. Ariel Lederman, my son, first, and then I met you, and we talked about all the options, what this means, and what were your thoughts when you met? Well, I said, if this is true, and it's, uh, it looked great, it sounded great to me, you know. Would I be a candidate? And Dr. Lederman said, we would like to do this. Like well, did we say we'd like to do it, or we say we're offering you the possibility to do it? The possibility to do it. Okay, and why did you trust the little voice on the radio? Why would you do that? I had a good feeling. I said, how could I go wrong? Okay, so try. what if it didn't work? Then I <laughs> have to look for another option. Okay, so you had a good feeling. Did you have any doubts when you met Dr. Ariel or myself, did you have any doubts about us not telling you the truth or us working for other motivations? Did you have any doubt about that? No doubt whatsoever. So you went through the process, right? You had radio surgery for this big mass, right, here, and it was amazing, right? Unbelievable. And why was it amazing to you? And then I'll tell you why it was amazing to us. Well, it was amazing because it did go away in the amount of time that uh, Dr. Lederman said. Even less, right? Less every, time. Every day you came, this mass was going away very quickly, right? It got smaller and smaller. And eventually... Nothing. It's gone. Is there anything there that you can feel or see? Absolutely nothing. Were, what were the side effects of the treatment? No side effects whatsoever. No cutting? I lost, lost no, my beard a little bit. Well, you needed that. I needed that. <laughs> Any cutting or bleeding here? No cutting, no bleeding. Any chemo? No chemo, no no other treatment whatsoever. Okay, so you had only our series of treatments, pinpoint for this mass, and you've been followed now, and you in remission, right? Correct. There's no evidence of cancer, and you said no side effects. No side effects, everything is fine. Okay, well, so what are your thoughts? You must go to sleep every night uh, wondering how you got out of this pickle, right? I have no idea. It was just an instinct. I heard him on the radio, and here I am. Okay, and uh, you finished the treatment quite a while ago. I right? did. And you're coming here today on your own to talk about your case so that other people can learn that what happened is true, right? It is It is true. It's It's amazing. It, everything he said is just, just as true as could be. Anything that we told you that wasn't true or that was skewed or anything like that, anything that we twisted facts that you were aware of or not? Not at all. Any way we cheated you or harmed you or had other motivations? Not at all. Everything, everything was done professionally. The help was great. You know, everything was a, just a, a great experience, really. What's your thoughts about being treated in a private cancer treatment boutique, which is what we do, versus being in a big hospital with the big chief? What's oh. the difference to you? Oh, this is just, it's personal, you know, it's one-on-one, -on -one. It's, it's just a great experience, it really is. 
you know almost all the staff here, right? Everyone's I know everybody here. Um, they're all very professional, very polite. The whole whole operation is perfect. All right. Any other words for people who are watching this that may have a cancer and wonder whether they should trust coming here? Anybody that would would come here would it would be a, 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 an experience like you couldn't believe. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. God bless you, and I hope you live to be 120. Thank you, Doctor. I mean that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Dr. Lederman. I'm here with... Nick Scoffel. And Nick, tell us a little about you in a brief nutshell. Well, I have a lung cancer, and I had an operational lobectomy of the left lower lobe. And uh, shortly after that, it spread to the iota. Aorta. Iota, yeah. Just before you say that, tell us just in a few words or minutes, tell us about you, who you are, where you're from, what do you do, that you're a real patient. Well, I'm retired. I'm from Queens, New York. And uh, I, pl I play chess for uh, recreation. And if I had the treatment here, I go out and play chess. Okay, so you're a thoughtful man, right? And about seven, eight years ago, you were starting coughing up blood, right? Yes, yes. That's what was your, that, that was, was your warning sign. sign. Yes. You're coughing up blood. So we often talk about warning signs. So yeah. Had you ever coughed up blood before that? No. So you coughed up blood, and then what did you do about that? Well, my regular doctor, medical doctor, he sent me for an x-ray. And then what happened? The x-ray come back and it showed a mask in the lung. And then what happened? Then he recommended a surgeon. Okay, so he sent you right to, So he sent you right to a thoracic surgeon, right? Yes. And at one of the big super duper hospitals. Yes. And the, the and surgeon saw you. Yeah, right? and Did, he wanted to operate. Did the surgeon talk to you about any other options besides surgery at that time? No options. Did he it's talk to you about chemo or radio surgery or Dr. Lederman or did he talk about any no cutting options? No, not at all. So he said you had to have surgery? Yes. There was no option? No option. And you had the surgery, right? Yes. At one of the biggest hospitals in New York? Yes. Right? And do you remember how you felt during the surgery and after the surgery? Well, during the surgery I was out. Well, but then you woke up. Then I woke up. There was a lot of pain. And you probably had a chest tube in? Yes. They drained it and I was in a lot of pain for a long time. And you were probably in an ICU for a while? Yes. And you were in the hospital for probably a week or so, is that right? About seven days. Seven days. And you talked about the pain. How long did the pain last after the surgery? Oh, geez. Two years. Two years? Two years. And when the surgeon told you after the surgery, did he tell you he got out all the cancer, part of the cancer, none of the cancer? What did he tell you exactly? He told me he got all the cancer out. He told you you were home free, everything he was gone? You you don't need no chemotherapy. I got all the cancer out. Did you feel happy about that? Yes, I did. Did you believe him? Well, I did at the time. Okay, so, but you were still having pain. Yes. And did you have any change in your breathing after that surgery? Yes, yes, yes. Did your breathing get worse? Yes, it got worse. Sure. Did the surgeon tell you that when they cut out part of your lung, that he's cutting out part of your machinery to make oxygen in your system, to get oxygen in your system, right? Yeah, he didn't go into details. He, he just never said told you need, need surgery. He never told you your breathing would be less good? No. Did he ever tell you there was a possibility that surgery would fail? No. Okay, so you went in there thinking everything was going to be a-okay. Yes. And what was the biggest surprise after the surgery? The biggest surprise was I was in a lot of pain and I had trouble breathing. Okay, so that was many years ago. That was seven, eight years ago, right? Yes. And then a few months or about a year later... Not even a year later. Not even a year later. What happened? It metastasized to the... Aorta. 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 Aorta, aorta yes. is the main blood vessel from the heart to the whole body. Right? It's on top of the heart, right? Right. It's next to the heart. There's one... All the blood goes out the heart into the aorta. And why did he find the cancer at the aorta? What, what led him to find the cancer at the aorta? He sent me for a, a CAT scan. A routine CAT scan? Or yes. was, he, was he suspicious the cancer had come back? 
Well, it was, he was monitoring my, uh, my cancer. Okay, but he told you got it all out. He told me he got it all out. So when the CAT scan come back, he says it spread to the aorta. 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 Okay, so he spread it to the aorta. Yeah. As I remember, he told you he was going to cut it out from the aorta, right? The first thing he said is he no. going to surgery again. No, 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 no. So I was uh, very uh, unhappy with him. And I happened to listen to you, Dr. Lederman, on the radio. And I gave you a call, and I says, I'm coming to you. Now, why would you leave the doctor who you trusted, who had hands in your body, why would you leave him and come to a voice on the radio? Because he didn't explain the details to me yet. And I didn't trust him at all. So you lost all your faith in him? I lost everything. Even though he was a big surgeon at one of the biggest hospitals yes. in New York City. Yes. So what did it mean to you that you were dealing with one of the biggest doctors at one of the biggest hospitals and the cancer came back? What did that mean to you? It meant that guy was going to get well with him cutting uh, the cancer out. But evidently, I, it, 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 he didn't get it at all because it spread. Right. He didn't get it at all because it spread. But I remember he was going to operate again on the aorta. He, was, he offered that to you and then you came to me and we talked about what the aorta means and operating on the aorta. Which yeah, is after that, I didn't trust him no more, so I, I, I heard you on the radio, Dr. Leedon, and I called your office, and they gave me an appointment. So I left him completely. But he did offer you a second surgery, right? Yes. And you declined that. Right. Do you have any regrets about declining that? None at all. Okay, so you came here. you have never been here ever before. Right. Right. It was about seven years ago. Right. And what were your thoughts when you met? When I met you? Yeah. Well, you explained to me everything. And you says your best option is uh, radio surgery, radio pinpoint surgery. But we also talked about success, chemo. The success rate was, I don't know, 90, 95? About 90%. 90%. And I took it. Okay. Any regrets? Any? No regrets. You gave me five sessions, five minutes each session. And after that, I don't know how long it took, not very long. The tumor was gone, the mass was gone. Now for seven years, you've had follow-up scans, right? With you, yes. Right, and there's never been a sign of any recurrence, right? No, none at all. And since our treatment, has there been any more chemo, surgery, cutting, bleeding, or any other treatment of any kind? None at all. All right. and. What are your thoughts now about radio surgery versus open surgery? Oh, what a difference. No bleeding, no nothing, no pain, no nothing. After the session, you don't feel no after effects, nothing. Walk out of here, I went to play chess in a park. It was beautiful. Did you ever have any side effects from our treatment? None at all, nothing. Okay, there was no pain or Anything like that? No. Never been in the hospital or seen a doctor about Not, side effects? Nothing. There's been no side effects? Nothing. And what would you tell other people about having cancer, lung cancer, and options? Oh, I talk about you all the time to people I know and people that have cancer. I give them your number. I don't know if they're cold or what, but I tell them the story. So you're a believer now? Yes, I am. Any and doubts God about God bless you. Anything that I told you that wasn't true, to the best of your knowledge? No, no, no. Did, I, honest, did right. you ever feel that I did something that wasn't in your interest? No, not at all. Well, I hope you live to be 120. You've done great. You've been I'll take 119 right now. <laughs> you, well, when you're 119, you're going to change your word. And I suspect that you're going to do very well, but we're going to prove it, right? That's what we do every year. We prove it to you. We get blood tests and scans to prove it, right? So, I got this over five years, maybe over six years. I think it's about seven. And you told me you beat the odds, whatever that means. Well, seven years cancer-free after recurrent lung cancer wrapped around the aorta. That's unusual, right? It's pretty good news, right? It is. Excellent news. All right. Well, thank you so much, and God bless you, and I do wish you to be 120. Thank you very much, Doctor. So I'm here with I'm Patsy Kaplan, and we're here to talk about you, right? Yes. 
and you're a healthy woman. They say you're 80, but it's hard to believe that, right? You look like you're 20 years younger. Actually, I'm 80 and a half today. Okay, happy birthday <laughs> and a half. And uh, you have an interesting story. You were seeing your doctors, right? About, I think your breast, and then you had you saw a cardiologist, right? And you heard an extra heartbeat, is that right? Actually, yeah, I was going just to have my regular um, breast, um, uh, what I did every year, every January, and, and uh, have it for a mammogram. And uh, I had to get a prescription from my regular doctor, and he wouldn't give it to me because I hadn't been there in so long, three years. That's a bad thing. And I said, well, I haven't been sick. Okay. He said, but you have to come in. So he started a whole bunch of things. He started uh, with a uh, blood test, and that, my blood was off, so I had to go to my, uh, uh, let's see, uh, the, for, my, for my thyroid, I had to have that changed. Then I, I had to have a heart check, and that was three whole days of intensive checking, and that turned out okay. Everything I had it, I was, it probably took me a couple of months to get through all of that. I thought you had an extra heartbeat, or someone thought I you... do, I do have an extra heartbeat occasionally. And you end up getting a chest x ray because of that, right? Yes, more than an x ray. And you, well, it started out with a chest x ray, right? That's how it started. You had a heartbeat and you got a chest x ray. It started just because I needed the mammo. And, okay, and so mammogram, <laughs> cardiologist, chest x ray, and lo and behold, you had a five centimeter mass in the lung. But nobody knew that. No one knew about it. Nobody knew. It was all that. news. All news. And then. You saw doctors, you went to a big hospital, and you saw big doctors, right, about this mass, right? Well, I, no, I went to her, her, to her office. And, okay, and so she, you saw She's her. called a, um, a chest doctor. I, okay, I never pulmon, heard that a term. A pulmonary doctor. Right, she calls herself a chest doctor. Okay, and what and were we told? I was told that I needed to have a um, um, test that would go down my mouth. Bronchoscopy. And, yes, yes. She Bronch didn't so she didn't tell me the term, but okay, she, so bronchoscopy she explained it. Sedated, and the doctor puts a camera down through a scope into your lungs. Right. And um, I, I and I, had, I couldn't drive for three days. I couldn't do anything. I might have a sore throat and nothing sounded very good about it. And this was kind of shocking. And nobody had said the word cancer yet. So I asked her, I said, are you looking for cancer? And she said, maybe. Okay, but they all knew that you had a five centimeter mass in your chest, right? The size of a plum. Nobody told me that. Okay, but that's what, maybe they didn't explain it to you. Maybe the communication they never was mentioned it. lacking, they right? Never communication mentioned it. was lacking. Okay, but there had to be some reason, theoretically, there had to be some reason why they're doing all these things to you. Well, they did say, how long since you've had a regular chest x-ray? And I said, 20 years, I don't know, 20, long, time. long time. And so they sent me, and so they saw a s small something. They didn't know what it was. Okay, so. and she wanted to do bronchoscopy, and okay. you said? Uh, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> so you didn't like that idea? I didn't like the idea of having to go under general anesthesia, kind of in a doctor's office, hospital, mixed. I didn't right, like so the idea of that. What did you do next? I went home. Um, she, she, she booked me. I, she, she didn't ask me if it was okay. I said, I'll check my calendar. But the more I thought about it, the more I didn't want to do that. So I called and canceled. And she, okay. and she booked me in again. <laughs> and okay. I said I was really busy because I had recently moved. And I, 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 you know, I got back to her. But she called again. And she sent me a, a, a letter. So I, well, all, all that time, I'm kind of saying, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so I went to my, I, I, I keep a medical, um, uh, on my uh, a list of doctors that I hear that are good. <laughs> and so I went and looked you up because I knew, uh, I okay. hear you a lot. On the so radio. I was in the good list. Yeah, you were in the good list. But we never met before. No, no. Okay, so what did, you, what did you do next? I called you. Okay, and what did we do next? Made an appointment and I came in. Okay, so we met, and do you remember what happened during that meeting? Oh, yeah. yeah. So what happened? So you, you told me to, uh, you wanted to, to check me. So you, you felt my chest area, and then um, the lymph nodes. We examined the lymph nodes and right, your lungs, right. this is your heart, and right. then we said, "You said, um, have you ever had a PET, PET scan?" PET, P E T, PET, PET scan. scan. And I said, "No, I've never been sick." <laughs> okay. Did you know what a PET scan was at that time? I 
you know, it was, a, it was a whole body. Right, so scan with the injection of radioactive sugar, and it tends to go where the cancer is. So it's very helpful to know more about cancer. Right. And in lung cancer, it's very helpful to see if it's in the lymph nodes, or if it's spread, or if it's only localized. And so you agreed to do that, right? Right. Not only that, you got on the phone, and you called I don't know how many people, and any time that they put you on hold for more than 20 seconds, you hung up and found another one. And you asked me, um, had I eaten that day? I said no. So that's when you started uh, checking in. I think you must have made 20 calls. To, and, and, and what you, happened? And I, I, I had a PET scan that day. You had a PET scan and that and day. I found out I had cancer that day, and I had a PET scan that okay, day. Okay, so you found out that that mass we were talking about was cancer, and you had a PET scan that was positive, right? And you still didn't want to have anything being sedated and going down your throat to get a biopsy, right? Well, we talked about that because I wanted to know if there was an alternative. Right. And you and told me you wouldn't have one. <laughs> so, if I could avoid it. Well, that was, that was the same for me. <laughs> I told you that if you do things easier, it's better than doing things harder, yeah. right? Yeah. And so what did we arrange? So the next thing I had was a, uh, I think it was, that one was a chest chest. You had a needle biopsy uh, uh, with a tiny little needle into the I, mass. I had the needle biopsy also. I had two, two things, I think. You had the PET scan and the needle biopsy, right, right? Right, And you actually had a third thing. You had cancer markers. You had the CEA, the blood test. Oh, that was just recently. No, but that's you had one at the beginning. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, well, how do we know that it went down from a high level to a low level? Because yeah. we did it at the beginning. Right. So we established a baseline at the beginning. The baseline was we examined you, we got a PET scan, we got cancer markers, and then we talked about all the options, right? Yes. And we talked about surgery and chemo and radiation and radiosurgery, right? Absolutely. And what were your thoughts about talking about all those options. Well, I knew what your specialty was, and I was a... Uh, right, but I didn't only offer my specialty. No, no, you told me about all of them. All of them. But I didn't, I've known about all those other ones for a long time, and I right. uh, I really was, um, didn't want to be a patient for a long time. Because okay. I, I, I never felt sick. I was very, I felt because very healthy. Because this was found almost by mistake. It, it, that's right. right. By mistake. Right. So it was a cancer found by mistake, and uh, so you never had sickness. Like some people with cancer have pain and suffering right. and bleeding. And you had an abnormal heart beat and got a chest x-ray and got a scan and that was it. Right? More or less. Basically, the basics. And so you chose our treatment, right? Absolutely. So why did you do that? Because it sounded like it was uh, it was going to take care of the cancer and not my whole body and make me sick. That and was the main thing that I didn't want to... Uh, uh, and that, that it would be successful. Right, but the usual treatment can be opening up your chest, removing your tumor, giving you chemotherapy. Those are the usual kinds of things. Oh, yeah. For a five centimeter tumor, it's a pretty good size, like a tomato, a plum, it's a big tumor. Right. So you didn't want surgery. Absolutely not. You didn't want chemo. Absolutely not. I don't you, want, it makes you sick, all of that does. And you didn't want weeks and weeks of radiation. Absolutely not. So you wanted to have a precise treatment to the cancer and avoid harm whenever possible to the rest of your body. Absolutely. And you chose that. That's my choice. And we treated you. We did. And what did you feel about your treatment for your lung cancer? I did everything normally. And I was actually running a pumpkin patch at my congregation. And I was there every day. And I, was, I, I came for 10 treatments. And I never felt like I was exhausted or tired or, um, or nothing hurt. And it seemed almost unbelievable to me. So you had the biopsy through the skin. And it was pretty easy, that biopsy, right? Absolutely. It showed cancer. You had this cancer. The PET scan showed it confined to one area. We offered you treatment. We gave you the 10 treatments. It was all outpatient. You came in, got a treatment, and moved on. Yeah. And you didn't miss any meetings, uh, activities, meals? Nothing. Nothing. You weren't sick, vomiting, anything like that? No, nothing. There's no marks on your skin or anywhere else? And everybody, everybody kept asking me when I, when I was going to have it cut out. When was I going to do this? When so I was going to do that? So what did you tell your friends? You said, hey, when are you cutting it out? You've got to go to XYZ Hospital and get it cut out. That's what I heard a lot of. And, and you have to have this and you have to have that. And I said, well, right now... I'm trying something that's a little bit different. That's right. And now you're 
you're a CEA, which is a cancer marker, which I did the first day you were here, it was 16, mm -hmm. yeah. which is abnormal. Normal's up to three and a half. And yours, the first measurement is already down to two. Two, two. Okay, so it's already gone down by almost 90%, and you've had no side effects, and... That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we're doing so far so good. And then a couple days later, you told me that I uh, was... Um, you had a scan, right? I had a scan just the other day. So the scan is good, the cancer marker is good, the patient is good, so you're in remission. And I'm re in remission. And right now there's no need for any other chemo or surgery or any other treatment. There's no other need. You're in remission. It's like unbelievable because it really, really took such a short time. And um, anytime I, I think about it, it's still unbelievable to me. Do you tell your friends who are pushing you for surgery what happened to you? Yes, they all call me. Um, uh, some of them want me to take cards. They, well, they all want a card. They said they're so glad that I told them all about this. Okay. That's, that's my, like, my group, my in-group. But okay. other people, teach, uh, people in my congregation, well, you know, what about this? What about that? When, when are you going to have the chemo? I said, I don't think I'm going to. I don't think it will be necessary. But uh, we have very long conversations. I always feel like I'm defending. Did you... Uh well, you don't have to defend yourself. Your decision, you win or you lose based on your decision, right? You're the president of the United States of your body. Right. And you told them the cancer marker went from 16 to 2, and the scan showed improvement, and everything's doing well. Some of them, yes, yes, yes. It wasn't just one test. We did other no, tests, I had multiple mul tests. Multiple to, tests. To prove that, and it's independent. I'm not doing the blood test. I'm not doing the scans. It's independent people. Right, doing there are other pe other places I'm other going places to. Other places that are totally unrelated to me. And then you me. tell me to bring back the 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 discs. So. Right. right. All right. So, uh, at any time, did you feel like we were doing things that were not in your interest? Never, never. Uh, at any time, did you think we were making recommendations that were for our benefit and not for your benefit? Not at all. What would you tell other people who have a lung cancer, other cancers, what to do when surgeons are pushing them for surgery or chemo or friends are pushing them? I would tell them to come here. They meet you and make, make a decision on their own, but that they definitely should consider coming here. Any regrets? None. Thank you. You should live to be 120. Awesome. I'm going for 100 for sure. <laughs> God bless you. I hope 120. <laughs> So my name is Dr. Lederman. I'm here with Robert Wall. And tell me about yourself, Mr. Wall. Well, uh, uh, I had a... Tell me about yourself and just in general, who you are and what you do every day and how you live your life. Well, I'm uh, retired. I was a field sales manager for 30 years in the consumer pr uh, products business. And um, I'm just, I enjoy uh, exercise. I enjoy taking long walks. Um, you know, I'm pretty... Uh, pretty open in terms of things to do, places to go. And then one day, about six years ago, something changed in your body, right? Absolutely. And what changed in your body six years ago? Well, uh, I felt around and there it was a, uh, a tumor on the uh, left side of my chest, in the chest wall. Right in this area? Yes, between the second and third rib. And there was actually two nodules of this? Uh, there was. There was two nodules there. and uh, at a uh, big tri-state hospital. Oh, wait a second. So what did you do first? Did you go to your family doctor or emergency room or what did you do first? No, the first thing I did was I went to the uh, primary care physician. Okay, so what did the primary doctor tell you? Primary care doctor told me, he said, you need a biopsy. Okay, so he agreed with you there was a mass. No question. And he told you you need a biopsy. Yep. And did you have the biopsy with the primary doctor? Uh, he recommended a, uh, a surgeon. A Thoracic surgeon? Or thoracic general? surgeon. So did you see that thoracic surgeon? I did. And did he do a biopsy? Yes, he did. And what kind of tumor did they tell you had? It was a schwannoma. Schwannoma. So he had a schwannoma of the chest. And did the surgeon tell you he had experience treating schwannomas? Yes. He said he did have experience. However, he, said, he told me that you need surgery. Okay. Did he want to do the surgery? Yes, he did. Did he encourage you to have the surgery? Absolutely. Did he tell you what the surgery would entail? Yes, he did. So how did he explain it? He explained it. He said he, he would have to cut open the chest wall. He would use a camera 
inside the uh, inside the chest wall to see the tumor, and he would uh, eventually cut the tumor out. And what would be left of you after he did that? Because this is a tumor. This is a schwannoma. It's a sh it's a tumor of the nerves. Correct. So it's of the chest wall. It's mm -hmm. not in the lung. It's not in the skin. It's in the chest wall where the nerves would be, right? Correct. And he'd be cutting out that chest wall area. He'd be cutting out the chest wall area, including that nerve piece. And did he tell you he'd be cutting out the ribs and the muscle with it? Yes, he's, a part of the muscle would come out. So he told you he'd be cutting out the ribs, the muscle, and the tumor. Correct. And how would that leave you after surgery? Well, obviously, I'd have to, I would have to spend time in the hospital. And uh, he said that it would be scarred. And I would have to go back and uh, take a look at it. And how would he close the wound if he's removing the ribs and the muscle and the tissues you need for the lungs to breathe you need kind of like a con controlled tight container to keep on breathing so how would he repair that that uh, defect well he said he would have to tighten it up a bit and he would have to stitch it up and uh, it would be scarred did he ever tell you there were options at that time he did not mention options did you ever see another surgeon i did not so he was the main one you saw. And was he a local surgeon or was that a big hospital? A big tri-state hospital. He was a surgeon in that hospital. And Would you say it was a super duper pooper hospital? Super duper. Big tri-state ho hospital. Everybody would know the name of it. So when you went to a super duper hospital, he told you, did he tell you you have to have surgery? He said, he said to me surgery was the only option. And it, I was the one who mentioned to him about, well, how about radiation? So he never told you about radiation or radio. He surgery. did not. He never mentioned it at all. Never mentioned he it. He never told you any options. Correct. He told you you had to have surgery. Had to have surgery was the only way to uh, alleviate the uh, the tumor. And did he tell you you have to have surgery soon before it grows? Or what, what did he tell he's, you? He's, he, yes, he did. He told me that number one, uh, radiation would not decrease the tumor. And he also told me that eventually, uh, it's a slow moving tumor and it would grow. Okay, so had you ever had a friend or neighbor or loved one who had a schwannoma of the chest wall? Never. It's a very rare tumor. Yes, it is. And so you had a big surgeon at a big hospital telling you you had to have surgery. Had to have surgery. So most people would say, oh, doctor, did go ahead and cut me any way you want. That's what a lot of people do, mm -hmm. right? Correct. So why aren't you like a lot of people say, oh, just cut me open whatever you want? Because in the past, Prior to having the tumor, I listened to your show, and I knew of you, and I even mentioned to the surgeon, well, I have to get a second opinion. I, I need to see uh, a, a, a doctor in New York, and uh, he does radiation, and I need to talk to him about it. Was the fact that you saw, that you listened to the radio show, was that what educated you to know that there were options? Would you have known that otherwise? No, I, I'd listened to the show for years, and uh, I probably wouldn't have known it, known it. So, do you think that listening to the show changed your life? No question about it. I mean, I uh, I made the appointment with you. We discussed the biopsy. I brought you the information, and uh, you know, I made an appointment, and we went from there. Okay, so again, you would have never known about radiation or radio surgery if it wasn't for the program. Correct. And how was the meeting with me, this is almost six years ago, how was the meeting with me compared to the meeting with the surgeon? Well, it was, it was, it was very, uh, we had the meeting, I brought you the information, you discussed the data for your 30 years experience, and uh, it sounded plausible to me, it made sense. Uh, you have experience, 30 years experience with tumors, not just swanomas, but uh, cancer tumors, et cetera, and uh, we went from there. Did you feel compelled or pushed to have the radiation or radio surgery? No, absolutely, absolutely not. I made the decision myself after listening to you talk about the data and past experiences with people who had a similar, if not the same tumor. And when you were here, did we talk about all the options? We, we talked about all the options. We talked about surgery. We talked about what the, uh, what the uh, thoracic surgeon said at the big uh, fancy hospital. And uh, we, we talked about your experiences with these particular tumors. How did it make you feel, one, seeing the surgeon versus how you felt when you were here? Well, I was much more relaxed here. I mean, you know, when you're in the hospital, there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, you, you know, you're speaking to the surgeon, you know, it's a cold environment. Here it's not cold. People are very friendly. I got the appointment very quickly. And we talked about, uh, 
what we were going to move forward with. Why did you decide to go ahead with radio surgery? Remember, you had been at the, one of the biggest hospitals, one of the biggest surgeons, and you walked away from him. Most people say, oh, it's, it's such a big hospital, I have to go there. That's what most people would say, right? Correct. So how were you able to walk away from surgery and the defect and the anesthesia and the hospital stay and all the other things? Well, because I knew, I knew from the surgeon it was going to be the cutting, the bleeding, and it was going to be staying in the hospital. And I wanted a second opinion. And I know, again, you have 30 years experience within this field. And it made sense to me. Uh, the treatment made sense. And uh, it just was the logical approach. And then so six years ago, she came here and you decided to go ahead with the treatment. Your treatment, yes. Our treatment. You had non-invasive radio surgery. And how would you describe your experience getting treatment here? What was it like walking in the door? What did you feel the, and see? The number one, the appointment was very, very quick. Uh, I, again, I brought you the data, you analyzed the data, and uh, my experiences here was, was, was very simple. I mean, you had, uh, I had five treatments, maybe the treatments were maybe five minutes, less than five minutes. I, uh, I walked out. Did you did, feel anything during the treatment? No, no. Was there any pain or cutting there or was, bleeding? There or? were no cutting, no bleeding, no hospital stay, didn't feel a thing. I walked in, uh, had the treatment, like I said, five minutes tops, uh, only five treatments in total, and walked out and took care of my business. And did you suffer in any way from our treatment? No, there was no suffering at all. And then the years passed and you had follow-ups over those Absolutely. years, right? You still had recently a uh, scan showing the tumors. Double Everything's dead in the water. It's been controlled. That's correct. It's been it has, dead in the water. You've had no further treatment since our treatment. Correct. No further treatment. Uh, I've had the follow-up every year for the six years. Uh, we have a, a, a take a CAT scan every year, take a look at it. has not grown. As a matter of fact, it did shrink. Right. So the, the definition of radio surgery, it stops, shrinks, or goes away. In your category, you've been successfully treated now for six years, which in our experience means most likely you're going to be A-OK. -okay. We have to prove it over the years, but so far six years is the critical time and you're doing fantastically. That's, that's, that's correct. And looking back on these six years, would you have done anything differently if you had a chance to relive your life over these six years? No, it was the right decision. I mean, uh, I, no question about it. I mean, again, uh, why spend time in a hospital with the cutting and the bleeding and the whole whole uh, picture there when you can come here and uh, it's, it's just a simple process. Did any of your friends or neighbors or loved ones say, hey, get that surgery, you should go to a super duper hospital and get that surgery? Did anyone tell you that? No, no, they, they actually didn't tell me that. But I will tell you this, that if in fact uh, any of those folks came down with any uh, any tumors or cancer, I have recommended that they see you. Okay, what advice would you have for other people who maybe don't listen to the radio program and didn't know? I mean, the radio program seems like it changed your life, right? No question about it. So thank God for that. And thank that's you. really why we're on the radio is to educate. Absolutely, it's a, it, it is an education, but I also think that somebody who has had experience with you can pass that knowledge on to other people. And at least my recommendation is to get a second opinion. And well, what happens if you get a second opinion? You, you go to one surgeon at one hospital and you go to another surgeon at another hospital and you have the same opinion. Well, that, that's not a real second opinion, No, right? that, absolutely, that's not a second opinion. You have to come to uh, Dr. Lederman and hear what he has to say through his data of 30 years. All right. Anything else you have to say about for patients and people who are listening? Well, uh, the only thing I would say is that uh, you have to uh, get that second opinion here and uh, go through the data. And uh, that's uh, really the direction you should go. Did you ever feel like we were doing anything that wasn't in your interest? No, absol absolutely not. I think the whole the whole process here is, 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 is a positive one. People are very nice. The radiation is short and sweet. Uh, the doctor is the best in his field. So why wouldn't you come here? All right, thank you very much. God bless you. You got it, doctor. Okay, so I'm here with... Chandra. And you're here with... Robert. <laughs> and why are you here today? 
uh, because I am a survivor. You were diagnosed with a breast cancer, right? Right. Yes. And it was an aggressive breast cancer, yes. right? It was yes. triple negative breast cancer, and it was two or three centimeters, depending on who's measuring it, right? right. Yes. And you saw other doctors elsewhere, correct? Right. And what did they tell you? And what were your thoughts about it? Well, they had told me that um, for my chance of survival, I would have to go the gold standard, which was like five to six months of chemo, surgery, then recuperate from the surgery, and then do radiation. Um, did, my, you see one, did you see more than one doctor who told you that? Yes. Or? I went to two different doctors in two different um, facilities, okay. like completely separate from each other. And they all told you the same thing? They said that that was the gold standard. And that... It's what's usually done in America, right? So most mm -hmm. women have months and months of chemo and then surgery and then radiation. Yeah, I was guaranteed to lose my hair. And, and, and possibly had heart damage as a result of the, the chemo. Right, and you were actually doing tests for your heart when we met, right? Didn't right. They, because they were planning to give you chemotherapy that could hurt your heart. Correct. And why didn't you listen to them? You had two doctors in two separate places from big hospitals telling you, you do this and that's what it is. Why didn't you follow their advice? Because I was young. I was, I'm 38 years old and a mother of two. You were 38 back when you got started, yes. right? Yes. And 38, you have, you have two children mm -hmm. and a boyfriend, fiance. Fiance. Yep. And, uh, so you just didn't want to go through that. No, I, I, I wanted a, a better way. I knew there had to be a better way. So, um, I prayed on it prayed on it very hard. And someone who I didn't know from Adam reached out to me from a church that I used to affiliate with and um, told me a success story that you also had with his mother who had um, a terminal um, cancer that she was um, pushed away from all the other doctors and you treated her with the radio surgery and she survived. So he said that if he ever needed it was his, what he would have do, done. And he was I'm a sorry. big advocate for you. He was like your he tried to be your guardian angel. Yes, right? he did. He yes, and we're remember, still in touch today. Remember, yeah. he sent me a zillion emails about. You, right? <laughs> yes. Well, be careful. Do this below. That's right. Yeah. So we met, and what was your thoughts when we met? What did you think about? Well, what do you think about the meeting? Um, I thought that you were you you breathed through all the paperwork so fast, but you caught things that other doctors didn't even notice. Which automatically, we were both very impressed. We were like, okay, wow, this, um, there's something here. There's definitely something here. So um, we thought about it, prayed on it some more, and we decided this was the route we wanted to take. Okay, so did you have any qualms about not having the months and months of chemotherapy? That sounds like a silly question. <laughs> no, not okay. at all. Did no qualms. Did you have any qualms about not no. having surgery on your breast? No, no. I'm intact still completely. Like you, you don't even notice that anything was there. There's a little discoloration, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't tell that anything happened. So you happened. were treated with our treatment only for your breast cancer. No chemo and Correct. no surgery, no Correct. lumpectomy, no, no mastectomy Correct. only. Correct. Right. Yes. And that was a couple of years ago now. Yes. And since that time, you've had no further treatment. No. Nope. Right. No. And you've had a variety of testing, mammograms and ultrasounds and scans, right? Mm -hmm. And they've all been okay. That's right. Cancer right. markers on my, my blood work the are normal. Cancer markers Everything's, and scanning yep. and examining your breasts are all a-okay. A-okay, yes. And what's your thoughts about that? that? That's absolutely amazing. Within two, well, for my specific situation, it was within two months from diagnosis to no more lump, gone, and, and then it was just time to heal at that point forward. And um, I just, I'm blown away. I tell everybody that I know about this. Um, it's, it's sad that we see other people who decide to go the conventional way. And um, I just, I, I don't know. Well, it's not sad, <laughs> it's not, to me it's not sad if they learn about all the options. True. True. But it seems like in most places they don't tell the patient all the options. They tell right. patients their way without learning about all the other options. That's I was what's actually, sad. I was actually um, told not to go this route by a specific doctor. Right, well that's okay, that's their opinion. Right. And they're free to give their opinion. Right, but this I, made more sense to me. How it, so how are we different in talking about options? Did we talk about surgery and chemo and everything with you? You, asked, you, you offered as far as if that was something I wanted to do, but this specific place does not handle that that I'm aware of. No, but if you wanted surgery, if you wanted chemo, did I refuse you? Oh, no, it? absolutely not. You left me completely open right, to whatever I Because I deal with I surgeons and yeah. chemo doctors if you want that. Right. Okay, but 
many people like you don't want that. We Correct. We have many women who do not want that. So it's not that you can't have it. You can have it. It's just we offered that. Right, right, right. And uh, you clearly did not want that. And you had other doctors who were willing to cut on you or give you chemo exactly. if you wanted, right? That was my thought, too, was chemo is always going to be an option. There's No one's ever going to tell me, oh. All right, so you had the treatment. What did you feel during the treatment? Nothing. I came in, got changed, was called, laid down. They put you in a, posi a certain position. The machine does its thing, and it's time to go home within, like, minutes later. Did you miss out on any activities, work or social activities or any other activities because of the treatment? Not because of the treatment, no. Did you have any downtime because of the treatment? No, I, there was some pain and... and um, some swelling and redness, and the skin was sensitive, very sensitive, but nothing I couldn't handle, nothing that... that did that go away? Yes, 100%. All right, and any regrets? No. Did you think at any time that we were doing things to you that weren't in your own best interest? No. And did we ever deny you any treatment of any kind during this course of uh, treatment or follow-up? No. And what would you tell other women and other people who have cancer that are being told something at big hospitals, you got to do this or you got to do that? What would you tell other people? Come see Dr. Lederman first. <laughs> okay. Don't make any decisions yet. See if there's a better way because there probably is. How would your life have been if you'd gone through the surgery and gone through the chemo now versus what you went through? My honest answer, I don't think I'd still be here. Why? Because... Um, Hearing how chemo is not 100% effective with triple negative breast cancer, the fact that I would have had to wait to see if it would shrink the tumor, then go for surgery. It had already, it had already migrated to the lymph nodes. So with all that waiting, it could have metastasized even further. Um, being triple negative, it's highly aggressive. And I've read things as far as it could take you out in nine months. So um, the fact that we went at the tumor sites themselves and just killed it at its source, I feel a lot more confident and I honestly, I don't know if I would be here right now had I gone the other way. And anything that you regret, any questions when you go to bed at night and put your head on the pillow, just, what do you think about and any regrets and any, any, anything that comes to mind? Um, I literally just say thank you God every single night and every morning I wake up that I have another day here and I'm so thankful for you and I'm thankful for my little guardian angel that I still keep in contact with that led me to you. And I know that it's an answered prayer. I really, I firmly, wholeheartedly feel that this was an answered prayer. And maybe your fiance here, any thoughts that you can think about uh, her care? And you've been here for almost every visit, right? Uh, yeah, just about. Just about every, any thoughts, any observations? You were probably there for the chemo uh, consultations mm -hmm. and surgery consultations. Yeah, I was there. I was there. And I know that sitting in the office meeting with those doctors, they, um, met us with a, a certain level of, of urgency yeah. that this had to be handled um, immediately. Now, you you met us with the same level of urgency, but not so much um, putting us in a state of fear. Right, yes. That's that we point. had to act um, yeah. almost irrationally, not leaving us to our own thoughts. They they um, made us feel that we had to act. And do what they say or else. At, at their will. Yeah. Not, yeah. not allowing us to make our own decisions. And why do you think they did that? That's all they knew, I think. The what? I think that's all they, they, right. that's all I, they knew. I, the, I think that's all, I, the I doctors, think that's all they know. They the, were. Right. Trained. Trained to treat with chemo, surgery, and radiation. And mm -hmm. that's that's all that they know. Right. And the diagnosis that Chandra received, um, they have uh, a certain regimens that treat um, specific types of cancers. So the type that she had was only um, allowed this certain type of treatment. Mm -hmm. And because um, it's considered rare too, only like ten to fifteen percent of women end up with triple negative. Right, so. but we knew we knew that chemo wasn't an option because of the short and long term side effects. Yeah, and that's um, not something we wanted to do. We wanted to 
um, look into other options. We knew that there are other options available. And, um, but we just didn't know what they were yours, either. Right, so, right. Yeah. so, yeah, so we it had was a the, blessing. This was something totally new to us. Yeah. And we um, did a lot of research, and you um, treatment uh, with you seemed um, the most effective yeah. and yes. least uh, invasive. Yeah. Well, God bless you, and hope you have many decades of happiness together. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you very because much. of you, we will. You. We will. <laughs> God willing. Yeah, amen. Thank you. That's true. Okay, I'm here with. Stanley Urlo. And Stanley, you're here with? Marjorie Kahn. And between the two of you, you've had three cancers. Three cancers and a baby. All treated here, right? <laughs> and your wife led the way. Right. And she led the way. We heard her story. She had a rectal cancer and didn't want colostomy. She had a breast cancer. She wanted to keep her breast. She came here and both her bottom and her top were treated and she's doing great. Exactly. And then somewhere in the middle of that all, here comes you, and you have prostate problems. Well, and tell us about the prostate problems. Okay. Um, it started by being in a movie and not being able to pee. So that You were starring in a movie, or you were seeing a movie? Seeing a movie. Okay. And uh, so the next day, I went to uh, one of the hospitals to put a catheter in. You went to one of the super-duper big hospitals, <laughs> right, right? Right, right, right. And they put a catheter in. And uh, you know, supposed to come back in a week, and I went back in a week, and they were doing some kind of procedures, a couple of procedures, which meant that I was bleeding like crazy from my penis for uh, three, four hours at a time. And uh, he have would, you ever bled from no had blood in the urine before no, that? No, and I asked for a biopsy, and he refused to do it. So I asked him to write a letter to you as to what his reasoning was. He did. You read the letter and you said, well, there's just different ways to handle it, you know. And then you said to me, but if it was me, I would want to know. Right. So he was planning to do surgery on your prostate, a rotor-rooter procedure, a, right. TRB, a TRP, TERP procedure uh, on you without knowing your PSA and without knowing if you had prostate cancer or not. Exactly. Right. And you came to me and you asked me what I thought. And I said... I wouldn't do it without knowing more about your condition, right? Right. And you, at that time, you saw a urologist at one of the biggest hospitals in New York City, right? Yes. And they didn't do a PSA. They didn't investigate whether you had cancer or not. They just wanted to do this procedure. Yeah. Right? They did two of them, one through the penis and one through the rectum, to look and see. To look and see. But they wanted to cut out and do this rotor rooter Probably eventually. And you had the PSA here. When you came here, we checked you out, and your PSA was more than 10. Exactly. Normal PSA. PSA is prostatic-specific antigen. It should be only four, and yours was two and a half times higher. Right. Had any of your doctors done no. a PSA before? <coughs> no. You know, never talked about it. And what's the other one? The uh, other... The Gleason score? Gleason. Okay, well, Gleason comes with a biopsy. So you had a PSA, and when your PSA hits 10, it means that more than 35% chance you'll have cancer. So you had a high risk of having cancer. He was going to do the surgery, which if you have prostate cancer, and he goes through the prostate with the scraping, he could spread the cancer, he could make treatment more difficult, and other side effects from that scraping. So we did the PSA, we met back afterwards, and what happened then? Well, they, they, they did the biopsy, and they found that they had a real cancer. Right. And I, I, you had a Gleason 6 cancer, so it was intermediate risk because your PSA was high. PSA is normal up to 4, yours was 10.5. Gleason score is from 2 to 10, yours was 6, right in the middle. Right. And I was here the whole time you were working with Marjorie, so I knew you, and I knew what, what was going on, and I knew the procedure, and I knew the success rate. So there was no question. So um, uh, I said, well, can we start today? And it scared you a little bit, you know, you jumped up. Uh, but you went and you got, they made this box or something. that I would The stereotactic frame? Right, exactly. And we got that taken care of, so we were able to start, begin in, in just really basically a couple of days. So you started the treatment, you, you trusted me. Why would you, why would you come here after you were at that super duper big hospital where they were already telling you they got to do the rotor rooter and do surgery on you? Why would you come here instead? Because uh, I had been following you on the radio as well, and the two of us together decided that this is 
well, we should just go to Dr. Lederman. And we, we didn't think about it, but it didn't make sense not to. So we did. So that's where we initially met. And that's, that's when I was comfortable. And so uh, we had every, everything taken care of immediately. And in fact, three or four days later, you came to me and you said, I want to do that thing again, that box again. You started to have to frame. Yeah, because you demand perfection and it was not perfect. So you did it again. I mean, all of those things add up to you, this is the right place to be. All right. So you came here, you had treatment. What did you feel during the course of treatment? I was waiting for it to start and it was over. So was there any pain, suffering, nothing, torture, no, nothing, cutting? I didn't even get an appetite from it. Okay, so you came here, you had a treatment, you turned around and went home. Exactly. And now you were treated some time ago, right? Yes. And have you gone back to the surgeons at the big hospital? No. Are you planning to? No. Why? Well, the last time I went there, they wouldn't even examine me because they knew they had screwed me up like crazy. I used, they didn't have that many rooms. They, they uh, did some kind of a check my bladder, pushing on my bladder, and I bled for like two or three hours, and I didn't leave the room. After their procedure. Yes. And so I occupied the room the whole time. So they, weren't, they didn't want anything to do with me, and I didn't want to have anything more to do with them. So I went back, and I said, are you going to examine me? He said, no. And that was the end of it. So you've never seen them again? Never. And a few minutes ago, you showed me your PSA after treatment, right? Yes. And before it was more than 10, you had a Gleason 6, PSA more than 10, prostate cancer, or serious prostate cancer, and your PSA today is? 0 0.1. I had it done, tested uh, the beginning of January. So what did it make you feel when your PSA went from more than 10? That means it's down by 99%, right? So it felt, it felt, felt great. It felt great. There's no, I mean, there was no problems. Uh, everything was back to normal again. There was no... Uh, um, no, no difficulty peeing. There was no, uh, you know, difficulty with anything. Everything was back to normal. So your quality of life is good. Yes. You're urinating on your own. Yes. No pain, no suffering, no bleeding. Right. And the cancer is gone. Exactly. Any regrets? No regrets at all. Do you think we ever did anything that was against your best interest mm -hmm. while you were here? No, because again, I had gone through the whole thing with Marjorie with you. So I was confident from the beginning. You know, I mean, I had to sell you on you, on me taking me right away. <laughs> well, I want to do the. I want people to feel comfortable. I don't want anyone to feel like they're pushed into anything. Uh -huh. And I never want people to feel pushed or rushed and have any kind of regret because I so often see people have surgery. You know, they say, "Oh, you cut off my arm, go ahead." And the next day, after the arm's gone, you know, they regret it. And so I want people to be comfortable. That's why I always ask people twice or more. You know, you're ready, you're comfortable. Everything that I found here resonated with me exactly with my own attitude, my own way of thinking, and everything I found elsewhere didn't. So what do you tell your friends when they say, oh, didn't you go to XYZ hospital or ABC hospital? Do you have friends that have got a conversation? My problem is that I do, but they live in Seattle or they're living in different places. But even it's in more Seattle, difficult. there's XYZ hospitals there too. Oh yeah, exactly. The same thing happens around the world. Right, I was trying to get the guy to come here, but it was just when this virus was here and he, so he couldn't, so he had to have the radical surgery. I hope he's doing okay. I haven't spoken to him in a little while. But I tell everybody, I mean, they don't even have to ask me and I tell them, go to Dr. Lederman. Thank you so much, God bless you. God bless you. Okay, so I'm here with Steve McCroskey. And up to a year, so we never met, right? We met through the radio show, but we never knew it. Right, and about over the last few years, you've had a PSA and you've been seen by your doctors and your doctors have been doing PSAs, right? Yes. And your PSAs went from three to four to six, right? Yeah, well, there was a stop at 5.1 and 5.5. And then, um, then it was just basically almost, you know, a, a year and a few weeks ago where I... Well, before we get yeah, there, okay. so it went to... F oh, the usual normal range for PSA is considered up to four. Mm -hmm. And I think I remember that you actually saw a urologist or doctors about your PSA being five or five and a half, right? Yeah, I went to a urologist once when it was like around 5.1, I believe. So it was abnormal. You went to the urologist because your PSA was abnormal, right? Mm -hmm. And what did the urologist do about that? Um, 
He said, based upon my age, that was not an unusual number. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, said it was, we would watch it, did he ever which I had heard that term several times. Did he ever offer, say, or ever say, hey, it's abnormal and I'll do a biopsy just to make sure it's not cancer? Did he ever say that? That never happened. Okay, and you had a primary doctor and you had a urologist, both who yeah. knew about this PSA that was elevated. Yeah. And no one raised a red flag at any point that this might be cancer. No. And you were reassured. You saw the urologist. You saw a specialist. So you knew that the PSA was high. You saw the specialist. You said, maybe it's just because you're 70. And you don't look 70, but just because you're 70, maybe it's normal. And we'll just take a gamble, all right, and hope it's okay. That was pretty much it. Was there anything you know, and more? I, and I, you know, he's a professional person, you know, so... I wouldn't have any reason to say, no, it's not this or that. Okay, so you were comfortable about that. He was comfortable about that. And then what happened next? Uh, it had an enormous jump. So that was a year ago. Yes. Actually, more than a year ago. Yeah. And it, what does enormous mean? It went from the 5.5 to 56. So it was off the wall. That's tenfold. That's 1,000%, right. right? Yes. And what happened next? Um, we said, you know, there was a feeling that it could have been either a infection in my body that could have uh, settled in the prostate to throw the PSA number off as one of his uh, responses, or it could be a false positive. This is the urologist or no, the primary doctor? No, this is the doc regular doctor. The my, primary doctor. My so primary doctor. the primary doctor repeat it at that right. time? Right. So we took another, his suggestion, take another blood test. And in four days, he called me up and said, you want to come back? I want to go over the results. And it had four days had gone from 56 to 62. Okay. So you knew at that point that the number was most likely true. Right. So what did you do then? Um, he had said... Uh, do you have a urologist? But the guy that I went to some time ago had since uh, closed his practice. The guy that reassured you about the yeah, five and a half. Yeah, and that was quite quite a few years ago, actually. So um, I said, well, my wife had an issue with an infection many years ago. I could get you. She liked them, so I could. And maybe I'll call him. And he said, well, get me the information, and I will place the call. And then they contact you directly through because of I guess a current healthcare system you really need what they call a referral. Okay. And so meanwhile, um, I called him back about ten days later and I said, you know, no one is calling me. And I said, uh, you know, so I was getting a little irritated with the situation because uh, even I knew as an amateur that at sixty two PSA there's a real potential for some issues there. And and so uh, he said, well, let me call these guys again and see what happens. And meanwhile, no one was calling me. So being a fairly regular listener of your show on the weekends when why I'd be do, doing why, errands. Why would you listen to Dr. Lederman on the radio? Well, I've been in sort of this, I don't want to say a rut, but, you know, sometimes I would like to listen to these medical shows because you seem to pick up stuff that you would, you know, get anywhere else. Was it entertaining or was it educational? Oh, it was It was educational. It was educational. The whole thing was all about education. So you were learning things. Yes, absolutely. So what did you learn about prostate cancer or whatever from the radio show? Well, I would, I'd be listening and I figured this has got to be a chance for a solution. So I called your office and um, made an appointment and they gave me a, a date like about almost two weeks out. And so I said, is that the best you can do? And they said, well, right now that is. So I waited a day and then I called back. And I said, this is Steve McCroskey. I spoke to someone there a couple days ago. And she said, yeah, we have your appointment here for such and such. And so I said, do you ever have cancellations? And uh, she said, we do from time to time, but not that frequently. I said, could you take down my home number and my name? And please call me if something happens. So about Two days went by, and I got a call from your office, and they said, we had a cancellation. Can you be here tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock? I said, absolutely. Okay, so we met. We went over yep. things. Yep. And what happened when you met? Um, you gave me an exam, and, um, and, you know, through your findings, and we did blood work and so forth and so on. And as soon as I was, um, as you were done giving me 
uh, my prostate exam. Uh, you had called um, a urologist and, uh, and you had mentioned that to him that I've got a guy here that you need to see right away. And so I got myself clo my clothes on and you wrote me the address and he said, you go and see him right now. He will take you. And I said, just like that. And because, you know, stuff just doesn't happen like that. But I was in his office for like five minutes and the nurse comes out, is there a Steve McCroskey here? You know, and he saw me, it was unbelievable. And then you said, when you're done with him, come right back to me. And then you had already worked up a schedule uh, for a body scan and a pelvic MRI and a pelvic scan and this net, the other in a thing, bone scan. in a bone scan. And I said to myself, I was in shock. Right. So because within, an so hour, within an hour of you being here, we had arranged for a biopsy and a scan of your body, right? Mm -hmm. And we repeated the PSA. Yes. And what were your thoughts? Because maybe your head was spinning with that action. Well, I was actually um, so relieved because um, things were happening. Okay. You know, I, mean, I felt I, I felt, geez, maybe I finally got the guy that can get me going here and see what you know how we can do you know get this taken care of. So you had a biopsy that showed cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And you had the scan that showed cancer in the prostate and the lymph nodes. The bone scan was yes. okay, and we repeated the PSA. Went up to more than ninety, so it was very mm -hmm. aggressive. Right? Ninety-three point six. And I even offered another PSA. At that time, you were just fed up with PSAs, right? Pretty much. Yeah. And you knew, and we knew that you had this very aggressive cancer and that treatment would be appropriate. And we talked to you about all the options, right? This was all within a few days. Everything yeah. was happening within a few days. And uh, I know you compared that to what was going on back home. And uh, we put together a plan to try to get this cancer under control, right? Correct. And you chose to stay here. Did you ever have any feelings that anything we told you wasn't true or in your interest or wasn't beneficial for you? Was there any feelings like uh, that? I never had any feelings like that at all. I felt like I, you know, uh, you know, I finally got this thing figured out. Like I finally ran into the people that I, I felt based upon, you know, going back through the, my years of listening to the radio and so forth. I said, I, I finally found the guy that I think can take me to the next level. Okay, so you trusted us. Oh, right? absolutely, absolutely. And in more than a year, has anything happened to make you not trust us or not trust something that we say or do? Or No, not at all. Not okay, at all. so you've had the treatment, and you've done very well. What was the treatment like? What was treatment like getting treated for your prostate, for example? Um, it was, you know, you always figure if you're going to go through some sort of treatment, there has to be something involved that would make you uncomfortable, or may, you know, or pain, you know, and so forth and so on, and nothing. So you never nothing. had pain or suffering nothing. or torture or nothing. knives or cutting you know, or I, bleeding? I, you or know, I used to, a lot of people are trained to think, you know, well, how can you get better if you're not going through something? Right, people first. say no pain, no gain. You're right. So yeah. what about here? Was there any pain? No, of was course there, not. Was there gain? Gain is incredible. Okay, so you've gone through the treatment. Your PSA was 90, whatever, two or three. Mm -hmm. And now it is? Uh, 0.02. 0.02. It's pretty much as low as can be. And you're carrying on and you're traveling and you've, I know you have live in Connecticut and to come here special for today is really incredible uh, with bad weather and so on. But you did it and you, you actually travel in the country and you have a beautiful wife and you cook steaks on the barbecue <laughs> and you're living your life, right? Uh, we try. And that's certainly yeah. so different than a year ago. Oh, a year ago, uh, and towards the end of my treatments, I put so much pressure on myself to make sure I got here. And Did we put pressure on you to come at a certain time? No, no. I was, when I finished all my exams, you know, with you, and, uh, you know, then I went with one of your technicians and set me up with a date. And she said, so our first opening is like February 24th. And I said, I said to myself, what's wrong with tomorrow? He just said, we are booked, you know, and we have a 1215 available on like February 24th. I said, I'll take it, you know, and that, and that became my time. And I worked my railroad schedule around getting here and, 
and uh, got to know the people that I call them the techs in and uh, and uh, it was it was really really great because every time I got home I knew I was getting something done and it hadn't been going that well for me. And then during the course of treatment, you actually had a PSA that was done. You asked for a PSA early after, on, right? Earlier after than usual. Of the first 25 treatments. You asked for a, a after the blood 13th. test. And uh, I told you, we don't normally do it, but we'll do it for you, right? Yes, that's and your true. PSA, do you remember what that PSA was? I'm sure you do. 6.39. So it had gone from <laughs> 90 plus down to six. So it down, gone down by 94% or whatever in yeah. that short period of time. Yeah. And right now it's zero, and you're doing well, and you're here because you want to, I assume, help other people learn about options and what to do. Yeah, and you asked me to come, and I didn't think about it for two seconds. I said, All right, what other advice would you have for someone with prostate or other cancers? Well, I gave the conductor on the train this morning <laughs> the schedule of your radio shows because he said his father had just had uh, cancer in part of his nose and he said they were talking about chemo and all this other stuff which you know I don't know enough about that kind of treatments or anything to make a judgment but I wrote down your name and I wrote down here's the schedule of the weekend radio shows and said so give this to your dad and tell him to tune in and he'll learn something and maybe you know he might not be satisfied with the way things are going and if I told you how many people I have told about the the success rate of your of the treatments that go on here I said I said you know most normal people probably wouldn't believe it so what do you do then if most normal people don't believe the work we do well I think I th unfortunately maybe that part of the world works because people have been educated Go to a doctor, you go to the hospital, you have the surgery and you get out. And then later on, you know, we, other things pop up and so forth and so on. And I just think people would have been so much better off if they could have found out about radio surgery in New York and come here and get the treatments, their lives would be so much better and not as stressed out. And, you know, I just found it to be terrific terrific program that you that you offer here. Thank you so much. God bless you. I just want to say one other thing. Uh, we try not to make people wait, and you, you don't need a referral to come here, and I'm not trying to contradict yourself, but people are free. The purpose of the radio show and the education is that people should feel free to call us if they want to come in, if they have a suspicion of cancer or cancer or uh, real cancer, you're not getting the treatment you want. And I know what you said is true in most places, that you need have one doctor call the other doctor, and that's how the system works, kind of like the good old boys network, network. works. But we're kind of like independent and not working in the good old boys network, and that's why we can get things done that other places probably don't get done. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I got to, when I would go home in the afternoon, I was on the same train all the time, and I knew the conductor for 30 years. And he said, how's the treatments going? All the time, all the time, and stuff like that, you know? And so I was passing out uh, radio surgery New York business cards, you know, uh, to, to the conductor and the guy punching yeah. tickets, and the engineer was a friend of mine, so. Well, as we say, you should live to be 120, <laughs> and thank you, and God bless you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name's Dr. Gil Lederman, and I'm here with Jean Perry. Okay, so you're here and you have quite a story to tell about breast cancer. I think so. More than the usual woman, <laughs> right? Going back many years. Correct. Right? Yeah. And many years ago, you had a cancer of the left breast. Correct. And you went to a usual hospital and you had the usual treatment. You had surgery and you had radiation yes. for that cancer. Correct. Right? Yes. And that went pretty well for a while, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And mm -hmm. then you developed a cancer on the right breast. Quite a few years later. Yeah. Quite a few years later. Mm -hmm. And now you'd already had experience in another hospital with surgery, and they tried to give you chemo, and you didn't want that, and they gave you hormones, I think, for a year and a half or something like that. They wanted me to take it for five years. I understand that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you had the radiation there, but... When you got your new cancer on the right breast, 
Yes. You changed your mind about the medical profession, right? I did. Why? Yes. Well, first off, um, I, I was very concerned about the issue of blood in any way because I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So we don't have thick blood transfusions. And I thought that if I had more surgery, then it, there might be a chance that they would want me to do that. So then I... I didn't have that done, but I did go to cancer facilities, you know, just and, and um, they all suggested the same thing that I needed to get the uh, cut out the surgery, and then I needed to get radiation and chemotherapy. So every place you went, you went to a few places. Yes, three. It was almost like they were reading off of a script, the same exactly, script. Exactly, exactly. And so it makes it hard for a patient when you go to several different places and everyone's telling you the same thing Correct. without really giving you any other options. Correct. Right? Yes. And then you came here. I did. I was... Why did you come here? I, I happened to be half asleep one night and I heard the ra you on the radio. <laughs> I'm not a TV person, but I'm a, a radio person, so I listen to the radio a lot. And I heard you say that uh, you, you don't need to have chemotherapy. You can get radio surgery. So I was interested in, more in that. I really was. And so it seemed like it would work out for me, and it would be into my for my best interest. So it wasn't just to avoid the surgery, it was really, no, it started I, out to avoid the chemo. Yeah, I had the surgery. I had the surgery. So 15 years later. Well, you had the surgery before, but you didn't yeah. have the surgery when the cancer came on the, on the right, right breast. No. So on the right no. breast, when you came here, yeah, exactly. you didn't want surgery. Right. And you didn't want chemo. Correct. And did any of the other, you met with many other doctors did. and many other facilities, did anyone else offer you those options? No. And when you came here and you heard about it, what did you think? I thought, well, that would be great if it works. Okay. And did you believe it would work or you weren't sure? Or? I, I did. I, I was really sick the first time I had, when I had the surgery on the left breast. The and original treatment. It, yeah. And past. I just couldn't forget that. And, and you I were sick lost, from the surgery or the chemo or from what? No, the... The, the radiation. You were I had sick the, from the radiation. Yeah, because I, I got really burned. So that was it. standard radiation. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. So you had burning so, and you had the surgery and, I had and the loss hormones. Of, yes, and I had terrible loss of weight. And the only I tried to keep a positive attitude. And so I thought, well, I'm, I've lost a lot of weight, so maybe I can ride my pony now. <laughs> no, I know that the people look at you, they won't believe. Can we talk about your age? Yeah. So, so what is your age today? I'm going to be 82 in October. 82. Yeah. So it's incredible. Yeah. So you had this other cancer on the right side. Yes. And you came to us learning that you could, if you wish, avoid the surgery and avoid the chemo. Exactly. And you chose that. And so you've had radiation. You had standard radiation years ago on the left breast. Yes. And then you had our radiation on the right breast. And what was the difference to you? Well, I didn't have any burning. I had nothing. It was it was like, actually, I, I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe that I didn't have any effect from the treatment that I had previously, the treatment that I had before, because my skin was burned and I had all this weight loss. And you understand that when we treated you, we treated you for more cancer, because at the other place, exactly. you had the cancer removed. They were just giving you preventative radiation, where we were giving you radiation to try to cure the cancer. So you're getting actually a Correct. bigger gulp of treatment, mm -hmm. and you had less side effects. Right. I didn't have any. And you didn't have any side effects from, from our treatment? No. And you came here. What was a typical treatment like? For here. for here? When you came here oh, for the breast Oh, it was treatment. nothing that I ever expected. I mean, I just went in this, under this machine, and it wasn't closed in or anything. So it was open? Get, it was open. Not claustrophobic? No. Nope, any pain? No pain Any cutting? And it, no. And any it was, bleeding? No. Any anesthesia? No. Any hospitals? No. Any ventilators? No. Uh, so what was the worst experience coming here other than the traffic? <laughs> I, I had a, a very good experience being here. The staff is great. Everyone is great and, and very encouraging. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. A typical treatment would last how long about? A, 10 minutes or so. And very after the short. treatment, were you sick and no. vomiting and nauseated? Not or? at all. Not so at after all. So after treatment, what would you do after a treatment? 
I go home and garden. You'd garden, so you're I, fully active. Exactly. You didn't have to go home and sleep for 10 hours no. or no. vomit. There was nothing like that. No. You were fully active. You could go to the restaurant, you could go shopping, go to exactly. the movies, anything you want. Exactly. Yeah. And your, your tumor actually subsequently has been shown to have gone away. Right. Okay, now the paradoxes of your case, so you had two cancers. Uh, one side they did the lumpectomy and radiation and hormones and you had this terrible reaction to the skin. Right. And you had our treatment and there was no surgery and no chemo and no hormones. You just had the treatment and the tumor went away and then you went back to the other doctors, right? You went to someone who told you that you made a mistake by coming here. Right. Right? They said, oh, you made such a big mistake because you should have a treatment like you had for the first breast. Isn't that correct? Correct. I remember you told me that. Exactly. And yeah. they were making fun of our treatment. Yes. Right? Correct. They were making fun of yes. our treatment. And then what happened next? The, can the cancer that they treated came back. Came back. It came back. The cancer they treated came back with all the surgery and the hormones and the radiation right. that right. burnt the skin. It came back. Yeah. And then what did they tell you and what did other people tell you? Well, you know, you probably should have had the, the chemotherapy in the first place. Well, well, what were they going to do now, now that you're with a recurrent cancer after their lumpectomy and their hormones well, and their radiation? Because what did they want to do to you? Well, well, they thought that I, I should just uh, take your breasts off, then you won't have to worry about it. Do a mastectomy. <laughs> do you don't a have to worry about it. Like, so my, what do you think about it when a surgeon tells you, just take your breasts off so you don't have to worry about it? What do you think about that? The, the, the first thing I thought of was when I heard you on the radio, so that so many women came here and they had their, in, in the people that you saw um, had they didn't have to have their breasts removed at all. Right. And so many were having their breasts removed. Elsewhere. 97% yes. of the exactly. big hospitals were losing their breasts and elsewhere. And I was, I was at big hospitals. And 90% of my patients right. were keeping their breasts. Right. So your cancer came back after their lumpectomy and their surgery and their yes. radiation and their hormones. And meanwhile, they were making fun of our treatment, which was working and the cancer is now in remission. Mm -hmm. And then you decided what? Well, I'm just going to keep going living, I think. I don't know. I hope so. So you came here. I'm cancer free now. So, well, but you came back here. We yes, I did. We one step, and that is oh, yeah. that we offered retreatment exactly. of the cancer that came back in the breast yes. that they treated. You yes, that's number three. A treatment number three, a woman's only born with two breasts usually, <laughs> but you had three breast treatments. Correct. Right? Yes. And so far, the two that have worked have been our two. Exactly. And yes. so you've had a lot of time to reflect on this. What does it all mean to you? It means that I was very fortunate to find Dr. Lederman, really. Very fortunate, and I speak very highly of this place. In fact, my son... Uh, had a problem with prostate, and his surgeon told him... What kind of problem did he have? Prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. Mm-hmm. Because people so, that are listening don't know about your son. Oh, yes. And so, so he had said that he was diagnosed with having prostate cancer, and that they wanted to do surgery. And I said, oh, please don't do that. You have to come and see my doctor in New York. And, and he doesn't live so close, No, right? he he... It, he lives in Georgia. He lives by Atlanta, Georgia, and it's uh -huh. a big trip. Right. And he came here because? Because he wanted to see how it would be and it would work, if it would work for him. And he so came here? He, yes, he did. He made an appointment with you. And mm -hmm. how was that? It worked out just fine. He's very happy today. Because? He has all of his <laughs> sexual activity and everything else that he has. He has everything before. except one thing. The PSA, the cancer marker, yeah, drop down is, is in remission. Yeah, exactly. So he's very happy. So what do you tell a woman with breast cancer, with a lump in the breast or cancer, or she's gone to yeah. the five biggest hospitals in the world? Everyone tells her to do that. What would right. you tell that woman? Please don't, please don't. And I've seen other people that don't have necessarily breast cancer, but have other cancers, and they just seem to want to go to the the thing that's acceptable today so I try to talk them out of that I really do so I mean 
I see anybody suffering. And so I remember what you said. I, I went to school to help people. It's true. Yeah. And so I said, well, that's what most doctors are supposed to do. No, do no harm. So, you know, I feel very fortunate that I was able to come here and my sons also. Yes. Okay. Any regrets? None at all. None at all. Well, as we say, you should live to be 120 <laughs> in good health. Yes, thank and you, you look like you're 42. <laughs> and people that see you can't believe that you're 82. <laughs> And uh, I know that we didn't take any part of that, but we're just trying to keep your body together and keep your right. health together and yes. keep your spirits in a good way. Right. I appreciate everything that you've done for me and all the staff here. Really, it's been fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Right, God bless you. Thank you. So I'm with... Ted Albanese. And you had this prostate cancer more than a decade ago, right? Yes. You had a Gleason 7 cancer. So it's a more aggressive cancer. Gleason is how cancer is under the microscope. And what happened then? Um, how were you diagnosed? How were you found out to I, have cancer? Uh, believe it or not, I went for a, um, uh, a life, changed my life insurance, and my PSA was high. How high? Do you remember? Um, yeah, it was like five point something, because I didn't have it checked in a few years. Okay, so what did you do then? Uh, so I went to my urologist. He sent me to... Uh, uh, I went to two surgeons, and they, uh, again, like I, I always say in the past, they didn't give me any options. You got to get it out. If you don't take your prospect out, don't come back in six months and expect me to save your life. So you had the cancer, and you saw multiple surgeons, right? Yes, I saw two. Yes. And what did the surgeons tell you about what you had and what should be done? Uh, they said the only way to get rid of it uh, is to take the prostate out. And did any of those surgeons or anyone tell you about any options besides surgery? Absolutely not. They told you in the type of surgery, they said you have to have robotic surgery, right? Exactly. And no options. You didn't hear from anything about Dr. Lederman, radio surgery, or anything else. Just surgery, cutting, cutting, cutting. Absolutely. And the thing was, I, uh, it was a seven-hour operation. He had to abort it. Because in 1995, a truck fell on top of me, so I had heavy scar tissue. So they were trying to do it robotically, and uh, they had a. So after six abort. hours, seven hours, they had to abort the surgery, right? right. Abort. And, and these guys were supposed to be experts in the field, right? right? And so then they opened you up, right? Yeah, then they used the knife, opened me up, and then the, the thing was that was strange that I had so much. Um, uh, uh, the stuff they use to put you under. Anesthesia. Yeah, anesthesia, yes. And it struck down my kidneys. I was in, wind up being in a hospital for 11 days. So you were in the hospital 11 days because anesthesia complications? Right. Or surgical complications? Anesthesia. All anesthesia. Yeah. So it wasn't a cakewalk. No. And then you woke up from that surgery and you discovered what did surgery do to your life and your quality of life? Well, that that's, that's why... We, I call myself Angry Ted from Staten Island. Why are you Angry Ted from Staten Island? Because the surgeon, and this is the God honest truth, never told me that I was going to be leaking urine, which I did. Just told me that Viagra or Cialis will help my erections. And it, I was a healthy uh, man in his 60s at the time. My wife had passed away. I had a few girlfriends, so I had a good sex life. And uh, I couldn't get erections. Uh, very slight. And then about a, a month and a half goes by, I noticed that my penis was uh, a good inch, inch and a quarter shorter than so what they, it was. They shortened your vital organ, took away your erections, basically. You were right. leaking urine, right? Yes. And furthermore, when we looked at the pathology, we discovered, do you remember what we talked about, that they actually left cancer behind? Exactly. And that was in the pathology report Back then, when you had the surgery. And they recommended radiation back then, but he never told me. Okay. He never told never you Never told radiation. me, no, no. So how could he recommend radiation if he never told you? Exactly. So how did it happen? When, I re I re <laughs> when, we re when you read the pathology report. So uh, we read the record, and the record said he recommended radiation. Right. But did he ever, ever, ever tell you to have radiation? Not whatsoever, no. Did he ever tell you the cancer was left behind? No, he said he got all of it, and he saved my... Uh, he saved my nerve endings, and I wouldn't have no problems with erections. So he saved your nerves, 
but it didn't help. No, there was no, no erection, no. no control of the urine, or lack, lousy control of the urine. No. And he left cancer behind, and he never, ever told you, right? Absolutely not. Did he ever tell you that when the surgeon removes the prostate, there should be a zero PSA? Did he ever tell you that? No. Well, when I went back there, um, my PSA was, uh, I think it was one or two. And I said, what is, well, that's because you're on testosterone. That's what raised it up. He says, plus, you got to understand, he goes, um, one cell of cancer could have escaped when we did the surgery. This is what he told me four years later when it came back. But four, when I, so four years later, didn't tell you anything. No. Then he could tell you, hey, there's maybe it's from testosterone, but there's not supposed to be any PSA because there's not supposed to be a prostate or cancer, right? Not, not whatsoever, right. And then just kept on following you, right? Yes. And for about six more years or five more years, he was following you, right? Well, he really, that was the other thing. He did not like you. Uh, it wasn't follow-ups. I'd make an appointment and everything else to go see. And my PSA was always either ones and twos. Then what had happened was I went to change my life insurance policy. And uh, they send the, the person to your house. They do a blood test. And they came back and said, listen, your, your PSA is very high. I said, it's impossible. I had no prostate, you know. So uh, then I uh, went back to him and I was naturally angry. And he says, you can't blame me. This is things that happened. I told him about my erection. I told him I was always doing the kenal exercises, try to stop the urine leaking. And uh, it was kind of went on deaf ears. That's for what I would deaf say. Deaf ears. Yeah. Did so he then, offer you any advice? Yeah, he told me uh, I had to go for, he gave me two radiation doctors for standard radiation. And he says I could all, all, also do hormone therapy. And... Uh, I asked them what the procedure was, and they said I'd had to have like 40 radiation treatments. So I said, what's the after effects? They said, you may have bowel movement problems and, and uh, because the, the radiation can hurt other parts of your body. And uh, I, I just, you know, naturally by this point, I'm devastated because here I am. I uh, have to use a penal injection to get erections. I'm doing kenal exercises. I mean, uh, my, my whole life is turned upside down, and then my cancer's back, and this gentleman, nice surgeon that he is, that I really am very angry at, um, couldn't help me. Couldn't help me. Couldn't, didn't have no, no positive feedback that, uh, that there's something in the future that's going to help me without after effects. So then you eventually came here, right? Yes. Why did you come here? I heard Curtis Lee were on the radio all the time. So he was, and I follow him, and uh, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, but you know what the funny thing was? Everything I heard on the radio, when I came here with my wife, and you remember my wife, when I came here with my wife, I told her, I said, you know what? Watch what this man says, because if it's everything he says on the radio, I want this treatment. And you explained everything to it, and to us, and you were very surprised that day when I said, okay, doc, I'm ready to get the treatment. He goes, well, you don't want to go home and think about it? I said, no. He says, you, know, you have time. I said, no, I want to start now. So my wife went shopping, and I stayed here, and we made the, uh, the mold for my body. And uh, young lady there, she's still here, that, that you know, that, tour, yeah, she's a great person. I used to have a lot well, of laughs. Well, you're a great person. I yeah, she had too. a lot of laughs with her. And, uh, and then we, we started the treatments, and uh, the funny thing was coming here, and I, I feel it's funny, I like to talk a lot. I used to interview people that were waiting, and I'd hear people that had lung cancer four years ago, who had uh, breast cancer, and, and they're just here for a checkup, and I'm saying, I used to call my wife and said, God, there's people here three or four years later. I said, this has got to work, and uh, lo and behold, thank God, I'm at zero now, and, and it worked. But you know, I had a good life. I mean, like I, I, I explained to you, I was worried about coming here today because I'm a big snow contractor. And uh, I used to go out and plow snow 16, 18 hours. Never affected me whatsoever. So what did the treatment feel like? What did you feel like getting treatment for the cancer that came back after radical robotic surgery? What, what did it feel like? What did it here? feel like? Uh, did it feel like anything? It used to take me longer to take off my clothes and put my nightgown on and... Uh, uh, Did you have any pain? No, no. Any no. suffering? No, no. Did you whatsoever. get any hormones or any other treatments? Not whatsoever. So no. we were treated here years ago, right? Right. Your PSA is now in the zero range, right? Yes. There's no evidence of cancer. 
There's no hormones, there's no chemo, there's no surgery that we gave you, right? Not whatsoever. And there's been no side effects from our treatment, is that right? Not at all, not and, one. And you're here today because what? Why are you here today? Well, I just, I'm living proof that don't be an angry Ted. I mean, and you're not putting me up to say this. I mean, this is just me. I'm just an angry man that has to go through. I have a pretty young wife that's just 60 years old now. I'm going to be 73. And I have to, listen, can I say this on the video? Sex is very important to me. And to, the things I have to go through just to satisfy my wife, because a mutt, I'm going to call him a mutt, a mutt surgeon destroyed uh, a good part of my life. Did the surgeon tell you before surgery what was going to happen to your erections, to your urine, to the to your body? No, I probably would have took a shot and not did anything because sex was more important than the cancer. So I mean, you know, I mean, so, I'm just being honest, you know. So if you knew about the options, you would have never had surgery. Absolutely not. Absolutely and not. then, then he left sur cancer behind. The surgeon cut through the cancer. We know about that. It's positive margins. Yes. And he never told you about that either, right? Not at all. He told my daughter at the time, because my wife had just passed away and my daughter was with me all the time, and told my daughter, we got all the cancer out, there's nothing to worry about, he'll be fine. And uh, that wasn't the case. Wasn't the okay, case. we've had other communications. I know you like to talk about this plane trip from Chicago, right? Oh, yeah. That, so that tell was about crazy. this plane trip from Chicago. Yeah, I had a, a growth on my, uh, my left shoulder. So I sent him, uh, sent Dr. Liam a picture of it, and he says... Uh, all right, I'm on a plane coming back from Chicago. So <laughs> within two hours, he set me up for a, a biopsy, uh, MRI, uh, a blood test. We, you got the biopsy back and told me it was nothing cancer and recommended to me to a place to go. And uh, the next day I uh, had an appointment and they drained it. It was just a, uh, like a, a cyst or whatever. It was nothing to worry about because you know, the average layman, when you have any f form of cancer, the next thing that happens to you, you think, oh, it's cancer again, you know? I mean, I, that's how I look at it. But uh, here you are, in Chica coming back from Chicago, you had Wi-Fi, and you're communicating with me, and I'm saying, I get off the phone, I tell my wife, I said, this guy's on a plane, and he's doing this. I mean, just, and, but you know what, the, the other thing I want to point out, is when I came here, you sent me for every kind of test. Because you said, well, the prostate cancer is one thing, but you want to know if the cancer traveled anywhere else in my body. So I had nuclear bone scans, PET scans, and then when you got all the uh, everything back, then you proceeded to go with the, uh, with the treatment because I wanted it that, that day. Like I said, you were surprised. Oh, Aren't you going home and think about it? I said, no. <laughs> Did you ever have a doubt that everything we did wasn't for your benefit? Oh, not whatsoever. No, not. And plus, after about 10 or 15 treatments, like I said, I, I, I could have been Harald of a rare interview on a lot of your patients. And I said, this is, why isn't this more out in the open? If it wasn't, I mean, I just listen to your radio shows during the day on Sunday, sometimes at night when I can't sleep. And I'm saying, you know, it's... Uh, and I changed a few, I have a few doctor friends. We have a gang of people that hang out on a Saturday night, go out to dinner. One of them is a, uh, a, a doc, prominent doctor in Staten Island and his partner. And uh, I kind of like changed their mind towards uh, Dr. Liederman's treatment. In fact, they recommended a few people to come here. We're in uh, Kirsten, Kurt, uh, Kurtz and Takos at this Dr. Larry's uh, wedding and his partner and we're, on the, we're in the water and I'm explaining to him everything that happened and uh, they thought it was funny that I had to give penal injections in order to get an erection. Well, everything that happened to me he goes, God, you know more about it than, and they kind of like, and you could ask them, you could, you could really ask, they'll tell you, they changed their minds about radio surgery and Dr. Liederman. I mean, uh, you know, it, sometimes I just feel it, everything sounds too good to be true, but hey, I'm living proof. And I sent many of people here and you saved their lives. So I, 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 can't, uh, I can't say I'm lying about that. That's the truth. And you always accommodate them. Always accommodate them. And if they can't get through, I 
text you and send them in 10 o'clock. It's always 10 o'clock in the morning. Why is that? <laughs> send them in at 10 o'clock tomorrow. You know, so it's, like I said, you know, uh, I'm not a paid spokesperson here. I mean, I'm just coming from my heart. All right. God bless coming you. from Thank my heart. You. Thank you. I wish you lived to be 120. Good. Thank you. God bless you. Good. Thank you. Okay, I'm here with... Terrence Boyle. And you've had a long history with cancers, right? Yes. I you had a to. kidney cancer years right. ago, right? Yes, in 10. And you had that kidney removed, right? Yes. And the doctors who removed your kidney, did they ever tell you that radio surgery works for kidney cancers? No. Did they ever give you an option? No. Say, they told you what? They told me, come in. We're going to put you uh, in uh, through a... Uh, clinic and we're going to remove your kidney and did they no ever, other options they didn't tell you any time we can remove your kidney or you could see dr lederman and there's a sign right out show over there say two kidney treatments one is the kidney in a bucket you see that over there oh yeah that's my kidney that's your kidney and then the one next to it is a woman that we treated 10 years ago about the same time yours with radio surgery, and she still has her kidney. You can see the pictures over yeah, there. I, I was truly blessed by my brother-in-law. Well, wait a second, before we get you. that, so you had this kidney cancer, and they never told you that, yes, you could have surgery, but you could also have no. non-invasive radio surgery, pinpoint treatment, right? They didn't. They never told you a never, million words. definitely did not tell me anything like and that. And in fact, the first time you learned about radio surgery for kidney cancers was probably when you came here is that right yeah and that was too late you already lost yeah, your kidney. it's already gone so how do you feel now having lost the kidney that the surgeons never told you the options i think they were negligent do you think that they knew that there were options and just didn't want to tell you or they didn't know uh that's an interesting question i i I, I don't know if they were familiar with radio radiology, uh, but I think their normal procedure was just remove it, and they they just went with it. I I was uh, deprived of any other opportunities. I did a test like on a, a Thursday, and they wanted me to come in on a Friday. I'm just using those days. So they totally they rushed you to have surgery. Yes, brought and me right in. They called me. That night and said, come in. And what's it like to remove your kidney? Well, it's debilitating. Uh, uh, psychologically, knowing you only have one kidney, that one fails. Uh, you have to go searching uh, elsewhere. Uh, but the fact that there were other options uh, annoys me to no extent. Do you feel, do you still have bad thoughts about losing your kidney? Occasionally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when I, I realized that there was a possibility it could have been saved. Then a few years later, you had, well, what were your symptoms then next? What brought you to the surgery? Sore throat. In a my, sore throat. My throat constricted. Uh, my diet, diet was limited. So you had uh, trouble eating? Oh, gosh, yeah. Did you have trouble speaking? I had to... Uh, I couldn't speak at one time. You couldn't speak? No, my voice, my phone would not take a voice command. So no uh, one could hear you, so, so no. hoarse, you were hoarse. Uh, and, you met my wife. Right. She had to speak for me. And so you went to the doctor with the hoarseness and difficulty eating. Do you have, were you short of breath also? Uh, not as bad as it is uh, today. Um, but I've had other mitigating circumstances. Uh, well, unrelated to the cancer, but right. but back then you had shortness of breath, right? And you had difficulty speaking and pain. Speaking and and pain. eating. Eating, I had to have like uh, spaghetti with garlic uh, sauce. So only certain things would go down. That would slide down. And so you saw a surgeon. You saw what your primary doctor, and then he sent you to a throat doctor. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you saw a throat surgeon, yes, ENT, exactly, at a famous hospital. Yes. And what did that doctor tell you? She could barely get the a scope down my throat. She S said it would be up to the anesthesiologist if they could procedure. It was that procedure. So she was in a throat cancer specialist, a surgeon. Okay. So you were at a hospital in, in one of the five boroughs, right? And they found this cancer in the voice box. 
And their first option was a tracheotomy. And were they going to remove your voice box? Yes. They were going to yes. not only trache that tracheotomy just means a hole, but they were actually going to remove your voice box, a laryngectomy. Is that right? Uh, they were going to remove your voice box. Well, they said they said they had a speech therapist, but if I have no voice box, what good is a speech well, therapist? Well, there's ways people can make sounds uh, out of okay, their esophagus. I, I'm not familiar. So they're going to teach yeah. how to speak again after that surgery. Yes. And they told you? Did they tell you you had to have surgery? Did well, they give you any options? That was the first option, and I left. I gave. But did they say, hey? You can have surgery with us, radical surgery, remove your voice box, or you could go see Dr. Lederman about radiation, radio surgery. Did they say that? Um, I happen to have, no, they did not say so that. So the doctor's there. They, they, they only gave not. you one option. Right. That was that one was, option and only one option. That was it. And they told one you you had to have surgery. Right. To remove the voice box, and they teach you how to speak again, and you'd be left with a whole tracheotomy in your throat. Yes, they said. For the rest of your life. Yeah. They, and so you were, you were desperate. You were having pain and difficulty with symptoms. For a year and a half, they misdiagnosed You me. were misdiagnosed for a year and a half. And then they told you you had to have surgery. So most people say, oh, just do whatever you want to do. Don't just do it, doctor. Why didn't you just say, hey, why don't you just cut out my voice box? If the doctor told you that. Do you want me to tell you what I told A hundred percent. I gave him half of the peace sign and walked out. Okay, so you told him you're never going to do the, no. the radical surgery in a million years. Right. And they never told you any options. No. And what do you do next? Um, I went home uh, with uh, Susan, and uh, the next day her brother called listening to you and said... Susan's your wife. Yes, and uh, her brother, Robert, listens to AM radio and heard you, called up, and uh, that was a Sunday, Sunday morning. Monday, I called you, and you said, come on in. Um, in 15 minutes, you explained to me what they hadn't done in a year and a half. Uh, and uh, you said... So what did you understand from that first meeting? that they were very, very unethical in their uh, Well, in I their didn't practices. say they're unethical. You, you, you felt they were unethical. In my opinion, if you don't offer other options and you only give me one, you're uh, negating your uh, Hippocratic Oath. So you feel they were not responsible by hiding other options? Hiding? Uh, uh, not knowledgeable? However you want to put it, they did not offer it to me. Okay, so you, was, so you came we were, here, yes, and you chose to proceed with us? The first day, we sat in a room, and you drew exactly what was going on. And then you said to me, uh, what do you want to do? I said, well, let's do it. You said you offered me like 70% odds of uh, getting my voice box. I said, let's do it. You saving your voice box. Saving it. You said, when do you want to start? I said, right now, you had a girl stay and make a mask for me. Right, and you had one of the most advanced cancers because it was a cancer that was growing through the vocal cords, through your voice box, and also in your lymph nodes. During the course of treatment, what did you feel when you came here each day? Better. Okay, but better. Did you have any pain or suffering or bleeding or no, cutting or anesthesia? None whatsoever, none. So you had no pain. No. Nope. And what happened to those masses in the neck? And what happened to your voice? And what happened to your eating? What happened? Uh, uh, my eating habits changed. My voice got a little deeper. Um, but I have a voice. I can speak. So you can uh, speak now. When you came to us, you had no voice, right? None whatsoever. And my you had wife pain. had to talk for me. Susan. And you had this pain? Yes. And is it pain? Do you still have pain? No. No. Uh, so there's no pain. In your voice, you're speaking on your own for the last seven years, right? Yes. And the cancer's never, ever come back, right? No, it hasn't. We just had a PET scan. And you had a PET scan of your whole body. And in fact, everything in your body is A-OK, -okay, right? Yeah. Uh, relatively, I had a couple of broken ribs recently. Well, you have some ribs, and yeah, I think you have yeah. COPD. I think you used to smoke, right? Yeah. So yeah. smoking is probably related somehow to the cancer of the voice and cancer of the kidney, which is just a reminder that everyone's listening should try to stop smoking, right? Yes, I totally agree. So it's been seven years now. 
cancer has never come back. You've had no, no further treatment. No. And how does that make you feel? Uh, wonderful. I owe you um, my ability to express uh, my emotions, my statements. And also your life. Yeah, definitely. Your life. I would have been a dead man. Do you ever feel that we did anything that was not in your interest? No. No. Uh, every day I came here early. I had an early appointment. You were punctual. You were uh, effective. Um, 15 minutes, 20 minutes later, I was ready to walk out the door after treatment. Since that treatment seven years ago, the cancer's never come back. You've had no further treatment and you're living your life. I'm living my life as well as anybody else. And you recently, recently had a PET scan, and that PET scan showed the cancer is gone, like it's been gone for the last seven years. Yes, um, I'm extremely grateful to you. I offered to buy him a pizza. He said, okay, in 20 years. Let's keep and, an appointment for 20 <laughs> years, okay? Yes, yes, All right, I come. haven't forgotten it. Well, remember 20 years. God bless you and thank you. Thank it's you so much. my pleasure, Doctor. Thank you. You've been a lifesaver for Thank me. you. So I'm here with... Barbara. And who else is with you today? Mike. Mike. And Barbara and Mike. So we're here to tell a story This is very interesting to me and I think to everyone who's listening. You came to me about a year ago, right? Yeah. More or less. And yes. at that time you had what issue? I had a squamous cell on my finger. Yeah, a squamous cell cancer. Cancer. And it was a massive cancer on your finger, Huge. right? Huge, yes. And how would a nice lady like you <laughs> get a massive cancer on your finger? I have no idea. And it just came up fairly suddenly, right? Yeah, and, but it was there for a while, but not like when I came to you. And we're going to show pictures. We're going to insert some of your pictures before. But it was a massive cancer on your middle finger, right? Yes, this finger. middle finger. And it was massive. Yes. And you eventually uh, saw surgeons, right? Yes. And you eventually had an MRI. Right. Right. And the MRI looked like it was cancer growing through the bones right. in your finger, right? right. So it was a it very, very extensive. On the thing. Yes. And you went to, I think, three separate very famous surgeons here in New York City. Yes, I did. And you're not from New York, so it's a no. nuisance to travel here, even for today. And you saw three separate surgeons. So let's go to surgeon number one. So you went to surgeon number one, and we're not going to use names or hospitals and so on, but you went to a famous surgeon at a famous hospital, uh -huh. and what did this famous surgeon at this famous hospital tell you? Well, first I went to um, a famous dermo up here. Dermatologist, skin doctor, skin yes. surgeon. And he just looked at it and went bananas and said... Bananas? What does that mean, bananas? Crazy. <laughs> he went crazy, but what He went crazy mean? because he looked at it and he said, I can't do anything. Now, he was a Mohs surgeon, right? He was right. a Mohs. He was so he's a surgeon, one of, one of the biggest hospitals in New York. Yes. He's one of the most famous doctors. Yes, he who is. does Mohs, which is, Mohs is a kind of like salami slicing of skin cancers, yes. right? Yes, yes. And they right. sent you to a salami slicer of skin cancers, and a very famous one. Yes, in all the hospitals. people from around the world go to him. Right. right. And you went to him. So and he what did sent he tell me you? to his friend. No, no, what did he tell you? Oh, what could what he do he tell useful? Me? He could do no, absolutely nothing useful. He wanted me to get an MRI. So he got the MRI. Right. And that was the MRI that showed the cancer eating through the bone. Right. Okay. Right. And then he sent you where? And then he said, I'll send you to my friend. Ha ha, a friend. Yeah. At okay. this famous hospital. And there I went. And he put me under a florist. Uh, x-ray a little tiny x-ray on the table there he put my hand in it and he said um <clears throat> it doesn't look good but i said so what do we do and he says chop it so what does chopping it mean <sighs> that's what i said what <laughs> what do you mean chop it just chop it and he says but i can't do it now but what, what did he mean did he explain exactly what he was going to do absolutely nothing so he told you, chop it. This is a very famous surgeon, yes. a very famous hospital with a nice white coat and yes. a big name big badge. Oh, beautiful. And famous and yes. 
And yes. He's head of the department. Yes. <clears throat> head of the department, one of the biggest hospitals in New York, and his only words were, Chop it. And there was nothing ex- I no looked like it. I, I, he was crazy. I said, what do you mean, chop it? And he said, that's what we'll do. But he said, I can't do it because I'm going on vacation next week. Ho, oh, ho, he's on and, vacation. But I'll give you to my friend. Another friend? Yes. So now a friend of a friend. Right. He said, I'll give you to my friend, and uh, but do it in the next two weeks. Mm-hmm. So I looked at him and I said, you're crazy. <laughs> and I just walked out. Did you see the friend of the friend? No. But then you, didn't you go to another hospital? I went to an, uh, another one who just... That um, was equally famous, right? Even yes. More, even more famous. Yes. Yeah. And he looked at it and he, oh no, um, he touched it and he said, oh, it, I'm not sure what it is. So, but he already knew what it was because it was already biopsied. It was a squamous cell cancer, right? Well, he didn't understand it or something. I don't know. Well, what's not to understand? You had a biopsy. Yes. You had an MRI. Yes. You saw two big surgeons. They told Uh you how urgent it is to go get chop, chop, Uh chop. And the third one said he just doesn't know. No, and he he wanted to get get his own MRI and his own, what was it? He so, wanted to get more information. He wanted to actually get a copy of the biopsy, which we didn't have at the time. So that would take another week or so. And I, he only would see us on Thursday or Friday, yeah. maybe. That's when he sees new patients. But only he wouldn't Thursday see us. He was Friday. too busy that week. So and he said, let's go another week. This was a very, very big guy at another hospital, yes. And did you see him again? No, because three weeks later he called. But by that time, after the second time, we found you. Okay, but when he called you back eventually. <laughs> yes, he did. So what did he tell you eventually? He just called, the, the office called back and said, well, ready to come, you can come in and take your test. Okay. And, but the doctor will not see you until he sees the test. It took two weeks to come. It was just a visit, which we yes. never had. I finally okay. hung up on him. We, because we finally, we found okay, you before. Okay, so you were disappointed with the surgeons. Oh, absolutely. And you did not want to have radical surgery. There was no right? way. I was chopping my finger off. There was no way. And so how did you end up coming here? Honestly, I heard you on the radio one day. So you heard, so A how lot of you, times. So how is it possible you saw this famous three doctors uh-huh. in two Famous hospitals, the biggest doctors in the department, right? Right. Yes, they were. Mm-hmm. And how could you give up those famous doctors and come down to 1384 Broadway and see Dr. Lederman? How, how is that possible? Because um, my father had cancer years and years and years ago. Sorry to hear that. And I had to go with him to cancer doctors, and I was not impressed by any of them. And so, when I saw that place, and I... But these are the chiefs at biggest hospitals. It doesn't matter. Right? And he was the chief of his So, problem. So the fact that these three people weren't... Uh, they didn't want any part of me. They didn't want to see me right away. And I said, it's really bad. And they want to chop it. Well... Okay, so you, you heard about us on the radio, right? You heard mm-hmm. yourself or some friend heard No, you? I heard you. You heard. And did you believe what we're talking about on the radio? Or you thought it was all hype? No, you sounded really good. We were desperate. <laughs> okay, so, no, you, and so you, and you took a chance. Good. Yes. And you came here, right? Right. And we, it was a busy day, and we had to wait for hours, but we did it, and you were the best. Okay, but why, okay, <laughs> that first meeting. Yes. Can you explain what happened during that first meeting? With you? Yeah. You sat me down, and you told me everything that you could do for me or not, and... You sounded really good and kind and nice. Did we make any promises to you? Yes, you said that you could get it cured by... I promised you could get it cured? Yeah, well, 90%. Okay, 90%. I told you, 90% chance we can get control of that cancer treated. We didn't promise cure, did we? No, you you said 90%. Did I ever promise I'm going to cure you and you live to be 5,000 years old? No, 90%. Okay, so that's different and than And you said if I come every day for uh, almost a month, or I, I would have to come every day. And I said, fine, I'll do it. Okay, were you reluctant to come? You come from Connecticut, so it's a big it, trip for you, right? Yeah, but it was fine. Okay, did you suffer any pain or anything during the period of treatment? Absolutely nothing. Okay. Just a little burn at the beginning, but that was it. Okay, and then what did you start seeing happening during the treatment? 
Well, it took a while, but eventually it went down, 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 and the um, infection went, whatever it was. It's not an infection, remember? It's yeah, a, I know, it's cancer. It's cancer. Uh, but it was going smaller, smaller, smaller. And eventually... And your whole staff kept cheering for me and saying it's going to happen. <laughs> well, because we could see it every day getting better, right? Yes. And you saw it getting better. And, and your we, staff was great. Okay, well, you're great, too. So it, it went away in the finger, and you've done great with no surgery. You've had no Nothing. surgery whatsoever. Absolutely not. Right? None. And have you ever seen back those surgeons who told you to get amputation? No, I really didn't. I want to. <laughs> Did you ever think about... Just going to them and say, hey, look, this is how yeah, it can so be treated with Dr. I've thought Lederman. of it, but they, they, were, they were further downtown, and by the time we, we just have it. But, yes, I wanted to do that, especially the one that was going away on his trip. Okay, what advice do you have for other people who may have a difficult cancer or the surgeon's telling to do some radical surgery that they don't really want to do? Well, if I get to know them or see them, I would definitely tell them to go to you, at no. least for a to see what you'd say. No, every day, every day I'm seeing patients, and a lot of times I see people after they've had the radical surgery, after oh. they've lost their, for skin cancers, their nose or ears or eyes or mouth or uh, breast cancer, lose their breast or their lung or their kidney. And, and every day I see those patients, and many times I see them after the surgery, and they're often very upset that they weren't given any choices. And you too, you saw, you so have multiple doctors, and no one ever talked to you about any options. Is that right? Absolutely not. No, no. one ever told you about that. No. Nope. How do you feel about that? These, do you feel like a doctor is supposed to tell the patient all the options before recommending or offering a treatment? Well, I would think so. Here's a, a lady sitting in front of him, and he just said to me, chop it. And I was like in shock. I said, what do you mean, chop it? And he said, that's what you'll do. You know, but he didn't explain anything, what would happen, what I would do, what, what, nothing. So your father had this terrible cancer, and you must go to bed every night, put your head on the pillow, and what are you thinking about the medical profession when you think about doctors? Well, I don't really trust all doctors. Okay, why? I'm very particular, because I see they're not really great, okay. and they don't do their, what they're supposed to do. So how can a patient decide... Uh, on their doctor and a medical treatment, especially if they go to a famous hospital and a famous doctor and the doctor is telling them to chop it, what's a patient to think, really? I think uh, if it's somebody that can t tell you something, like me telling my friend, go, that's it. that would be great, but nobody told me. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> you suffered that way. And then, then, shock of shock, you had this huge skin cancer, right? Uh-huh. And next thing you know, your husband, in sympathy, <laughs> developed a skin cancer on his nozzola, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Yes. And yours was massive, so you suffered terribly. And he had a skin cancer on your nose, right? And you saw a dermatologist, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had this cancer. And what did the dermatologist recommend to you? Mohs. He says you've got to have Mohs surgery to take care of it. They said you had to have Mohs oh, surgery. Oh, yes. And you know what Mohs surgery is? Yes. What is Mohs surgery? That's where they, they uh, surgically go through it and they just keep scooping it out so they see nothing left. So it's like salami, yes. slice of salami. Right. And have you known of other people who've had Mohs? Yes, and, I'm aware of it, yes. And what's your impression of Mohs? Uh, uh, my friend had it and he so he regrets it now. He had it on his lip. And he oh, now he has a terrible. deformity on his lip. He's so upset about it. He just had this done a year ago. Did anyone tell him he could have had our kind of treatment? Absolutely. Absolutely not. I mean, you know, we're all amateurs in terms of understanding cancer as individuals. We don't know what to do or what to go for. Uh, I mean, with my wife, uh, they, they told her just to remove it, to surgically remove it. They didn't give her any other options. Uh, it's a miracle what, what took place here because you know what this finger looked like. I mean, it was bleeding through the, through the uh, skin. It was, I, I thought there was nothing left to do but just the surgery. But we wanted to explore something else. And I, I, I think it's a miracle what took place. She fingers now, it's normal. There was a little bone damage, but that's okay. It looks normal. Uh, I'm just so impressed. And what about your nose? You've had your treatment Oh, here. yes. Well, that's, that's gone. I went for a few treatments, it's gone. The ba I was basal cell. 
And what did it feel like? What did it, uh, nose, skin no, touch? Nothing, absolutely. No pain, no suffering, and nothing, everything was fine. And the appearance is fine. I just had it recently and uh, totally satisfied. I mean, totally satisfied. So there's, so there's three million people a year with skin cancers in America. And what percent of those do you think are told to have anything other than Mohs or surgery? They don't know. They Why don't is that? Know. Why are people not being told about options for skin cancer? This was a good friend of ours too, but he just never told us that he was getting Mohs surgery. And we didn't see him for like two weeks or three weeks. And the next thing I know, he had scars all over his face. So his speech is affected and his appearance is yes. affected? Yeah, oh, he's, he's very upset. He's very Every time upset. we see him, he, he that's the first thing he complains about his appearance. He's very upset about this. Does and he know about you and your wife? Yes, now yeah. he does. <laughs> What advice do you have for other people uh, who have cancers or suspected cancers? What do you tell them? Well, I tell them my story, for sure. And I said, if you want to go to somebody really good, and he can cure you, or 90%, um, it's worth it. And they're excellent there, and the staff is great. What do you say about people who say, oh, you should go to the chief of the big hospital? Yeah. I mean, what do you say about that? You know, go yes. to the chief of the big hospital. What do you say? Well, my children's first first reaction was, yeah, you're going to some little, little place somewhere that you found. And I said, absolutely not. So if you want to come with me one day, you can, but no, it's okay. So we've got to the chiefs of three hospitals now, the senior individual, I mean, talking, these are very senior people in the city of New York, the top five, whatever, mm -hmm. three times. And all we ended up with was you know, cut it off. That was the only option we, we ended up having. And we explored it with all of them. And they're very competent people. But that's what they do. And just, it's like a miracle we came here. Isn't, isn't competency also offering the patient all the options? Don't you think, I mean, if that doctor's wife or he himself had cancer of his finger, do you think he'd be so uh, eager to remove that finger or part of the hand? They gave us no options. They didn't give do us any options. Do you think that he really knew of no options? Do I you think he never heard of any other options for skin cancer? They, they're very... I don't think so. They're so full of themselves. Okay, but how can he... He's a doctor for he 30 or 40 years, right? Yes. And yeah. that's what he does. Yes. Yeah. And do you think that he never heard about any other options I, for cancer treatment? Do you think that? Or do you think he had other motives? Yeah, his, he probably made more money it's, doing it. what they do. It's this all he does. He, he, he gave us, there were no options. It's what... what you know, cut it off. That's the only option we had. All right, well, thank you very much for coming today. I know it's a nuisance to come here, and I appreciate you helping other people learn about oh, options. And you, I'm sure you're like a miracle person. All right, thank you, and God bless you. And you should live to be 120. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. We're <laughs> thank very you. satisfied we came here. It was, we had no other alternative. We didn't understand it. And by just good fortune, we found Dr. Lederman, and uh, my wife has her finger, and it's fine. So I'm here with Calvin West Johnson. And Calvin, tell us a little about yourself. Well, I'm a retired city worker, and now, but I've been a musician mostly all my life. And um, I played different clubs. I travel abroad. I played out of the country. I played in Paris, France, Japan. This is with my music, uh, of course. And uh, I'm just enjoying my life, enjoying what I do. I love to play music. But like I said at first, I'm a retired city worker, and it gave me the chance to play more music and travel more. So I'm grateful and thankful that I'm able to play my music. Yes. And we met because you had this prostate cancer, right? Remember yeah. that tiny point that was interfering with your future, right? Yes. And you had a high PSA, right? It went up to like 5.9, right? Yes. And you were at one of the big hospitals in New York. Yes. Remember that? And you had a Gleason 7 cancer. So Gleason is how the cancer looks under the microscope. And the PSA is how the blood test is. And you went elsewhere first, right? Yes. And why didn't you get treatment there? Why did you come here? I didn't feel comfortable there. Or what they had, what they told me, I didn't feel it was 
right for me. Why? Uh, because all the side effects that, that came with it. What kind of treatment were they talking about there? Well, it was talking about treatment like um, uh, operation cutting the gland out. So they do radical surgery. Radical you. surgery. So they could do radical surgery, remove your prostate. Remove it, yes. And did they tell you that most likely it would take away your sexual life? Yes. They told you that? Yes. Did they tell you that it most likely would cause you to leak urine? Yes. Did they tell you it would shorten your vital organ downstairs? Yes. So they told you all those things? They told me all those things. Now, did they give, give, give you any options? So they told you you should have surgery. They didn't give me no option. They said uh, the best thing is to have surgery. They didn't say, hey, you can have surgery at this super duper hospital, right? You're one of the biggest yes. hospitals in New York. Yes. They didn't say, hey, you can come over and Dr. Lederman and have different options and different results, right? Yes. They never told you that. They never told me that. Did they ever tell you that with you had a Gleason 7 cancer? The cancer under the microscope was called Gleason 7. That's how it looks under the microscope. They yeah. tell you with surgery, success rate is 60%. And with us, surgery, without surgery, success rate here, without radical surgery, is 90%. Did they tell you that? No. So they told you nothing, basically. Just so you had to have surgery. They just basically told me I had to have surgery. Do you think they knew better? Do you think they knew there were other options out there? I don't know whether they knew there was other options out there. They just wanted me to have the surgery, and they want to give me the surgery. Why do you think they did that? Oh, it's oh, many reasons you could come up with, but I, I, it wasn't right for me. I, didn't, I, didn't, I figured I would have better, better places to look for, I, and I heard about the radio surgery, and I said, well, let me give her a, ch give her a chance at that. So, so you're a pretty strong man to say, hey, you went to one of the biggest hospitals and saw big surgeons at a big hospital and you just walked away, right? I walked away because I didn't feel it was right for me. Okay. I figured I could find something better. And how'd, the, you how'd you find us? How'd you find our two, work? Well, I've, I heard about you guys on the radio. So you I heard on the radio. I heard Dr. Lineman on the radio and I heard about a few other ways to go, but I chose Dr. Lineman. I was more favorable to that. I like what I heard on the radio about Dr. Lineman. Why? Well, I felt comfortable. I felt it was right for me, better than the surgery. Okay, so you investigated different options at different places, right? Yes, yes. You came here years ago now. Years ago. And you had this Gleason 7, a more aggressive cancer, and your PSA was 5.9. And you had treatment here, right? Yes, I had and treatment here. Do you remember the treatment at all? Do you remember what it was like? Well, I remember some. What do you remember? I remember that, first of all, it wasn't painful. So there was no pain? That was, it was no pain. Were you ever in the hospital here? No, I wasn't in the hospital. So every time you came here, you had a treatment and you went home? Yes, every time I got the treatment and went home. And after your treatment, would you go home and sing and do your gigs and uh, do your usual things? I went home, I did my usual things. So what was that? What would that be like after a treatment? After the treatment, I continue on with my life, doing the usual things that I, I was able to do. And uh, it, it didn't... Uh, it didn't uh, stop me from doing my usual things. I was able to, to continue. Okay, did you keep on your sex life and your urinary life and all your functional life? As yes. Best, as best as you need to do. I, my, my, my sex life continue, my function. And your urinary life. My urinate continue. And there was no distortion of your body. Because when surgery is done, surgery often shortens the penis, which most men don't like either, of course, or their <laughs> loved ones either. And, you know, the partner doesn't like that too much either. Absolutely. So everything was okay. Everything was okay. And your PSA was then, next thing you know, was zero, right? It was so zero. And you went down to so zero. Crazy. And that means that the cancer is gone, right? Yes, I mean, that is in submission. I was so right. grateful. So it's been years now, and your PSA is still zero, and we do new PSAs, and it's still zero, right? Yes. And you're doing well. 
So far, so good. And most likely you're going to be one of the big success stories here. Oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you. More than with surgery. So any regrets about that? No, no regrets. Did you ever feel we ever did anything that was against your interest while you were here? No. Uh, any other thoughts about while you were here, what the treatment was like or what you tell other people? I tell my friends and even some of my family members that if they ever have any kind of cancer, that Dr. Lederman is the place to go and be. I tell my friends because I am so satisfied with the treatment that I got here. And uh, so I tell my friends, my family and my friends, I do tell them about because uh, I feel great. It was so successful. So you're all sat you're satisfied about what happened. I am very satisfied with the treatment I got here at the radio surgery with Dr. Lehneman. Very satisfied. And even you made a song about treatment I'm, here, right? Yes, I made a song for Dr. Lehneman. Can for, you uh, offer to sing it to us now? Yes, I usually Would you be willing to do that? Uh, yes, I'll be willing to do it. All I right. play it on my Thank guitar. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Dr. Okay, Lehneman. Thank you. you. Okay, here we go. I had cancer, it was the thing that, that was holding me down At the radio surgery, see now told my whole life around We have choices, I'm so glad that we really do Dr. Lederman gave us choices, he gets good from me and you But we got choices, we got choices your cancer bullseye hit your cancer it will cleanse like a one two three we got choices I'm so glad that we really do wanna thank Dr. Lederman for choices for me and you we got choices we got choices yeah, we have choices. So you've seen snippets of our patients explaining what's happened to them and dramatic personal stories all told by the patients and their loved ones. We have longer version later on in this program and we hope that you have the interest and desire to listen to each video and each human story. If you have medical questions yourself, it's always best to meet in person. There is no substitute for meeting in person. Doctors have known for hundreds of years, the usual practice is to meet the doctor in person with your medical records. If you can't get the medical records, we'll get them for you. If you're interested in radio surgery, just give us a call at 212 Choices, 212 Choices. The number in digits is 212-246-4237. If you have a question you'd like to have answered immediately, you can send an email and I'll answer most likely your email very quickly. Send an email to us at Lederman, L-E-D-E-R-M-A-N, at R-S-N-Y dot O-R-G. Again, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I wish you great health and you should live to be 120. Thank you and God bless you. Did you know that you've got choices? That there can be a better way? Did you know that you've got choices? Call Dr. Leader me today. Two on two choices, a much better way. Two on two choices, call Dr. Did you know that you've got choices? That there can be a better way? Did you know that you've got choices?